Introduction in Chapter 1 of A Bunch of Everlastings, or Texts That Made History. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Tim Bauer. A Bunch of Everlastings, or Texts That Made History, by Frank Borum. By way of introduction. Five and twenty years ago tonight, I was solemnly ordained a minister of the everlasting gospel. A medley of romantic circumstances conspired to fix indelibly upon my mind the profound impressions then created. I was a total stranger of this side of the planet. I had only landed in New Zealand a few hours before, yet here I was among a people who were pleased to recognize in me their first minister, trembling under the consciousness of my boyish inexperience, and shuddering under the awful burden imposed upon me by the ordination charge i felt that life had suddenly become tremendous i was doing business in deep waters as a recognition of the goodness and mercy that have followed me all the days of my ministerial life i desire with inexpressible thankfulness to send forth this bunch of everlastings frank w borum armandale melbourne australia march fifteenth nineteen twenty End of Introduction Chapter 1 Thomas Chalmers' Text It was a mystery. Nobody in Kilmeny could understand it. They were people of the flock in the field, men of the plough and the pasture. There were only about 150 families scattered across the parish, and such social life as they enjoyed all circled round the kirk. They were all very fond of their young minister, and very proud of his distinguished academic attainments. Already in his preaching, there were hints of that sublime thunder that afterward rolled through the world. In his later years, it was said of him that Scotland shuddered beneath his billowy eloquence as a cathedral vibrates to the deep notes of the organ. He became, as Lord Rosebery has testified, the most illustrious Scotsman since John Knox. But his farmer folk at Kilmeny could not be expected to foresee all this. They felt that their minister was no ordinary man, Yet there was one thing about him that puzzled every member of the congregation. The drovers talked of it as they met each other on the long and lonely roads. The women discussed it as they waited outside the kirk whilst their husbands harnessed the horses. The farmers themselves referred to it wonderingly when they talked things over in the stockyards and marketplace. Mr. Chalmers was only twenty-three. He had matriculated at twelve had become a divinity student at fifteen and at nineteen had been licensed to preach now that with much fear and trembling he had settled at kilmeny he made a really excellent minister he has himself told us that as he rode about his parish his affections flew before him he loved to get to the firesides of the people and he won from old and young their unstinted admiration their confidence and their love but for all that the mystery remained Briefly stated, it was this. Why did he persist in preaching to these decent, well-meaning, and law-abiding Scottish farmers in a strain that implied that they ought to be in gaol? Why, Sabbath after Sabbath, did he thunder at them concerning the heinous wickedness of theft, of murder, and of adultery? After a hard week's work in the field and stable, briar and dairy, these sturdy Scotsmen drove to the kirk at the sound of the Sabbath bell only to find themselves raided by the minister as though they had spent the week in open shame they filled into their family pews with their wives and their sons and their daughters and were straightway charged with all the crimes in the calendar later on the minister himself saw both the absurdity and the pity of it it was as he told the good people of kilmeny part of his bitter self-reproach that for the greater part of the time he spent among them i could expatiate only on the meanness of dishonesty of the villainy of falsehood on the despicable arts of calumny in a word upon all those deformities of character which awaken the natural indignation of the human heart against the pests and disturbers of human society now and again the brilliant and eloquent young preacher turned aside from his line of things in order to denounce the designs of napoleon but as the fifeshire farmers saw no way in which the arguments of their minister were likely to come under the notice of a tyrant and turn him from his fell purpose of invading britain they were as much perplexed by these sermons as by the others this kind of thing continued without break from eighteen o three until eighteen eleven 
and the parish stood bewildered. From 1803 until 1811? But what of the four years that followed? For he remained at Kilmeny until 1815, the year of Waterloo. Let me set a second picture beside the one I have already painted. Could any contrast be greater? The people were bewildered before. They were even more bewildered now. The minister was another man. The kirk was another place. During those closing years at Kilmeny, Mr. Chalmers thundered against the grosser crimes no more. He never again held forth from his pulpit against the iniquities of the Napoleonic program. But every Sunday he had something fresh to say about the love of God, about the cross of Christ, and about the way of salvation. Every Sunday he urged his people with tears to repent, to believe, and to enter into life everlasting. Every Sunday he set before them the beauty of the Christian life, and by all the arts and eloquent persuasion endeavored to lead his people into it. He would bend over the pulpit, writes one who heard him both before and after the change. He would bend over the pulpit and press us to take the gift, as if he had in that moment in his hand, and would not be satisfied till every one of us had got possession of it. And often, when the sermon was over and the psalms was sung, he rose to pronounce the blessing. He would break out afresh with some new entreaty, unwilling to let us go until he had made one more effort to persuade us to accept it. Now here are the two pictures side by side. The picture of Chalmers during his first eight years at Kilmeny, and the picture of Chalmers during his last four years there. The question is, what happened in 1811 to bring about the change? That is the question, and the answer, bluntly stated, is that in 1811 Chalmers was converted. He made a startling discovery, the most sensational discovery that any man ever made. He had occupied all the years of his ministry on the Ten Commandments. Now he discovered not only that there are more commandments than ten, but the greatest commandment of all are not to be found among the ten. The experience of Chalmers resembles in many respects the experience of the Marquis of Lossie. Readers of George MacDonald's Malcolm will never forget the chapter on the Marquis and the Schoolmaster. The dying Marquis sends for the devout schoolmaster, Mr. Graham. The schoolmaster knows his man and goes cautiously to work. Are you satisfied with yourself, my lord? No, by God. You would like to be better? Yes, but how is a poor devil to get out of this infernal scrape? Keep the commandments. That's it, of course, but there's no time. If there were but time to draw another breath, there would be time to begin. How am I to begin? Which am I to begin with? There is one commandment which includes all the rest. Which is that? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. When the Marquis of Lossie passed from the Ten Commandments to the commandment that included all the ten, he found the peace for which he hungered, and strangely enough, Chalmers entered into life in a precisely similar way. I am much taken, he says in his journal, in May 1811, I am much taken with Walker's observation that we are commanded to believe on the Son of God. Commanded. The Ten Commandments. The commandment that includes all the commandments. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. That was the Marquis of Lossie's text, and it was Chalmers. At about this time he was overtaken by a serious illness. He always regarded those days of feebleness and confinement as the critical days in his spiritual history. Long afterwards, when the experience of the years had shown that the impressions then made were not transitory, he wrote to his brother, giving him an account of the change that then overtook him. He described it as a great revolution in all his methods of thought. I am now most thoroughly of opinion, he goes on, that on the system of do this and live, no peace can ever be attained. It is, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. When this belief enters the heart, joy and confidence enter along with it. Thus says Mr. Hanna in his great biography of Chalmers, thus we see him stepping from the treacherous ground of do and live to place his feet upon the firm foundation of believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Do the Ten Commandments. That was his theme at Kilmeny for eight long years. Believe the commandment that includes all the commandments. That was the word that transformed his life and transfigured his ministry. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. The result of that change we have partly seen. 
but only partly. We have seen it from the point of view of the pew. We have seen the farmer folk of Kilmeny astonished as they caught a new note in the minister's preaching, a new accent in the minister's voice. But we must see the change from the view of the pulpit. And as seen from the pulpit, the result of the transformation was even more surprising and sensational. Chalmers alone can tell that story, and we must let him tell it in his own way. The twelve years at Kilmeny, the eight before the change, and the four after it, have come to an end at last, and at a special meeting called for the purpose, Mr. Chalmers is taking a sorrowful farewell of his first congregation. The farmers and their wives have driven in from far and near. Their minister has been called to a great city charge. They are proud of it but they find it hard to give him up. The valedictory speeches have all been made, and now Chalmers rises to reply. After a feeling acknowledgment of the compliments paid him, he utters one of his most impressive and valuable testimonies to which any minister ever gave expression. I cannot record, he says, the effect of an actual though undesigned experiment which I prosecuted for upwards of twelve years among you. For the first eight years of that time I could expedite only on the meanness of dishonesty, of the villainy of falsehood, of the despicable acts of calumny, in a word, upon all those deformities of character which awaken the natural indignation of the human heart against the pests and disturbers of human society. But the interesting fact is that, for the whole of that period, I never once heard of any reformation being wrought among my people. All the vehemence with which I urged the virtues and the proprieties of social life had not the weight of a feather upon the normal habits of my parishioners. It was not until the free offer of forgiveness through the blood of Jesus Christ was urged upon the acceptance of my hearers that I ever heard of any of those subordinate reformations which I made the ultimate object of my earlier ministrations. And he closes that farewell speech with these memorable words. You have taught me, he says, that to preach Christ is the only effective way of preaching morality. And out of our humble cottages I have gathered a lesson, which in all of its simplicity I shall carry into a wider theater. Do the Ten Commandments. That was his theme at Kilmeny for eight long years, and it had not the weight of a feather. Believe the commandment that includes all the commandments. That was his theme for the last four years, and he beheld its gracious and renovating effects in every home in the parish. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. With that great witness on his lips, Chalmers lays down his charge at Kilmeny and plunges into a larger sphere of world history. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. Chalmers greatly believed, and was greatly saved. He was saved from all sin and made saintly. If ever a halo surrounded a saint, declares Lord Rosebery, it encompasses Chalmers. He was saved from all the littleness and made great. Mr. Gladstone used to say of him that the world can never forget his warrior grandeur, his unbounded philanthropy, his strength of purpose, his mental integrity, his absorbed and absorbing earnestness, and above all, his singular simplicity. He was one of nature's nobles. A strong-featured man, says Carlyle thinking of the massive form, the leonine head, and the commanding countenance of his old friend, a strong-featured man, and a very beautiful character. When I want a definition of the salvation that comes by faith, I think of Thomas Chalmers. Yes, he greatly believed and was greatly saved. He greatly lived and greatly died. It is a Sunday evening. He, now an old man of sixty-seven, has remained at home and has spent a delightful evening with his children and grandchildren. It is one of the happiest evenings that they have ever spent together. We had family worship this morning, the old doctor says to a minister who happens to be present, but you must give us worship again this evening. I expect to give worship in the morning. Immediately after prayers he withdraws, smiling and waving his hands to them all and wishing them a general good night. They call him in the morning, but there is no response. I expect to give worship in the morning, he had said, and he has gone to give it. He is sitting up in bed, half erect, his head reclined gently on the pillow, the expression of his countenance, that of fixed and majestic repose. 
his students liked to think that their old master had been translated at the zenith of his powers he felt no touch of senile decay believe on the lord jesus christ and thou shalt be saved what is it to be saved i do not know no man knows but as i think of the transformation that the text effected in the experience of chalmers as i contemplate his valiant and unselfish life together with his beautiful and glorious death and as i try to conceive of the felicity into which that sunday night he entered i can form an idea end of chapter one chapter two of a bunch of everlastings or texts that made history by frank w borum this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by tim bower chapter two martin luther's text it goes without saying that the text that made martin luther made history with a vengeance when through its mystical but mighty ministry martin luther entered into the newness of life the face of the world was changed it was though all the windows of europe had been suddenly thrown open and the sunshine came streaming in everywhere the destinies of empires were turned that day into a new channel carlyle has a stirring and dramatic chapter in which he shows that every nation under heaven stood or fell according to the attitude that it assumed toward martin luther i call this luther a great man he exclaims he is great in intellect great in courage great in affection and integrity one of our most lovable and gracious men he is great not as a hewn obelisk is great but as an alpine mountain is great so simple honest spontaneous not setting himself up to be great but there for quite another purpose than the purpose of being great a mighty man he says again what were all emperors popes and potentates in comparison his light was to flame as a beacon over long centuries and epochs of the world the whole world and its history was waiting for this man and elsewhere he declares that the moment in which luther defied the wrath of the diet of worms was the greatest moment in the modern history of men here then was the man what was the text that made him let us visit a couple interesting european libraries and here in the convent of erfurt we are shown an exceedingly famous and beautiful picture it represents luther as a young monk of four-and-twenty pouring in the early morning over a copy of the scriptures to which a bit of broken chain is hanging the dawn is stealing through the open lattice illuminating both the open bible and the eager face of its reader and on the page that the young monk so intently studies are to be seen the words the just shall live by faith the just shall live by faith the just shall live by faith these then are the words that made the world all over again and now leaving the convent at erfurt let us visit another library the library of rudstalt for here in a glass case we shall discover a manuscript that will fascinate us it is a letter in the handwriting of dr paul luther the reformer's youngest son in the year 1544 we read my late dearest father in the presence of us all narrated the whole story of his journey to rome he acknowledged with great joy that in that city through the spirit of jesus christ he had come to the knowledge of the truth of the everlasting gospel it happened in this way as he repeated his prayers on the lateran staircase the words of the prophet habakkuk came suddenly to his mind the just shall live by faith thereupon he ceased his prayers returned to wittenberg and took this as the chief foundation of all his doctrine the just shall live by faith the just shall live by faith the picture in one library and the manuscript in the other have told us all that we desire to know the just shall live by faith the just shall live by faith the words do not flash or glitter like the ocean they do not give any indication upon the surface of the profundities and mysteries that lie concealed beneath and yet of what other text can it be said that occurring in the old testament it is thrice quoted in the new the just shall live by faith cries the prophet the just shall live by faith says paul when he addressed a letter to the greatest of the european churches the just shall live by faith he says again in his letter to the greatest of the asiatic churches 
the just shall live by faith says the writer of the epistle to the hebrews addressing himself to the jews it is though we were the sum and substance of everything to be proclaimed by prophets in the old dispensation and echoed by apostles in the new to be translated into all languages and transmitted to every section of the habitable earth indeed bishop lightfoot as good as says that the words represent the concentration and epitome of all revealed religion the whole law he says was given to moses in six hundred and thirteen precepts david in the fifteenth psalm brings them all within the compass of eleven isaiah reduces them to six micah to three and isaiah in a later passage to two but habakkuk condenses them all into one the just shall live by faith and this string of monosyllables that sums up everything and is sent to every one the old world's text the new world's text the prophet's text the jew's text the european's text the asiatic's text everybody's text in a special and peculiar sense martin luther's text we made that discovery in the libraries of erfurt and rudelstadt and we shall as we proceed find abundant evidence to confirm us in that conclusion for strangely enough the text that echoed itself three times in the new testament echoed itself three times also in the experience of luther it met him at wittenberg it met him at bologna and it finally mastered him at rome it was at wittenberg that the incident occurred which we have already seen transferred to the painter's canvas in the retirement of his quiet cell while the world is still wrapped in slumber he pours over the epistle to the romans paul's quotation from habakkuk strangely captivates him the just shall live by faith the just shall live by faith this precept says the historian fascinates him for just then he says to himself there is a life different from that of other men and this life is the gift of faith this promise to which he opens all his heart as if god had placed it there specially for him unveils to him the mystery of the christian life for years afterwards in the midst of his numerous occupations he fancies that he still hears the words repeating themselves to him over and over again the just shall live by faith the just shall live by faith years pass luther travels in the course of his journey he crosses the alps is entertained at benedict convent in bologna and is there overtaken by a serious sickness his mind relapses into utmost darkness and dejection to die thus under the burning sky and in the foreign land he shudders at the thought the sense of his sinfulness troubles him the prospect of judgment fills him with dread but at the very moment at which these terrors reach their highest pitch the words that had already struck him at wittenberg recur forcibly to his memory and enlighten his soul like a ray from heaven the just shall live by faith the just shall live by faith thus restored and comforted the record concludes he soon regained his health and resumes his journey the third of these experiences the experience narrated in that fireside conversation of which the manuscript at rudelstadt has told us befalls him at rome wishing to obtain an indulgence promised by the pope to all who shall ascend pilate's staircase on their knees the good saxon monk is painfully creeping up these steps which he is told were miraculously transported from jerusalem to rome whilst he is performing his meritorious act however he thinks he hears a voice of thunder crying as at wittenberg and bologna the just shall live by faith the just shall live by faith these words that twice before have struck him like the voice of an angel from heaven resound unceasingly and powerfully within him he rises in amazement from the steps upon which he is dragging his body he shudders at himself he is ashamed at seeing to what a depth superstition plunged him he flies far from the scene of his folly thus thrice in the new testament and thrice in the life of luther the text speaks with singular appropriateness and effect this powerful text remarks merle dubin has a mysterious influence on the life of luther it was a creative sentence both for the reformer and for the reformation it was in these words that god then said let there be light and there was light it was the unveiling of the face of god 
until this great transforming text flashed its light into the soul of luther his thought of god was a pagan thought and the pagan thought is an unjust thought an unworthy thought a cruel thought look at this indian devotee from head to foot he bears the marks of his torture that he has inflicted upon his body in his frantic efforts to give pleasure to his god his back is a tangle of scars the flesh has been lacerated by the pitiless hooks by which he has swung himself on the terrible cheruca iron spears have been repeatedly run through his tongue his ears are torn to ribbons what does it mean it can only mean that he worships a fiend his god loves to see him in anguish his cries of pain are music in the ears of the deity whom he adores this ceaseless orgy of torture is his futile endeavor to satisfy the idol's lust for blood luther made precisely the same mistake to his sensitive mind every thought of god was a thing of terror when i was young he tells us it happened that at eiselbin on corpus christi day i was walking with the procession when suddenly the sight of the holy sacrament which was carried by dr Staupitz, so terrified me that a cold sweat covered my body and i believed myself dying of terror all through his convent days he proceeds upon the assumption that god gloats over his misery his life is a long drawn-out agony he creeps like a shadow along the galleries of the cloister the walls echoing with his dismal moanings his body wastes to a skeleton his strength ebbs away on more than one occasion his brother monks find him prostrate on the convent floor and pick him up for dead and all the time he thinks of god as one who can find delight in these contentious torments the just shall live he says to himself by penance and by pain the just shall live by fasting the just shall live by fear the just shall live by fear luther mutters to himself every day of his life the just shall live by faith says the text that breaks upon him like a light from heaven by fear by fear by faith by faith and what is faith the theologians may find difficulty in defining it yet every little child knows what it is in all the days of my own ministry i have found only one definition that has satisfied me and whenever i have had occasion to speak of faith i have recited it it is bishop o'brien's they who know what is meant by faith in a promise know what is meant by faith in the gospel they who know what is meant by faith in a remedy know what is meant by faith in the blood of the redeemer they who know what is meant by faith in a physician faith in an advocate faith in a friend know too what is meant by faith in the lord jesus christ with the coming of the text luther passes from the realm of fear into the realm of faith it is like passing from the rigors of an arctic night into the sunshine of a summer day it is like passing from a crowded city slum into a field where the daffodils dance and the linnets sing it is like passing into a new world it is like entering paradise yes it is like entering paradise the expression is his not mine before those words broke upon my mind he says i hated god and was angry with him because not content with frightening us sinners by the law and by the miseries of life he still further increases our torture by the gospel but when by the spirit of god i understood these words the just shall live by faith the just shall live by faith then i felt born again like a new man i entered through the open doors into the very paradise of god henceforth he says again i saw the beloved and holy scriptures with other eyes the words that i had previously detested i began from that hour to value and to love as the sweetest and most consoling words in the bible in very truth this text was to me the true great paradise an open door into the very paradise of god this text was to me the true gate of paradise and they who enter into the city of god by that gate will go no more out forever end of chapter two chapter three of a bunch of everlastings or texts that made history by frank w borum this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by tim bower chapter three sir john franklin's text a heap of books and bones and that was all 
One after another, no fewer than 40 intrepid navigators had invaded the awful solitudes of the Arctic seas in quest of some trace of Sir John Franklin and his gallant men. And this was the tardy and meager reward of those long, long years of search. On the snowbound coast of a large but inhospitable island, Sir Francis McClintock discovered an overturned and dilapidated boat. Underneath it, together with a few guns and watches they found a collection of bones and of books the men had been more than ten years dead sir john franklin it was known from documents found elsewhere had died upon his ship his last moments were cheered by the knowledge which came to him just in time that the expedition had been successful and that the long dreamed of northwest passage had been proved to be a fact the other members of the expedition more than a hundred and twenty men had made an attempt to save their lives by an overland dash the natives had seen that shadowy and wavering line of wanderers they were very thin the eskimos said and could with difficulty stagger along with every mile some fell out and lay down in the snow to die others according to an old native woman who met them seemed to die upon their feet and they only fell because death had already overtaken them but of all the members of the franklin expedition these were the first whose bones were actually found and with the bones some books it was the bones that principally interest their discoverers it is the books that must principally interest us for some of these saturated and frozen volumes were once the personal property of sir john franklin do they not still bear his name one of them is a battered copy of dr john todd's student manual sir john has turned down a leaf in order to mark a passage that appears on almost the last page of the book are you not afraid to die no no why does the uncertainty of another state give you no concern because god has said to me fear not when thou passest through the waters i will be with thee and through the rivers they shall not overflow thee there as though his frozen finger pointed to it stands sir john franklin's text the waters the waters the beckoning challenging waters when thou passest through the waters from his earliest boyhood the waters had called him he lived in an inland town his parents designed him for the church he was to be a bishop so they said but a holiday at the seaside makes all the difference he walks up and down the sands looking out on the infinite expanse of water he climbs the broken cliffs and shading his eyes with his hands watches the great ships vanish over the distant skyline the unseen taunts his imagination it alters the whole course of his life the sight of the sea awakens a tempest of strange passions in his soul distant voices call him and distant fingers beckon to be a sailor to be the first that ever burst into some silent sea his fancy catches fire at the very thought of it the waters the waters the call of the waters when thou passest through the waters he yields himself to the impulse that he scarcely has the power to resist he gives himself to the waters and he learns the business of seamanship from the most distinguished masters of all time with matthew flanders the most audacious and the most unfortunate of our australian explorers he circumnavigates this great continent whilst at copenhagen and trafalgar he fights beneath the greatest sailor since the world began he makes friends too with men who have sailed with captain cook from one of whom sir joseph banks he catches the inspiration that sends him cruising into the arctic seas but whether in peaceful exploration or amidst the excitement of war whether in the sunny south or in the frigid and desolate north he is forever listening to the voices of the waters he knows what the wild waves are saying they are calling him to come and he obeys for in his heart he cherishes a wonderful secret the unknown waters are not as lonely as they seem the shining tropical waters the frozen polar waters the unseen unsailed waters when thou passest through the waters i will be with thee the delightful eyes of franklin behold a sea of significance in that a dauntless explorer and a brilliant discoverer was franklin but by far the most fruitful discovery of his adventurous life was made in eighteen twenty he was then in his thirty-fifth year and was undergoing his first experience of the ice-bound north he was in charge of the overland section of the expedition and was compelled to winter at fort enterprise a desolate spot halfway between the great bear lake and the great slave lake 
It was a weird experience, so cold, so dark, so still. In a letter to his sister written from this outlandish solitude, he speaks of the astonishing way in which, during the intense Arctic silence, his Bible breaks with new beauty upon him. It is not the same book. The surprises grow in novelty and wonder every day. Everything in the sacred volume, and especially the central story, the story of redeeming love, acquires a new glory in his enraptured eyes. In this hushed wilderness of snow and ice, he has abundant time for thought. Such serious reflection, he says, must soon convince a sinner of his guilt, of his inability to do anything to save himself, of his urgent need of deliverance. If, under this conviction, he should inquire, how then can I be saved? Would it not be joy unspeakable for him to find that the gospel points out the way? Christ who died for the salvation of sinners is the way, the truth, and the life. Whoso cometh unto him in full purpose of heart shall in no wise be cast out. Can anything be more cheer than these assurances, or better calculated to fill the mind with heavenly impressions and lift up the heart in grateful adoration to God? How then can I be saved? I am the way, the truth, and the life. Him that cometh unto me I will in no wise cast out. He has heard the call of the waters, and on his very first venture into the cold and silent north, he has discovered this. He has found not only a savior, but a friend. He has received the assurance of whatever seas he sells, of a divine presence, a sacred comradeship, and to the end of his life he never ceases to prize it. The saint is never cast in a mold, no two are alike. On my desk at this moment lie two books side by side. One is The Life of Sir John Franklin, and the other Brother Lawrence's Practice of the Presence of God. Can any greater contrast be imagined? Here are two types of saintliness. Neither appears to have anything in common with the other, for one man is a monk, and the other a mariner. One is a recluse, moving among the cells and cloisters of a Carmelite monastery. The other travels over all the continents and sails into all the seas. The one is essentially an ascetic. The other is essentially a man of the world. The one is pale and thin and sad. The other is bluff and bronzed and jolly. And yet I am impressed at this moment, not by the contrast, but by the similitude. Let us look for a moment beneath the trappings alike of the monk and of the mariner. And in each case let us search the soul of the man, I have quieted all forms of devotion, says Brother Lawrence, but those to which my state obliges me, and I make it my business only to preserve in his holy presence. I am assured beyond all doubt that my soul has been with God above these thirty years. Were I a preacher, I should above all other things preach the practice of the presence of God, and were I a director, I should advise all the world to it. So necessary do I think it, and so easy too i cannot imagine how religious persons can live satisfied without the practice of the presence of god while i am with him i fear nothing but the least turning from him is insupportable now had i not revealed the source of these words nobody could have told whether i had copied them from the conversations of the monk or from the journal of the mariner they fell from the lips of brother lawrence but they might just as easily have occurred in the correspondence of franklin for it was the joy of Franklin's life, and the comfort of his death, that he could never be alone. When thou passest through the waters, the promise said, I will be with thee, and he believed it. The thought runs through all his farewell letters. His leave-taking reminds me of Enoch Arnold's. Keep everything ship-shape, for I must go, and fear no more for me, for if you fear, cast all your cares on God. That anchor holds, is he not yonder in those uttermost parts of the morning? If I flee to these, can I go from him? And the sea is his, the sea is his, he made it. On the night before the ship sailed on that last fatal voyage, he expressed his confidence in the divine care. In all the blunt sermons that he preached to his officers and men amidst the ice, the same thought was always uppermost. And the book, with the leaf turned down and the text, shows that his confidence held out to the last. The white, white waters, the cruel and pitiless waters, the all-engulfing waters. When thou passest through the waters, I will be with thee. In life and in death, the anchor held. Yes, the anchor held, but the strain upon it was at times terrific. 
What test, for example, can be more severe than the test of slow starvation? And more than once, Franklin's faith was subjected to that terrible ordeal. The ragamuffins in the London streets used to call Franklin the man who ate his own boots, and he lived to laugh with them at the joke. But it was grim enough experience at the time. The horror of it invaded his sleep for years afterwards. They are out amidst the snowy vastness of the interior when the food fails. They divide into two parties. Franklin leads the stronger men in an attempt to find provisions, while Dr. Richardson remains to nurse the more exhausted members of the expedition. The foraging party has no success, and all are reduced to skeletons. Whilst Franklin and his companions are resting, Dr. Richardson and a seaman of his party come spectrally upon them. They are the only survivors of the group left at the camp. All are soon too feeble to move. In their extremity a herd of reindeer trot by, but the men are too exhausted to fire. Franklin remembers the promise, and with thin and wavering voice leads the party in prayer. And this is the next entry in his journal. November 7, 1821. Praise be to the Lord. We were this day rejoiced at noon by the appearance of Indians with supplies. Old Franklin, so wrote his midshipman of his friends at home, Old Franklin is an excellent, good old chap and very clever. We are all delighted with him. He is quite a bishop. We have church morning and evening on Sundays, the evening service in the cabin to allow the attendance of the watch that could not be present in the forenoon. We all go both times. The men say they would rather have him than half the parsons in England. For, after all, there is no eloquence like the eloquence of conviction, and out of the depths of a great and wonderful experience Sir John addressed his men. The waters, the wide, wide waters, the waves on which the Lord was always walking. When thou passest through the waters, I will be with thee. The cable often quivered, but the anchor held. When thou passest through the waters, I will be with thee. Franklin found the Lord walking on all the waters. Lying on my desk is an ancient map of the world, which an old pilot showed to Henry the Seventh in the year 1500. One or two continents are missing, but there are ample compensations, for all over the unexplored territory I find written, Here are dragons, here are demons, here are sirens, here are the savages that worship devils, and so on. But on his map of the world, Franklin rode across the unknown lands and all the uncharted sea. Here is God. When thou passest through the waters, I will be with thee. And he always found him there. When thou passest through the waters, I will be with thee. Who shall doubt that when, at last, he set out upon that strange voyage on unknown seas which, sooner or later, we must all undertake, he still found the promise true. When Lord Tennyson was asked to write an inscription for the moment in Westminster Abbey, he composed the lines that are recorded as one of the real adornments of the Abbey. Not here, the white north hath thy bones, and thou, heroic sailor soul, art passing on thy happier voyage, now towards no earthly pole. Passing? Passing on thy happier voyage? When thou passest, I will be with thee. Who, I say, can doubt the presence divine on those uncharted waters? When in 1875, at the age of 83, Lady Franklin passed away, Dean Stanley added a postscript to Lord Tennyson's inscription. It declared that the monument in the abbey was erected by his widow, who, after long waiting and sending many in search of him, herself departed to seek and to find him in the realms of light. Thus he who is with each of his voyagers when they sail upon strange waters brings them safely home and safely together, and, in the bliss of arrival and reunion, the fierce storms and the long separation are alike forgotten. End of chapter 3《Chapter 4 of A Bunch of Everlastings, or Texts That Made History, by Frank W. Borum. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tim Bauer. Chapter 4 Thomas Boston's Text A winding zigzag path ascends the steep green hill beside the stream, and an elderly man, somewhat bent, and leaning heavily upon his stick, is toiling slowly and painfully up the slope. He pauses partly to take a breath, and partly that he may turn and survey the exquisite panorama of emerald woodlands and sparkling stream. 
but the grandeur of the silent hills the perfume of the tossing hyacinths the chirping of the grasshoppers at his feet and the haunting laughter of the silvery stream below all fail to gladden him to-day the beauteous landscape of leafy wold and laughing water is bathed in radiant sunshine yet for him the skies are gray and the earth is wrapped in gloom his countenance is sad and pensive for he is conjuring up the memories of happier days he is thinking of those whom he has loved long since and lost a while he knows that this must be his final visit to the enchanting valley that has inspired some of his tenderest poetry for this is william wordsworth he has written yarrow unvisited yarrow visited and yarrow revisited and now he has come to take a last lingering farewell of the lovely place he thinks of those in whose sweet society he first explored his flowering fields and forest paths thinks especially of two he thinks of dorothy his sister with whom he walked hand in hand along these soft and grassy banks in the days of long ago he owes everything to dorothy it was dorothy who made him a poet and now dorothy is ill so ill that she can never recover then turning to the east he shades his eyes with his hand and looks wistfully towards abbotsford for it is sir walter scott who first welcomed him to this delightful spot only a few months ago they rambled through these woodland paths together and now scott is dead he who was the life and soul of this romantic countryside will climb its hills and ford its streams no more to wordsworth the rugged slopes and the wooded valleys the wavering grasses and the murmuring torrent are all lamenting the loss of one who loved them each so well there are few things more affecting than to find the old familiar places but to miss the old familiar faces wordsworth passes sadly over the crest of the hill to revisit the yarrow vale no more scott is dead this was eighteen thirty two we will remain in this same delightful neighborhood but we will go back exactly a hundred years scott died in 1832 in 1732 an old minister whose manse stood at the foot of yonder hill lay dying he has come to within a few days of his triumphant departure but although death is stamped upon his face and it is known that he will never leave his bed again it is announced that he will preach on sunday morning and evening as usual he orders his bed to be drawn up to the window and prepares to address his people for the last time sunday comes from all the farms and homesteads of that selkirkshire countryside ploughmen and shepherd accompanied by their wives and children set out early in the morning to hear the old minister's last words from all around the slopes of ettrick pen from the distant foothills of broad law from the lovely shores of st mary's lake from all down the valleys of the ettrick and the yarrow little groups of men and women make their way with heavy footsteps to the manse the church at the foot of the knoll the church with its quaint tower the church in which he has ministered for five-and-twenty years is closed to-day the dying man has turned his deathbed into a pulpit and the whole countryside has gathered to listen to his last message the eager multitude stretches far beyond the reach of his thin and wavering voice but those who cannot hear can at least see his pale wan face and note the fire in his eyes that even death is impotent to quench as he sits propped up by pillows pleading with his people for the last time the mountain breezes play with his thin silvery hair he exhausts the last atom of his failing strength as he pours out his soul in affectionate admonition and passionate entreaty his voice falters the watchers around the bed gently remove the pillows that support him and he lies prostrate breathing heavily the window is closed and the great black crowd breaking up into little groups again melts sadly and silently away in a few days it is tearfully whispered in every cottage that thomas boston is dead so ended one of the most fruitful and memorable ministries that even scotland has enjoyed in seventeen thirty two as in eighteen thirty two there was sorrow in all that countryside in seventeen thirty two as in eighteen thirty two the valley of the yarrow was a vale of tears whenever i am inclined to pessimism or am tempted to suppose that modern conditions preclude the possibility of a rich and fruitful ministry i reflect on the conditions that beset poor thomas boston on the selfsame day that witnessed the union under one crown of the english and the scottish realms on may day seventeen o seven boston settled at ettrick the church had but few members and even these were of such type that their behavior was a reproach to the sanctuary 
the poor minister, whose heart was still tender at leaving his first people, was horrified to find that his new parishioners could scarcely speak without profanity, and were addicted to lives of the grossest immorality. Their sins, moreover, were absolutely shameless. They were smart of an uncommon assurance, self-conceited and censorious to a pitch. Even when they came to church their conduct was disorderly and indecent to the last degree. Many of them loitered about the churchyard, arguing and brawling whilst worship was proceeding. The elders had been told off to keep order both inside and outside of the building. It was three years before Mr. Boston would allow the Lord's Supper to be observed among them. I have been much discouraged with respect to my parish a long time, he says in his memoirs, and have had little hand or heart for my work. For twenty-five years, however, he ministered incessantly to his people. He visited them all in their homes, pleaded with them each in secret, invited the heads of the household to the manse, and taught them how to conduct family worship. After three years he was sufficiently assured of the sincerity of a handful of his people to admit them to the Lord's table. Five years later he is delighted to find that he has a hundred and fifty devout communicants. Later still, he witnesses the most surprising spectacle in this same valley. People come in streams from far and near to be present at the communion service at Ettrick. It often reminded him of the Jewish pilgrims in Old Testament times ascending in companies to Jerusalem to keep their Passover. When the sacred season came round, he had to call in other ministers to help him dispense the mystic symbols. The wilderness had become a fruitful field. The Ettrick Manse was every week the resort of eager penitents, who, beholding with amazement the transformation in so many lives around them, were anxious to catch the holy contagion. In every house, family worship sanctified the opening and sweetened the close of each succeeding day. And the old church under the hill was to hundreds and hundreds of people the dearest spot that eyes had ever seen. Did I say that when they withdrew the bed from the window and the dying minister turned his face to the wall, his memorable ministry ended? If so, it was a slip of the pen, and an unpardonable slip at that. It is every man's duty to provide himself with some honest work that he may do when he is lying in his grave. Boston did, for when the ministry of his lips ended, the ministry of his pen began. For years after his death, Thomas Boston's books were the most popular and most powerful works in Scotland, and by means of them the fragrance that had for so long filled the Ettrick Valley was wafted far and wide. Whilst Thomas Boston was lying in his grave, his influence was growing by leaps and bounds. Speaking of one of the books, The Fourfold State, Dr. Andrew Thompson, in his introduction to Boston's Life and Times, says that within a quarter of a century of its publication, it had found its way and was eagerly read and pondered over the Scottish lowlands. From St. Ab's Head to the remotest point in Galloway, it was to be seen side by side with the Bible and Bunyan on the shelf in every peasant's cottage. The shepherd bore it with him, folded in his plaid, up among the silent hills the ploughman in the valley refreshed his spirits with it and with heavenly manna after his long day of toil the influence which began with the humble classes ascended like a fragrance into the mansions of the lowland laird and the border chief and carried with it a new and hallowed joy and on the authority of one who lived nearer to Boston's time, he says that for three generations his book was the instrument of more numerous conversions and more extensive spiritual quickening than any other volume he could name. And has not Dr. Thomas McCry, one of the greatest authorities on Scottish life and literature, who was himself born in the same little border town in which Boston first saw the light? spoken of the fourfold state as a book that has contributed more than any other work to mould the religious sentiment of the scottish people now where was this lamp lit and by what flame was it kindled from infancy boston was taught to take religion seriously had not his father endured imprisonment for conscience sake and had not thomas as a little boy sat with him in his cell to help relieve his loneliness but when the lad was twelve years of age, the Reverend Henry Erskine, a name that must always hold a charm to Scottish folk, came to the border country and began to preach. From every direction people flocked to hear him. John Boston went, taking little Thomas with him. They were deeply moved and went again. Then, one never-to-be-forgotten day, Mr. Erskine cried out, Behold the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. 
Behold the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. What mountainous words! The Lamb, the sin, God, the world, the Lamb of God, the sin of the world, the Lamb that taketh away the sin. By this, says Boston, I judge God spake to me. I know I was touched to the quick at the first hearing, wherein I was like one amazed with some new and strange thing. Sure I am, I was in good earnest concerned for a saving interest in Jesus Christ. My soul went out after him, and the place of his feet was glorious in mine eyes. The day on which that stupendous pronouncement was first made was a day on which the slow evolution of prophecy reached its culmination and its climax. In the gray dawn of history, a youth had climbed Mount Moriah, walking by his father's side, asking as he walked one pertinent and tragic question. My father, behold the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Where is the lamb? Where is the lamb? The question, once stated, echoed down the ages from generation to generation. For twenty centuries it haunted the hearts of men. And then, one day, the people were assembled at Jerusalem for the Passover, the feast of the Lamb that was slain. The thought of sacrifice, and especially the sacrifice of the Lamb, was in every mind. And as they flocked together to listen to the preaching of a strange prophetic figure from the desert, the speaker caught sight of a face in the crowd, a face such as earth had never seen before. And forsaking the beaten track of his discord, he cried out, Behold the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. The riddle of the ages was read at last. Behold the Lamb! Behold the Lamb! I once stood in the valley of the Reese River at the head of Lake Wakatapu, says Dr. Rutherford Waddell, and looking up at the great glacial heights of Mount Earnslaw. Far away, up across the mountain brow, innumerable rills and streams of water were pouring like silver bars down towards the pine forest that climbed the mountain side. Across the vast widths of snow and ice they converged their multitudinous rills, and by the time they had reached the forest they had united their streams into one great torrent. This comes tumbling down, forming the beautiful Lennox waterfall, and then, leaping forth, it hurries away hence to the plain, singing the song of liberty and life. So all the diverging streams of ancient thought and Hebrew prophecy meet in one great announcement. The long evolution of the ages finds its culmination at last in a living person. Behold the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. Boston heard Erskine repeat that stupendous declaration in a little border town, and all his heart stood up to greet its deep and awful significance. But what is that profound significance? The Lamb, the Lamb of God, the Lamb that taketh away the sin. What does it mean? The Lamb stands for two things, two and no more. It is the symbol of innocence, and it is the symbol of suffering. These two factors in human experience, innocence and suffering, are united in a symbolism of the Lamb, and they are united in the eternal scheme of things. From the dark tragedy of human guilt passes through two stages. There is the preliminary stage, the stage in which the guilt of the guilty is the torture of the innocent, the father heartbroken at his daughter's shame, the mother weeping over the excesses of her dissolute boy. And there is a subsequent stage, the stage in which the innocence of the innocent is the torture of the guilty. Legree tormented by the lock of his mother's hair. Dombe racked in the day of his ruin by the fact that every loving blossom he had withered in his innocent daughter's heart was snowing down in ashes on him. The first of these principles, the torture of the innocent by the guilt of the guilty, led to redemption. The second of these principles, the torture of the guilty by the innocent of the innocent, leads to repentance. The first led the Son of the Highest to become the Lamb of God. The second led to the transformation in the soul of Boston when the great revelation burst upon him. The startling proclamation that had so captivated his own heart became the keynote of Boston's historic and epic-making ministry. From the time of his settling here, he says, the great thing I aimed at in my preaching was to impress the people with a sense of their need of Christ. In his latter years, Boston became convinced that a good sermon ought to be frequently repeated. He himself preached one sermon again and again and again. Its text was, Behold the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. And when the people gathered that Sunday under the bedroom window to hear his dying message, he still urged them with many tears to fix their eyes and their affection upon the Lamb of God. 
when Boston's sun was setting in Scotland, Wesley's was rising in England. It was in those days that Charles Wesley sang, Happy if with my latest breath I may but grasp his name, preach him to all, and cry in death, Behold, behold, the Lamb. And whilst in England Charles Wesley coveted for himself so sublime an experience, Thomas Boston in Scotland actually tasted its felicity. End of chapter 4《Chapter Five of A Bunch of Everlastings or Texts That Made History by Frank W. Borum. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tim Bauer. Chapter Five Hugh Latimer's Text. There is excitement in the streets of London. Who is this upon whom the crowd is pressing as he passes down the strand? Women throw open the windows and gaze admiringly out. Shopkeepers rush from behind their counters and join the throng as it approaches. Apprentices fling aside their tools and from every lane and alley pour into the street. Wagoners rein in their horses and leave them for a moment unattended. The taverns empty as the procession draws near them. Everybody is anxious to catch a glimpse of this man's face, to hear, if possible, the sound of his voice, or better still, to clasp his hand as he passes. For this is Hugh Latimer the terror of evildoers, the idol of the common people, and to use the phraseology of a chronicler of the period, the honestest man in England. By sheer force of character he has raised himself from a plowman's cottage to a bishop's palace, an achievement that, in the sixteenth century, stands without precedent or parallel. My father was a yeoman, he says, in the course of a sermon preached before the king. My father was a yeoman and had no lands of his own. He had a farm of three or four pounds a year at the utmost, and hereupon he tilled so much as kept half a dozen men. He had walked for a hundred sheep, and my mother milked thirty kine. He kept me at school, or else I had not been able to have preached before the king's majesty now, nor has his elevation spoiled him. He has borne with him in his exultations the spirit of the common people. He feels as they feel, he thinks as they think, he even speaks as they speak. It was said of him, as of his master, that the common people heard him gladly. In cathedral pulpits and royal chapels, he speaks a dialect that the common people can readily understand. He uses homely illustrations gathered from the farm, the kitchen, and the counting-house. He studiously eschews the pedantries of the schoolmen and the subtleties of the theologians. His sermons are, as Mockley says, the plain talk of a plain man, who sprang from the body of the people, who sympathized strongly with their wants and their feelings, and who boldly uttered their opinions. It was on account of the fearless way in which stout-hearted old Hugh exposed the misdeeds of men in airmen tippets and gold collars that the Londoners cheered him as he walked down the strand to preach at White Hall, struggling for a touch of his gown, and bawled, Have at them, Father Latimer. There he goes, then, a man of sound sense, honest affection, earnest purpose, and sturdy speech. A man whose pale face, stooping figure, and emaciated frame show that it has cost him something to struggle upwards from the plowshare to the palace. A man who looks for all the world like some old Hebrew prophet, transplanted incongruously into the prosaic life of London. He passes down the strand with the people surging fondly around him. He loves the people and is pleased with their confidence in him. His heart is simple enough and human enough to find the sweetest of all music in the plaudits that are ringing in his ears. So much for London. We must go to Oxford. There is excitement in the streets of Oxford. Who is this upon whom the crowd is pressing as he passes down from the mayor's house to the open ground in front of Balliol College? Again, women lean out of their windows. Shopkeepers are forsaking their counters. Apprentices are throwing aside their tools and drivers are deserting their horses that they may stare at him. It is Hugh Latimer again. He is a little thinner than when we saw him in London, for he has exchanged a palace for a prison. The people still press upon him and make progress difficult, but this time they crowd around him that they may curse him. It is the old story of Hosanna one day, and away with him crucify him the next. The multitude is a fickle master. Since we saw him in the strand, the crown has passed from one head to another, 
the court has changed its way to gratify the whims of its new mistress the government has swung round to match the moods of the court and the people like sheep have followed their leaders they are prepared now to crown the men whom before they would have crucified and to crucify the men whom they would then have crowned but hugh latimer and his companion for this time he is not alone are not of the accommodating temper hugh latimer is still the honestest man in england his conscience is still his only monitor his tongue is still free his soul is not for sale and so in oxford town the faggots they piled with furious haste and with curses wild round two brave men of our british breed who dared to stand true to their speech and deed round two brave men of that sturdy race who with tremorless souls the worst can face round two brave souls who could keep their tryst through a pathway of fire to follow christ and the flames leaped up and the blinding smoke could not the soul of hugh latimore choke for said he brother ridley be of good cheer a candle in england is lighted here which by grace of god shall never go out and that speech in whispers was echoed about latimer's light shall never go out however the winds may blow it about latimer's light has come to stay till the trump of the coming judgment day bishop ridley so the record runs first entered the lists dressed in his episcopal habit and soon after bishop latimer dressed as usual in his prison garb master latimer now suffered the keeper to pull off his prison garb and then he appeared in his shroud being ready he fervently recommended his soul to god and then he delivered himself to the executioner saying to the bishop of london these prophetic words we shall this day my lord light such a candle in england as shall never be extinguished but it is time that we went back forty years or so to a time long before either of these processions that we have just witnessed took place we must ascertain at what flame the light that kindled that candle was itself ignited very early in the sixteenth century england was visited by one of the greatest scholars of the renaissance desiderius erasmus after being welcomed with open arms at the universities he returned to the continent and engrossed himself in his learned researches at cambridge however he had made a profound and indelible impression on at least one of the scholars thomas bilney familiarly known as little bilney was feeling in a vague and indifferent way the emptiness of the religion that he had been taught he felt that erasmus possessed a secret that was hidden from english eyes and he vowed that whatever it might cost him he would purchase every line that came from the great master's pen in france erasmus translated the new testament into latin the ingenuity and industry of bilney soon secured for him a copy of the book as to its effect upon him he shall speak for himself my soul was sick he says and i longed for peace but nowhere could i find it i went to the priests and they appointed me penances and pilgrimages yet by these things my poor sick soul was nothing profited but at last i heard of jesus it was then when first the new testament was set forth by erasmus that the light came i bought the book being drawn thereto rather by the latin than by the word of god for at that time i knew not what the word of god meant and on the first reading of it as i well remember i chanced upon these words this is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that christ jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom i am chief that one sentence through god's inward working did so lift up my poor bruised spirit that the very bones within me leaped for joy and gladness it was as if after a long dark night day had suddenly broke but what has all this to do with hugh latimer in those days latimer was preaching at cambridge and all who heard him fell under the spell of his transparent honesty and rugged eloquence latimer was then the sturdy champion of the old religion and the uncompromising foe of all who were endeavoring to introduce a new learning of all the friars he was the most punctilious the most zealous the most devout bilney went to hear him and fell in love with him at once he saw that the preacher was mistaken that his eyes had not been opened to the sublimities that had flooded his own soul with gladness but he recognized his sincerity his earnestness and his resistless power and he longed to be the instrument of his illumination 
If only I could do for Latimer what Aquila and Priscilla did for Apollos, and expound unto him the way of God more perfectly. It became the dream and desire of Bilney's life. O oh God, he cried, I am but little Bilney, and shall never do any great thing for thee. But give me the soul of that man, Hugh Latimer, and what wonders he shall do in thy most holy name. Where there's a will, there's a way. One day, as Latimer descends from the pulpit, he passes so close to Bilney that his robes almost brush the student's face. Like a flash, a sudden inspiration leaps to Bilney's mind. Pray thee, Father Latimer, he whispers, may I confess my soul to thee? The preacher beckons, and, into the quiet room adjoining, the student follows. Of all the strange stories that heartbroken penitents have poured into the ears of father confessors since the first confessional was established, that was the strangest. Bilney falls on his knees at Latimer's feet and allows his soul, pent up for so long, to utter itself freely at last. He tells of the aching hunger of his heart, he tells of the visit of Erasmus, he tells of the purchase of the book, and then he tells of the text. There it stood, he says the tears standing in his eyes. The very word I wanted, it seemed to be written in letters of light. This is a faithful saying, and worthy of all acceptation, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Oh, Father Lattimore, he cries, the passion of his fervor increasing as the memory of his own experience rushes back upon him. I went to the priests, and they pointed me to broken cisterns that held no water and only mocked my thirst. I bore the load of my sin until my soul was crushed beneath the burden. And then I saw that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am chief. And now, being justified by faith, I have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Latimer was taken by storm. He is completely overwhelmed. He, too, knows the aching dissatisfaction that Bilney has described. He has experienced for years the same insatiable hunger the same devouring thirst. To the astonishment of Bilney, Latimer rises and then kneels beside him. The father confessor seeks guidance from his penitent. Bilney draws from his pocket the sacred volume that has brought such comfort and such rapture to his own soul. It falls open to the passage that Bilney has read to himself over and over and over again. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am chief. The light that never was on sea or shore illumines the soul of Hugh Latimer, and Bilney sees that the passionate desire of his heart has been granted him. And from that hour Bilney and Latimer lived only that they might unfold to all kinds and conditions of men the unsearchable riches of Christ. This is a faithful saying. That is the preacher's comfort. In the course of a recent tour through Western Australia, I was taken through the gold diggings, and near Canona I was shown the spot on which, years ago, they gathered one of the largest and most extraordinary congregations that ever assembled on this side of the world. It was whispered all over the diggings that an enormous nugget had been found, and that Father Long, the local priest, had seen it and knew exactly where it was discovered. Morning, noon, and night the young priest was pestered by eager gold hunters for information, but to one and all his lips were sealed. At last he consented to announce publicly the exact location of the wonderful find. At the hour fixed men came from far and near, some on horseback, some on camels, some in all kinds of conveyances, and thousands on foot. It was the largest gathering of diggers in the history of the gold fields. At the appointed time Father Long appeared, surveyed the great sea of bronzed and bearded faces, and then announced that the sacred nugget had been found in the Lake Gwyn country. In a moment the crowd vanished. There was the wildest stampede for the territory to which the priests had pointed them, but as the days passed by the disappointed seekers, in twos and threes, came dribbing wearily back. Not a glint of gold had been seen by any of them, and the truth flashed upon them. The priest had been hoaxed. The sacred nugget was a mass of common metal splashed with gold paint. Father Long took the matter bitterly to heart, and went to bed a broken and humiliated man. And a few months later, disconsolate, he died. It was a great day in Hugh Latimer's life when he got among the faithful sayings. 
the sayings of which he was certain, the sayings that could never be to any confiding hearer the heartbreak and disgust of disappointment. It is worthy of all acceptation. It is worthy. It is worthy of your acceptance, your majesty, for this proclamation craves no patronage. It is worthy of your acceptance, your excellency, your grace, my lords, ladies, and gentlemen all, for the gospel asks no favors. It is worthy, worthy, worthy of acceptance of you all. Hugh Latimer stood before kings and courtiers, and declared that this is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Never once did he forget the dignity of his message. It was faithful, it was worthy in its own right of the acceptance of the Lordiest, and he himself staked his life upon it at the last. Dr. Archibald Alexander of Princeton was for sixty years a minister of Christ, and for forty of those years he was a professor of divinity. No man in America was more revered or beloved. He died on October 22, 1851. As he lay a-dying, he was heard by a friend to say, All my theology is reduced now to this narrow compass. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. In life and in death, Hugh Latimer was of pretty much the same mind. End of chapter 5「Chapter Six of A Bunch of Everlastings, or Texts That Made History by Frank W. Borum. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tim Bower. Chapter Six John Bunyan's Text. There is no doubt about John Bunyan's text. As a lover carves his lady's name on trees, signs it in mistake for his own, and mutters it in his sleep, so Bunyan inscribes everywhere the text that wrought his memorable deliverance. It crops up again and again in all his writings. The characters in his allegories, the dream children of his fertile fancy, repeat it to each other as though it were a password, a talisman, a charm. He himself quotes it whenever a shadow of an opportunity presents itself. If it is not the text, it is at least the burden of every sermon that he preaches. It sings itself through his autobiography like a repeating chorus, like an echoing refrain, by its radiance he extricates himself from every gloomy valley and from every dark path its joyous championship beguiles all his long and solitary tramps it dispels for him the loneliness of his dreary cell when no other visitor is permitted to approach the jail john bunyan's text comes rushing to his memory as though on angels wings it sings to him its song of confidence and peace every morning its music scatters the gloom of every night it is a friend of his fireside the companion of his solitude the comrade of his travels the light of his darkness it illuminates his path amidst the perplexities of life it wipes away his tears in the day of bitter sorrow and it soothes his pillow in the hour of death when a man habitually wears a diamond pin you unconsciously associate the thought of his face with that of the thought of the gem that scintillates beneath it in the same way nobody can have become in the slightest degree familiar with john bunyan without habitually associating the thought of his honest and rugged personality with the thought of the text that he made so peculiarly his own on the opening pages of pilgrim's progress we come upon the principal character all clothed in rags a heavy burden upon his back greatly distressed in mind walking in the fields and crying what must i do to be saved do you see yonder shining light asks evangelist i think i do replied the wretched man keep that light in your eye and go directly thereto so shalt thou see a gate at which when thou knockest it shall be told thee what thou shalt do the man comes in due course to the gate and knocks many times saying may i now enter here will he within open to sorry me though i have been an undeserving rebel then shall i not fail to sing his lasting praise on high i am willing with all my heart replies goodwill the keeper of the gate we make no objections against any notwithstanding all that they have done before they come hither they are in no wise cast out so Christian enters in at the gate and sets out on pilgrimage. 
and there at the very beginning of his new life stands the first vague but unmistakable suggestion of john bunyan's text in no wise cast out in no wise cast out him that cometh to me i will in no wise cast out there over the portal of the pilgrim path stands the text that gave john bunyan to the world it stands over the very portal of his pilgrim's path for the simple reason that it stands at the very beginning of his own religious experience let us turn from his allegory to his autobiography in no wise cast out he exclaims oh the comfort that i found in that word in no wise cast out in no wise cast out we all know the story of the wretchedness which the great world dispelled it is one of the most moving records one of the most pathetic plaints in the language bunyan felt that he was a bolt upon the face of the universe he envied the toads in the grass by the side of the road and the crows that clawed and ploughed lands by which he passed they he thought could never know such misery as that which bowed him down i walked he says in a passage that macaulay felt to be specially eloquent and notable i walked to a neighboring town and sat down upon a settle in the street and fell into a very deep pause about the most fearful state my sin had brought me to and after long musing i lifted up my head but methought i saw as if the sun that shineth in the heavens did grudge to give me light and as if the very stones in the street the tiles upon the houses did ban themselves against me methought that they all combined together to banish me out of the world i was abhorred of them and unfit to dwell among them because i had sinned against the saviour oh how happy now was every creature over me for they stood fast and kept their station but i was gone and lost gone and lost gone and lost it was while he was thus lamenting his hopeless condition that the light broke this scripture he said did most sweetly visit my soul and him that cometh to me i will in no wise cast out oh what did i now see in that blessed sixth of john oh the comfort that i had from this world in no wise cast out in no wise cast out him that cometh to me i will in no wise cast out what was it that he saw in that blessed sixth of john what was the comfort that he found so lavishly stored there the matter is worth investigating in his pitiful distress there broke upon the soul of john bunyan a vision of the infinite approachability of jesus that is one of the essentials of the faith it was for no other purpose that the saviour of men left the earth and enshrined himself in invisibility suppose says henry drummond suppose he had not gone away suppose he were here now suppose he were still in the holy land at jerusalem every ship that started for the east would be crowded with christian pilgrims every train flying through europe would be thronged with people going to see jesus every mail-bag would be full of letters from those in difficulty and trial suppose you are in one of those ships the port when you arrive after a long voyage is blocked with vessels of every flag with much difficulty you land and join one of the long trains starting for jerusalem far as the eye can see the caravans move over the desert in an endless stream as you approach the holy city you see a dark seething mass stretching for leagues and leagues between you and its glittering spires you have come to see jesus but you will never see him you are crowded out jesus resolved that this should never be it is expedited for you he said that i go away he went away in order to make himself approachable john bunyan saw to his delight that it is possible for the most unworthy to go directly to the fountain of grace him that cometh to me him that cometh to me him that cometh to me i will in no wise cast out john bunyan's text was a revelation to him of the approachability of jesus in his pitiful distress there broke upon the soul of john bunyan a vision of the infinite catholicity of jesus therein lay for him the beauty of the text in the darkest hour of his wretchedness he never had any doubt as to the readiness of the saviour to welcome to his grace certain fortunate persons holy master gifford for example and the poor woman whom he overheard discussing the things of the kingdom of god as they sat in the sun beside their doors and the members of the little church at bedford concerning the salvation of these people bunyan was clear as clear could be 
but from such felicity he was himself rigidly excluded about this time he says the state of happiness of these poor people at bedford was thus in a kind of a vision presented to me i saw as if they were on the sunny side of some high mountain there refreshing themselves with the pleasant beams of the sun while i was shivering and shrinking in the cold afflicted with frost snow and dark clouds methought also betwixt me and them i saw a wall that did compass about this mountain now through this wall my soul did greatly desire to pass concluding that if i could i would there also comfort myself with the heat of their sun but he could find no way through or round or over the wall then came the discovery of the text this scripture did most sweetly visit my soul and him that cometh to me i will in no wise cast out oh the comfort that i had from his word in no wise as who would say by no means for nothing whatever he hath done but satan would greatly labor to pull his promise from me telling me that christ did not mean me and such as me but sinners of another rank that had not done as i had done but i would answer him again satan here is in these words no such exception but him that cometh him any him him that cometh to me i will in no wise cast out him that cometh any him any him him that cometh i will in no wise cast out like the gate that swings open on hearing the magic sesame like the walls that fell at jericho when the blast of the trumpets arose the wall round bunyan's mountain fell with a crash before that great and golden word him that cometh to me i will in no wise cast out the barriers that vanished the way was open him that cometh any him any him him that cometh to me i will in no wise cast out here was a vision of the catholicity of jesus in his pitiful distress that broke upon the soul of john bunyan a vision of the infinite reliability of jesus it was the deep strong accent of certainty that ultimately captivated all his heart times without number he had come with a great perhaps trembling on his lips often he tells us when i had been making to the promise i have seen as if the lord would refuse my soul for ever i was often as if i had run upon the pikes and as if the lord had thrust at me to keep me from him as with a flaming sword then would i think of esther who went to petition the king contrary to the law i thought also of ben hadad's servants who went with ropes under their heads to their enemies for mercy the woman at canaan that would not be daunted though called dog by christ and the man that went to borrow bread at midnight were also great encouragements to me but each was after all only the encouragement of a possibility of a probability of a perhaps 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 in contrast with all this the text spoke out its message bravely him that cometh to me i will in no wise cast out in no wise in no wise in no wise oh the comfort that i had from this word in no wise if ever satan and i did strive for any word of god in all my life it was for this good word of christ he at one end and i at the other oh what work we made it was for this in john i say that we did so tug and strive he pulled and i pulled but god be praised i overcame him i got sweetness from it he passed at a bound from the mist of the valley to the sunlight of the summit he had left the shadow land of perhaps for the luxurious sunshine of a glowing certainty with joy he says i told my wife oh now i know i know i know that was a good night for me i have had but few better christ was a precious christ to my soul that night i could scarce lie in my bed for joy and grace and triumph perhaps 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 in no wise in no wise in no wise i know i know i know thus bunyan found in the radiance that streams from that blessed sixth of john a revelation of the reliability of jesus those who have studied butler's analogy of religion will recall the story that in the introductory pages mr melson tells of the illustrious author when bishop butler lay upon his deathbed 
mr melson says an overwhelming sense of his sinfulness filled him with a terrible concern his chaplain bent over him and tried to comfort him you know sir said the chaplain that jesus is a great saviour yes replied the terror-stricken bishop i know that he died to save but how should i know that he died to save me my lord answered the chaplain it is written that him that cometh to me i will in no wise cast out true exclaimed the dying man i am surprised that though i have read that scripture a thousand times over i never felt its virtue until this moment now i die happy and he did so too pillowing his head upon the selfsame words did bunyan his end says frode was characteristic it was brought on by exposure when he was engaged in the act of charity a quarrel had broken out in a family at reading with which bunyan had some acquaintance a father had taken some offence at his son and threatened to disinherit him bunyan overtook a journey on horseback from bedford to reading in the hope of reconciling them he succeeded but at the cost of his life returning by way of london he was overtaken on the road by a storm of rain and was drenched before he could find shelter the chill falling on his constitution already weakened by illness brought on fever in ten days he was dead his last words were take me for i come to thee i come to thee i come to thee him that cometh to me i will in no wise cast out the words that had lit up the path of his pilgrimage illumined also the valley of the shadow of death the words that opened to him the realms of grace opened also the gates of glory the words that welcomed him at the wicked gate welcomed him also to the celestial city end of chapter six chapter seven of a bunch of everlastings or text that made history by frank w borum this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by tim bower chapter seven sir walter scott's text it was a very happy bridegroom and a very happy bride that came to the suede cottage early in seventeen ninety eight they had been married on christmas eve and after a few days in edinburgh had come on to this pretty little home on the banks of the esk walter scott was twenty-six not one of his books had been written no thought of fame had visited him he dreamed only the happiness that must be his in the new life that he had so recently entered while she tells him that she is sure that he will rise in his profession become a judge and die immensely wealthy scott vows that he will make his riverside home the sweetest spot beneath the stars he takes infinite pains in laying out the gardens and the lawns in the years that followed he never looked upon any of his novels or biographies with greater pride than that with which he surveyed the mystic arch that he built with his own hands over the gate that opened on the edinburgh road in this romantic home he spent some of the sunniest years of his life and as lockhart points out it was amongst these delicious solitudes that he produced the works that laid the imperishable foundations of all his fame as you stroll about this pretty garden and mark the diligence with which this young husband of ours has trained all his flowers and creepers i would have you step out on to the lawn and here in the centre of the lawn is a sundial our happy young bridegroom ordered it before his marriage and it has been made to his design see how carefully he has planted the creepers around it and according to custom he has had a motto engraved upon the dial a model of his own selection it consisted of three greek words the night cometh scott was not morbid he was a great human but in the sunshine of life's morning he solemnly reminded himself that high noon is not a fixture the brightest day wears away to evening at last he horrified his bride-elect by arranging before his marriage for a place of burial what an idea of yours she says in a letter written a few days before the wedding what an idea of yours was that to mention where you wish to have your bones laid if you were married i should think that you were tired of me a very pretty compliment before marriage i hope sincerely that i shall not live to see that day if you always have those cheerful thoughts how very pleasant and gay you must be poor distressed little bride but she soon found that her apprehensions were unfounded 
her lover was not as gloomy as she feared he was reminding himself that the sunshine does not last forever it is true but just because the sunshine does not last forever he was vowing that he would make the most of it the night cometh he wrote upon the sundial on the lawn the night cometh therefore revel in the daylight whilst it lasts i must work the works of him that sent me whilst it is day the night cometh when no man can work the inscription on sir walter scott's sundial must have been suggested by the inscription on dr johnson's watch scott was a great admirer of johnson in some respects there is a strong resemblance between them sir alfred dale vice-chancellor of liverpool university recently referred to them as two of the most heroic and at the same time most pathetic figures in the annals of our literature boswell's life of johnson and lockhart's life of scott are by common consent the two greatest biographies in the language the former was a new book and was still the talk of the town in the day of scott's courtship and marriage and in that noble record of the noble life scott had read boswell's account of the glimpse that he once caught of the old doctor's watch as dr johnson drew it from his pocket one day boswell noticed that on its face it bore a greek inscription the inscription consisted of three greek words the night cometh it reminded the doctor whenever he consulted his watch that the daylight does not last for ever work whilst it is day the watch seemed to say for the night cometh when no man can work it is eighteen thirty one scott is sixty now it is thirty-three years since we saw him walking on the lawn at lasuade cottage with his bride then none of his books were written now they are all complete fame and honor are most richly his his poor bride however had her wish the burial of your bones she wrote in pretty scorn in the midst of her preparations for the wedding i hope sincerely that i shall not live to see that day she did not she has been five years dead the brilliant sunshine of that early day has vanished life is wearing towards its even tide the night cometh sir walter is spending a day with old friends at douglas there is a sadness on his spirit that nothing can dispel and once or twice as he strides across the familiar landscapes his companions cast the glint of tears upon his cheek it has been agreed that there shall be no company but friends of old standing and among these is mr elliot lockhart whom scott has not seen for many years since they last met both men have been very ill in the old days they followed the hounds together and lockhart was as handsome a specimen of a border gentleman as ever cheered a hunting field when they met now says the biographer each saw his own case glassed in the other and neither of their manly hearts could well contain itself as they embraced they part at night scott promising to call on his old friend in the course of his own homeward journey but next morning at breakfast came a messenger to inform us that mr lockhart on returning to his own house fell down in a fit and that his life was despaired of immediately although he had intended to remain two days sir walter drew his host aside and besought him to lend him horses as far as lanark for that he must set off with the least possible delay he would listen to no persuasions mr william he said this is a sad morning i must home to work while it is called day for the night cometh when no man can work i put that text many years ago on my dial stone but it often preached in vain it may have done but anybody who surveys the long row of noble classics with which he has enriched our literature will feel that it must still more often have preached with remarkable effect the night the night cometh sir walter justified his reminding himself amongst the dazzling sunshine of his wedding bliss that the night cometh was old dr johnson wise in confronting himself with that stern truth whenever he consulted his watch why not is the night an ugly thing i recall a very similar incident in the life of thomas carlyle one lovely evening he and lee hunt the poet strolled off together amid scenery that was full of rugged grandeur and exquisite charm presently the stars shone out and added immeasurable to the glory of the night both men gazed upon the heavens for some moments in silence and then the poet to whose soul they had been whispering of peace and happiness and love burst into the rapturous exclamation god is beautiful immediately carlyle seeing only the dread majesty of heaven 
sprang to his feet and exclaimed god is terrible and both were right the night is beautiful as god is beautiful the night is terrible as god is terrible carlyle dreaded the night as scott dreaded it and as johnson dreaded it they all three trembled lest the night should fall before they had finished the work which they had been appointed to do the only happiness that a brave man ever troubles himself much about i find carlyle saying is happiness enough to get his work done not i can't eat but i can't work that is the burden of all wise complaining men it is after all the one unhappiness of a man that he cannot work that he cannot get his destiny as a man fulfilled behold the day is passing swiftly away our life is passing over and the night cometh wherein no man can work and who can forget those sledgehammer sentences with which he concludes his everlasting yea i say to myself produce produce were it but the pitifulest infinitesimal fraction of a product produce it in god's name tis the utmost thou hast in thee out with it then up up whatsoever thy hand findeth to do do it with thy whole might work while it is called to-day for the night cometh wherein no man can work and so twice at least i find the sage chelsea emphasizing the text that made the wizard of the north the night cometh says dr johnson and he has the words inscribed upon the face of his watch the night cometh says sir walter scott and he has the words engraved on the sundial on the lawn at la suede cottage the night cometh says thomas carlyle in the pages of his first book a book that was written amongst the moss hogs of craig and puttock before the world had even heard his name work while it is called to-day for the night cometh wherein no man can work and these three johnson scott and carlyle became three of the most prodigious workers of all history the night cometh it came to dr johnson the night that he had dreaded for so long the infirmities of age says macaulay were creeping fast upon him that inevitable event of which he never thought without horror was brought near to him and his whole life was darkened by the shadow of death it is not pleasant reading let us turn the page and what is this when at length the moment dreaded through so many years came close the dark cloud passed away from johnson's mind his temper became unusually patient and gentle he ceased to think with terror of death and of that which lies beyond death and he spoke much of the mercy of god and of the propitiation of christ his faith triumphed over all his fears he talked with rapture of the love of god he pointed his friends to the cross and he confidently resigned his soul to his saviour the night cometh he had said to himself with a shudder over and over and over again but when it came that night was as tranquil as an infant's slumber and illumined by a million stars the night that follows a great day's work well done is never a very terrible affair the night cometh it came to sir walter scott the night of which the sundial had spoken so effectively and so long we have all dwelt with lingering fondness on that closing scene here he is at abbot's ford surrounded by his grandchildren and his dogs he is too feeble to rise but at his desire they wheel him round the lawns in a bath chair he strokes the hair of the children pats the dogs on the heads and pauses to admire his favorite roses i have seen much in my time he whispers softly but nothing like my ain house give me one turn more exhausted by his ride and by the tumult of emotions that it has awakened the dying man is put to bed next morning he asks to be wheeled into the library they place his chair against the central window that he may look down on the shining waters of the tweed he glances round upon the shelves containing his thousands of beloved books read to me he says to lockhart from what book shall i read need you ask there is but one lockhart takes down the bible and opens it at the fourteenth chapter of the gospel of john let not your heart be troubled ye believe in god believe also in me in my father's house are many mansions if it were not so i would have told you i go to prepare a place for you and so on the matchless cadences that have soothed and softened and sweetened a million deathbeds fall like a foretaste of the eternal harmonies upon the sick man's ear this is a great comfort a great comfort he murmurs he lingers for a while but the atmosphere of that conversation by the library window enfolds him to the last 
the night comes and with the night comes weariness and restfulness and tired hands gently folded there is only one way of preparing for the night we must work that is what jesus said we must work while it is called today the night cometh when no man can work a good day's work means a good night's rest johnson and scott and carlyle had learned that secret but it was from him that they learned it and they became the men that they were because they took his words and engraved them on their watches and on their sundials yes on their watches and on their sundials and on their hearts end of chapter seven chapter eight of a bunch of everlastings or texts that made history by frank w borum this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by tim bower chapter eight oliver cromwell's text oliver cromwell ranks among the giants mr frederick harrison sets his name among the four greatest that our nation has produced carlyle's guffaw upon hearing this pretty piece of patronage would have sounded like a thunderclap four indeed carlyle would say that the other three would look like a trio of travelling dwarfs grouped about a colossus when they found themselves in the company of oliver cromwell carlyle can see nothing in our history nor in any other more impressive than the spectacle of this young farmer leaving his fields in huntingdon donshire putting his plough in the shed and setting out for london to hurl the king from his throne to dismiss the parliament and to reconstitute the country on a new and better basis he was the one strong man so much stronger than all other men that he bent them to his will and dominated the entire situation cromwell made history wholesale how that is the question how and what if in our search for an answer to that pertinent question we discover that it was by means of a text let us go into the matter my suspicions in this direction were first aroused by reading a letter that cromwell wrote to his cousin mrs st john before his public career had begun in this letter he refers to himself as a poor creature i am sure he says that i shall never earn the least might here is strange language for a man who confident in his resistless strength will soon be overthrowing thrones and tossing crowns and kingdoms hither and thither at his pleasure is there nothing else in the letter that may help us to elucidate the mystery there is he goes on to tell his cousin that after all he does not entirely despair of himself just one ray of hope has shone upon him one star has illuminated the blackness of his sky one beam in a dark place he says hath much refreshment in it he does not tell his cousin what that ray of hope is he does not name that solitary star he does not go into particulars as to that one beam in a dark place but we for our part must prosecute our investigations until we have discovered it it is sometimes best to start at the end of a thing and to work backwards to the beginning we will adopt that plan in this instance one who was present at the closing scene has graphically described it for us at hampton court he says being sick nigh unto death and in his bedchamber cromwell called for his bible and desired an honourable and godly person to read unto him that passage in the fourth of philippians which saith i can do all things through christ that strengtheneth me which read he observed this scripture did once save my life when my eldest son poor robert died which went as a dagger to my heart indeed it did this does not tell us much but it sets our feet in the path that may lead to more and at any rate it makes clear to us what that one beam was that so often had much refreshment in it i can do all things through christ that strengtheneth me groping our way back across the years by the aid of the hint given us in those dying words we come upon that dark and tragic day nineteen years earlier when the son of good promise died unfortunately the exact circumstances attending the death of the young man have never been recorded even the date is shrouded in mystery nobody knows in which battle he fell perhaps the father was too full of grief and bitterness to write for us that sad and tragic tale all that we know is what he told us on his deathbed. he says that it went like a dagger to my heart indeed it did and he says that it brought to his aid the text the one beam in a dark place that saved his life 
it was not the first time as we shall see that that animating and arousing word had come like a relieving army entering a beleaguered city to his deliverance but the pathos of that heart-breaking yet heart-healing experience impressed itself indelibly upon his memory the tale was written in tears it rushed back upon him as he lay a-dying and very often in the years that lay between his son's death and his own he feelingly referred to it in july sixteen forty four for example i find him writing a letter of sympathy to colonel valentine walton whose son also had fallen on the field of battle and in his noble yet tender epistle cromwell endeavors to lead the stricken father to the fountains of consolation at which he has slaked his own burning thirst sir he says god hath taken away your eldest son by a cannon shot you know my own trials this way but the lord supported me i remember that my boy had entered into the happiness we all pant for and live for there too is your precious child full of glory never to know sin or sorrow any more he was a gallant young man exceedingly gracious god give you his comfort you may do all things through christ that strengthens us seek that and you shall easily bear your trial the lord be your strength i can do all things through christ that strengtheneth me this scripture he says as he lies on his deathbed, did once save my life seek that he says to colonel walton seek that seek that but we must go back further yet we are tracing the stream but we have not reached the fountainhead that deathbed testimony at hampton court was delivered in sixteen fifty eight it was in sixteen thirty nine or thereabouts that robert his eldest son was lying dead on each of these occasions the text wonderfully supported him but in each case it came to him as an old friend and not as a new acquaintance for it was in sixteen thirty eight the year before robert's death and twenty years before the father's that cromwell wrote to his cousin mrs st john about the one beam in a dark place that hath such exceedingly great refreshment in it when then did that beam break upon his darksome path for the first time carlyle thinks it was in sixteen twenty three cromwell was then in his twenty-fourth year with all his life before him but we may as well let carlyle speak for himself at about this time took place he says what cromwell with unspeakable joy would name his conversion certainly a grand epic for a man properly the one epic the turning point which guides upwards or guides downwards him and his activities for evermore wilt thou join with the dragons wilt thou join with the gods oliver has henceforth a christian man believing in god and not on sundays only but on all days and in all places and in all cases in sixteen twenty three it was then but how piecing the scraps together a mere hint here and a vague suggestion there i gather that it was somewhat in this way in sixteen twenty three all things were rushing pell-mell towards turgid crisis wild tumult and red revolution at home and abroad the outlook was as black as black could be the world wanted a man a good man a great man a strong man to save it everybody saw the need but nobody could see the man down in huntington donshire a young father leans on the handles of his plough the world needs a man a good man a great man a strong man says his reason then he hears another voice thou art the man cries his conscience with terrifying suddenness and his hands tremble as they grasp the plough that evening as he sits beside the fire his young wife opposite him and little robert in the cot by his side he takes down his bible and reads he turns to the epistle to the philippians at the closing chapter he is amazed at the things that by the grace divine paul claims to have learned and achieved it's true paul he exclaimed that you have learned this and attained to this measure of grace but what shall i do ah poor creature it is a hard hard lesson for me to take out i find it so poring over the sacred volume however he makes the discovery of his lifetime i came he says to the thirteenth verse where paul saith i can do all things through christ which strengtheneth me then faith began to work and my heart to find comfort and support and as i said to myself he that was paul's christ is my christ too so i drew water out of the wells of salvation 
and now we have reached the fountain head at last. And so the clodhopper became the king. It was the text that did it. Considered apart from the text, the life of Cromwell is an insoluble mystery, a baffling enigma. But take one good look at the text, observe the place that it occupied in Cromwell's heart and thought, and everything becomes plain that such a man with the eye to see and with the heart to dare should advance from post to post, from victory to victory, till the Huntington Don Farmer became, by whatever name you call him, the acknowledged strongest man in England. Virtually the King of England requires, says Cromwell, no magic to explain it. Of course not. The text explains it. For C. What is a king? In his French Revolution, Carlyle says that the very word king comes from conning caning, the man who can, the man who is able, and that is precisely the burden of the text. I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me, so the authorized version has it. In him who strengtheneth me, I am able for anything, so Dr. Moffat translates the words. For all things I am strong in him who makes me able. Thus Bishop Mool renders it. A king, says Carlyle, is an able man, a strong man, a man who can. Here is a plowman who sees that the world is perishing for want of just such a man. How can he, weak as he, become the world's strongest man, the world's able man, the world's king? The text tells him, I can do all things, he cries, through him that strengthens me. The strong man was made, and the world was saved. A man, at any rate such a man as Cromwell, can never be content to enjoy such an experience as this alone. No man can read the life and letters of the protector without being touched by his solicitude for others. He is forever anxious that his kindred and his friends should drink of those wondrous waters that have so abundantly refreshed and invigorated him. After quoting his text to Colonel Walton, he urges him to seek that same strengthening grace which he himself has received. Seek that, he says, seek that. It is the keynote of all his correspondence. I hope, he writes to the mayor of Hursley in 1650, I hope you give my son good counsel. I believe he needs it. He is in the dangerous time of his age, and it is a very vain world. Oh, how good it is to close with Christ be times. There is nothing else worth looking after. Seek that strength, he says to Colonel Walton. Seek that savior, he says to his wayward son. Seek that which will really satisfy, he says to his daughter. It always seemed to me that the old Puritan's lovely letter to that daughter of his, the letter from which I have just quoted, is the gem of Carlyle's great volume. Bridget was twenty-two at the time. Your sister, her father tells her, is exercised with some perplexing thoughts. She sees her own vanity in carnal mind, and bewailing it, she seeks after what will satisfy. And thus to be a seeker is to be of the best sect next to the finder. And such an one shall every faithful, humble seeker be at the end. Happy seeker, happy finder, dear heart, press on. Let not husband, let not anything cool thy affections after Christ. With which strong, tender, fatherly words from the old soldier to his young daughter, we may very well take our leave of him. End of chapter 8「Chapter Nine of a Bunch of Everlastings, or Texts that Made History by Frank W. Borum. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tim Bauer. Chapter Nine Francis Xavier's Text. It is one of the most stirring dramas of the faith, a drama in three acts. Scene, neath the shadow of the Pyrenees. He is a gay young cavalier. It is the golden age of Spanish story. Ferdinand and Isabella have brought the whole world to their feet. Castile speaks, the peoples tremble, no dog dares bark. Spain is mistress of Mart and of Maine. Columbus has just added a new hemisphere to her wide dominions. The atmosphere of Europe is trilling with music and tingling with sensation. And in the very year in which the discoverer of America died, our cavalier is born. His home, a splendid palace, adorns the pine-clad slopes of the stately Pyrenees. Its turrets seem to point proudly to the snow-clad heights that glitter gloriously above. He was cradled in the lap of luxury. He caught the spirit of the romantic period and flung himself with a will into its revelries and chivalries. 
life becomes a frolic to him he is a champion in every tussle for the trophies of the field he is first in every contest for the laurels of the schools in running and in fencing in singing and in dancing he is without a rival the chalice of life sparkles as he lifts it to his lips his eyes gleam as he quaffs the intoxicating cup in camp in castle and in court none are more admired more applauded more beloved he is the darling of society and so amid the scenes of splendor and gaiety denied nothing that can minister to his vanity or increase his delight thirty-five years whirl themselves merrily away seen by the banks of the seine he is in paris even now in the early part of the sixteenth century it is a centre of gaiety he is in his thirty-sixth year his enthusiasm for pleasure has yielded somewhat to his thirst for knowledge and his love of learning has begotten a laudable desire to teach he is lecturing and among his hearers a strange ungainly figure hovers in the background this student of his is a man of fifty but he looks older still his name is ignatius loyola he is bent and broken and is pitifully lame but the fire of a holy enthusiasm burns in his eye he has marked the brilliant young teacher for his own and is determined to win him he makes friends after each utterance he congratulates the lecturer and adds significantly but what shall it profit a man if he gain the whole world and lose his own soul the whole world his own soul to gain the world to lose his soul what shall it profit a man if he gain the whole world and lose his own soul he lounges with the lecturer in the solitude of the study he accompanies him in his evening walks along the banks of the seine they explore together the dense woodlands which occupy the site of future parisian suburbs but whether in springtide rambles among the lilies and the daffodils or in riverside strolls by sunset or in halls of feasting and music and pleasure or in silent study or in the stately academy the strange student asks and repeats and asks again one incessant question but what shall it profit a man if he gain the whole world and lose his own soul the whole world his own soul to gain the world to lose his soul but what shall it profit a man if he gain the whole world and lose his own soul a hundred times as he painfully hobbles along beside the brilliant young master the deformed pupil reiterates his unanswerable query and at last the master mind capitulates to the pitiless and resistless logic of that immortal question the great professor becomes the lowliest of penitents student and lecturer kneel side by side and in a tempest of tears the young lecturer dedicates all that is left of life to that saviour in whose awful presence his student has ushered him the lecturer has learned more from his listener than he could ever have imparted seen on the shores of siam he is a monk his face is drawn with suffering fast and vigils have left their mark but great as are the tortures of his body the anguish of his mind is greater still having himself heard the story of the cross a new idea haunts and possesses him he is horrified by the fearful reflection that the nations sit in darkness and know not the light which has irradiated him not a moment must be lost thousands are dropping daily into christless graves it is an alarming and terrifying discovery he will set out at once and the people shall hear from his own lips the story of redeeming love there are no trains or coaches he will tramp through the world till his limbs are swollen and his nerves are numb he sets out he visits india and hastens from province to province picks up the languages as he goes along by happy conversation with little children he stands one day amidst the dazzling splendor of an oriental palace on the next he pays court to a rajah and his native staff on the third he moves amongst the filthy huts of the fisher folks of malabar but every day and everywhere he tells with agony and tears his strange and wondrous tale ridiculed stoned and persecuted he presses tirelessly on always uplifting the cross with his right hand and with his left ringing the bell that summons the people to attend having made converts and planted churches he loses not an hour but hurries off in search of fresh fields to add to his divine conquest he labors for twenty-one hours out of every twenty-four in the course of ten short years he learns and preaches in twenty different languages now he begs a passage in a troop ship and anon he sails with idolatrous pirates and blasphemous corsairs 
He tumbles about the oceans in vessels that would not now be permitted to navigate a river, and at sea, as on land, the passion of his sacred purpose consumes him still. He haunts the forecastle, pleading one by one with every soldier and sailor on the troop ship. He proclaims to robbers and to slaves the growing words of life eternal. Across burning deserts and over snowy ranges he treads his fearless way. The fierce blaze of equatorial suns and the piercing cold of slippery mountain glaciers alike fail to baffle or deter him. He throws himself into scenes of battle and of carnage that he may strive for the souls of the wounded and the dying. Whilst the very earth rocks beneath his feet, he stands on the shuddering slopes of blazing volcanoes that, amidst scenes of exquisite and majestic horror, he may urge the panic-stricken natives to flee from the wrath to come. He visits leper settlements, with all the tenderness of a woman, nurses hideous human wrecks, the very sight of whom would sicken a less intrepid spirit. He boards ships whose crews are perishing of loathsome pestilence, and, unafraid of contracting their disgusting maladies, he ministers to the diseased and kneels beside the prostrate forms of the dying. He comes like a ghost upon wild, untutored inland tribes. He bursts into the island territories of fierce and untamed cannibals. He invades the secret lair of the bandit and penetrates to the lonely tent of the Bedouin. He passes spectrally from shore to shore. He startles armies on the march and arrests the progress of the journeying caravan. His limbs are often paralyzed with fatigue. He tramps across continent until from sheer exhaustion he drops upon the hard and inhospitable soil. And then, having rested for an hour, he rises and staggers on again. He dares death in every form. He shakes hands with every ailment and disease. He endures all the pangs of hunger and all the horrors of thirst. He suffers desolating shipwreck and bitter persecution. He can rejoice in any privation if he may but uplift the cross on every shore and preach the gospel to every creature. And it is always observed that on whatever coast he lands and in whatever language he preaches, whether he addresses the Nabobs of Mysore or the Makata of Japan, whether he speaks on the deck of a pirate or in a hovel of slaves, he echoes endlessly one everlasting question. But what shall it profit a man if he gain the whole world and lose his own soul? The whole world, his own soul. To gain the world, to lose his soul. What shall it profit a man if he gain the whole world and lose his own soul? At last, absolutely worn out after ten short strenuous years, at the age of forty-five, he lays his wasted, worn, emaciated frame on the sea beach of Siam and unnursed and unattended resigns his soul to god he dies as he lived with a smile upon his face his winsomeness was as wonderful as his daring little children simply reveled in his company his life is the most stinging rebuke that history has ever administered to apathy his record is a stimulus to every church and a challenge to every age it must quicken the blood and fire the fervor of good men till his great master come it will accelerate the triumphant progress of all noble enterprises till time shall be no more. And the rest of the acts of Francis Saviour, and all that he did, and the things that he suffered, and the peoples that he reached, and the churches that he planted, are they not written in the book of the Chronicles of Christendom? End of chapter 9「Chapter Ten of a Bunch of Everlastings, or Texts that Made History by Frank W. Borum. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tim Bauer. Chapter Ten J. B. Goff's Text. He is an old man of twenty five. Nobody seeing him to night would suspect that he had seen so few winters, and nobody would suspect that forty four summers filled with sunshine and song lie between him and his grave. Here he sits at a bare table in an empty, cheerless room. He shivers, for he is hungry, and he is insufficiently clad. His thin arms are folded on the table, and his haggard face rests upon them. He feels that he has come to the fag end of everything. He has just completed seven dark and dreadful years. During those years, as he himself tells us with a shudder, in the brighter after days, during those years I wandered over God's beautiful earth like an unblessed spirit. It was like being driven by whips across the burning desert. I was forever digging deep wells to quench my maddening thirst, and forever bringing up nothing but hot, dry sand. Seven years of darkness, seven years of slavery, seven years of dissipation, seven years of sin. But let us not be too swift to pity. Pity, like charity, must be intelligent. 
it is too sacred a thing to be wasted or squandered. It does not follow because this man is ragged and wretched that he is therefore poor. He is rich. It is only in such extremities of distress that men discover their buried wealth. Tonight, sitting in despair, within this squalid room, he suddenly finds himself possessed with incalculable treasures. Memory yields up her golden hoard. There rush back upon him the tender, hollowed, clustering associations of his early days, the village church, the Sunday school, and best of all, the dear old English home. As he sits here in this squalid room, his outer self is on one side of the Atlantic, whilst his innermost soul is on the other. His gaunt frame, disfigured by the life that he has lived, is in Massachusetts. But his heart, flying on the wings of fancy, is back among the sweet and fragrant fields of his Kentish home. In the center and soul of all those radiant recollections, he sees the sad and wistful face of his mother. His face is still buried in his ragged sleeves, so the tears do not show, but they are there. Oh, that mother of mine, Goff used to say, she was one of Christ's abilities, and she possessed a patent signed and sealed with his redeeming blood. She was poor in purse, but rich in piety, a brave, godly woman. She died a pauper and was buried without a shroud and without a prayer, but she left her children a legacy that has made her wealthier than peers and princesses. I remember one night towards the close of her life, sitting with her in the garret, we had no candle. She said to me, John, I am growing blind, but I don't feel it much, but you are young, and it is hard for you to have a poor, blind mother. But never mind, John, there is no night in heaven and no need of a candle there. The Lamb is the light thereof. Oh, that mother of mine, she is neither poor nor blind now. She has left that dark and gloomy garret to bask in the sunshine of her Savior's smiles. And it was his mother, or at least the fond, clear memory of his mother, that came to his relief in the hour of his most dire extremity. That is the way that mothers have. But let him tell the story in his own way. All at once, he says, it seemed as if the very light that she left as she passed had spanned the dark chasm of those seven dreadful years, struck the heart, and opened it. The passage of scripture that she had taught me, and that she had buried in my memory, came to me as if they were being whispered in my ear by the loving lips of my mother herself. He is able to save to the uttermost them that come unto God by him. It is the very thing I needed. I wanted to be saved. I cannot save myself. He is able to save to the uttermost, and he is the Savior for me. I said that poor as he seemed, his youth of twenty-five owned buried treasure. That text, he says, was buried in my memory. He is able to save to the uttermost them that come unto God by him. See, he rises at last, draws his sleeve across his eyes, pulls himself together, and, clutching at that text as a drowning man clutches at his rescuer's hand, he walks out of that cheerless room in the power of an endless life. This, then, is J. B. Goff's text. Not that he held any proprietary rights in it. John Bunyan would dispute any such pretensions. At another time, says Bunyan, I was much under this question, whether the blood of Christ was sufficient to save my soul, in which doubt I continued from morning till seven or eight at night, and at last, when I was, as it were, quite worn out with fear, lest it should not lay hold on me, these words did sound suddenly within my heart. He is able. But me thought, this word able, he spoke loud unto me. It showed a great word. It seemed to be writ with great letters, and gave such a jostle to my fear and doubt as I never had before or after for he is able to save to the uttermost them that come unto God by him. Is there salvation for me, even for me? asked J. B. Goff in his despair. Is the blood of Christ sufficient to save my soul, even mine? asked John Bunyan in that anxious hour. And to both of them there came the same reply. He is able to save to the uttermost. It is a great word, says Goff. It seems to be writ in great letters, says Bunyan and by that gallant and assuring word they were both greatly delivered. In the fairy story that beguiled our infancy, the three giants confronted the hero just as he was setting out on his romantic quest. J. B. Goff had precisely the same experience. On the very threshold of the new life, three tyrannical figures arose and endeavored to drive him back to slavery. Their names? The name of the first was yesterday, the name of the second was today, and the name of the third was tomorrow. 
giant yesterday pointed out with terrific emphasis that the past is absolutely indelible what's done can never be undone there are some things that even god cannot do and this is one of them wounds of the soul though healed will ache the redeeming scars remain and make confession lost innocence returns no more we are not what we were before transgression to the end of his days goff was haunted by the grim ghost of these seven terrible and remorseless years i have suffered he cried and come out of the fire scorched and scathed by the marks upon my person with the memory of it burnt right into my soul he likened his life to a snowdrift that had been sadly stained no power on earth can restore its former purity or whiteness the scars remain the scars remain he used to say with bitter self-reproach giant yesterday pointed to the dark black past derisively held it as a threat over the poor penitent's bowed and contrite head and told him in tones that sounded like thunderclaps that there was no escape giant today points to things as they are look at yourself the tyrant exclaims facts are facts your present condition is a fact how can you evade it goff throws himself back in a chair and gives rein to his fancy a vision or rather a series of visions come to him before him stands a bright fair-haired blue-eyed beautiful boy with rosy cheeks pearly teeth and ruby lips the perfect picture of innocence and peace health purity and joy who are you goff asks i am your past i am what you were another figure appears the youth has become a man he looks born to command intellect flashes from the eye the noble brow speaks of genius trained and consecrated it is a glorious spectacle who are you goff asks again i am your ideal i am what you might have been then there creeps slowly into the bare room a wretched thing unkept and loathsome it is manacled hard and fast the face is furrowed and filthy the lip is swollen and repulsive the brow is branded as the throne of sensuality the eyes glare wildly and are bleared and dim who are you goff again demands i am your present i am what you are by this expressive shadow show giant today sought to frighten a trembling spirit from its rich inheritance and as for giant tomorrow his case is ready-made it is easy enough to be religious today he says but what of tomorrow and the next day and all the days that are coming if one temptation fails to overthrow you another will surely bring you down and goff who knows the cruel strength of each temptation feels the force of what these monsters say the three giants withdraw leaving goff in the depths of despair how can i venture upon the christian life he has only to review his own indelible past he has only to contemplate his humiliating present he has only to conjure up the sinister probabilities of the unpromising future in order to recognize the sheer audacity of such a step can he reasonably hope to keep his vow through all the years ahead many a race is lost in the last lap many a ship is wrecked on the reefs outside its final port many a battle is lost on the last charge what hope has he of completing the course upon which he proposes to venture he feels that it is hopelessly beyond him and it is at that critical juncture that the text comes bravely to his rescue i am not able moans the distracted penitent he is able replies the text i should falter before i had finished says goff he is able to save to the uttermost answers the text to the uttermost to the very last inch of the very last yard of the very last mile to the uttermost to the very last minute of the very last hour of the very last day he is able to save to the uttermost them that come unto god by him seeing he liveth and maketh intercession for them and thus the three giants are discomfited and put to confusion and goff enters into a peace that only becomes deeper and fuller and richer and sweeter as the long and busy years go by every man carries in his soul a note of exclamation and a note of interrogation but we do not place them similarly the leper in the gospels put the note of explanation against the ability of christ to cleanse him and the note of interrogation against his willingness to save if thou wilt thou canst make me whole thou canst if thou wilt most of us find the prevailing wind blowing from the opposite quarter we give the saviour credit for a certain amiable willingness to help us but knowing as we do all that the three giants have to say we doubt his ability to deliver we put the notes of exclamation and of interrogation the other way thou wilt if thou canst 
but as j b goff discovered on that never to be forgotten day the christian message is a revelation of the limitless ability to deliver it is never a try it is always a triumph we have witnessed this desperate struggle in the squalid room at massachusetts the struggle of an enslaved soul after freedom let us go back a hundred years exactly a century before this scene was enacted in an american attic a dramatic episode marked the historic ministry of philip doddridge at northampton an irishman named connell was convicted of a capital offence and sentenced to be publicly hanged mr doddridge at great trouble and expense instituted a most rigorous scrutiny and proved beyond the possibility of a doubt that connell was a hundred and twenty miles away when the crime was committed the course of judgment could not however be deflected connell was asked if he had any request to make before setting out for the gallows he answered that he desired the procession to pause in front of the house of mr philip doddridge that he might kneel on the minister's doorstep and pray for the man who had tried to save him mr doddridge he cried when the procession halted every hair of my head thanks you every throb of my heart thanks you every drop of my blood thanks you for you did your best to save me mr doddridge was willing to save mr doddridge did his best to save mr doddridge was not able to save but he is able to save to the uttermost them that come unto god by him that is the glory of the gospel that won the heart of goff that day and held him a glad captive through all the fruitful years that followed mr chesterson says that god paints in many colors but he never paints so gloriously as when he paints in white the crimson of the sunset the azure of the ocean the green of the valleys the scarlet of the poppies the silver of the dewdrops the gold of the gores these are all exquisite so perfectly beautiful indeed that we cannot imagine an attractive heaven without them god paints in colors but in the soul of j b goff he paints in white and we feel that here the divine art is at its very best forty-four crowded and productive years have passed since that grim struggle in the squalid room goff is again in america addressing a vast audience of young men at philadelphia young men he cries perhaps with a bitter memory of those seven indelible years young men keep your record clean he pauses it is a longer pause than usual and the audience wonders but he regains his voice young men he repeats more feeble this time keep your record clean another pause longer than before but again he finds the power of speech young men he cries a third time but in a thin wavering voice young men keep your record clean he falls heavily on the platform devout men carry him to his burial and make lamentation over him his race is finished his voyage completed his battle won the promise has been literally and triumphantly fulfilled the grace that saved him has kept him to the very last inch of the very last yard of the very last mile to the very last minute of the very last hour of the very last day for he is able to save to the uttermost them that come unto god by him End of chapter ten Chapter 11 of A Bunch of Everlastings, or Texts That Made History, by Frank W. Borum. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tim Bauer. Chapter 11. John Knox Text. Some men are not born to die. It is their prerogative to live. They come on purpose. A thousand deaths will not lay them in the grave. No disease from within, no danger from without, can by any means destroy them they bear upon the face the stamp of the immortal in more sense than one they come into the world for good among such deathless men john knox stands out conspicuously when in edinburgh it is impossible to believe that john knox lived four hundred years ago he is so very much alive to-day that it seems incredible that he has lived even then the people will show you his grave in the middle of the road and the meagre epitaph on the flat tombstone will do its feeble best to convince you that his voice has been silent for centuries but you will skeptically shake your head and move away for as you walk about the noble and romantic city john knox is everywhere he is the most ubiquitous man you meet you come upon him at every street here is the house in which he dwelt there is the church in which he preached 
At every turn you come upon places that are haunted by him still. The very stones vibrate with the strident accents of his voice. The walls echo his footsteps. I was introduced to quite a number of people in Edinburgh, but I blush to confess that I have forgotten them all, all but John Knox. It really seems to me, looking back upon that visit, that I met John Knox somewhere or other every five minutes. I could hear the ring of his voice, I could see the flash of his eyes, I could feel the impress of his huge commanding personality. The tomb in the middle of the road notwithstanding, John Knox is indisputably the most virile force in Scotland at this hour. I dare to say that, like me, he sometimes catches sight of that tomb in the middle of the road. If so, he laughs as he could laugh, and strides defiantly on. For John Knox was born in 1505, and behold, he liveth and abideth forever. John Knox, I say, was born in 1505. In 1505, therefore, Scotland was born again. For the birth of such a man is the regeneration of a nation. Life in Knox was not only immortal, it was contagious. Because of Knox, Carlyle affirms, the people began to live. In the history of Scotland, says Carlyle, himself a Scotsman, in the history of Scotland I can find but one epic. It contains nothing of world interest at all but this reformation by Knox. But surely, surely the sage is nodding. Has Carlyle forgotten Sir Walter Scott and Robert Burns and all Scotland's noble contributions to literature, to industry, to religion, and to life? But Carlyle will not retract or modify a single word. This that Knox did for his nation, he goes on, was the resurrection as from death. The people began to live. Scotch literature and thought, Scotch industry, James Watt, David Hume, Walter Scott, Robert Burns, I find John Knox acting in the heart's core of every one of these persons and phenomena. I find that without him they would not have been. So much have I said in order to show that beyond a shadow of a doubt, if a text made John Knox, then that text made history. Go, said the old reformer to his wife as he lay a-dying, and the words were his last. Go, read where I cast my first anchor she needed no more explicit instructions for he had told her the story again and again it is richard bannatyne's knox serving man who has placed the scene on record on november twenty fourth fifteen seventy two he says john knox departed this life to his eternal rest early in the afternoon he said now for the last time i commend my spirit soul and body pointing upon his three fingers into thine hands o lord thereafter about five o'clock he said to his wife go read where i cast my first anchor she did not need to be told and so she read the seventeenth of john's evangel let us listen as she reads it thou hast given him authority over all flesh that he may give eternal life to as many as thou hast given him and this is life eternal that they might know thee the only true god and jesus christ whom thou hast sent here was a strange and striking contrast eternal life life eternal says the book now listen to the labored breathing from the bed the bed speaks of death the book speaks of life eternal life the dying man starts as the great cadences fall upon his ear this is life eternal that they might know thee life eternal it was there he declares with his last breath it was there that i cast my first anchor how was that first anchor cast i have tried to piece the records together paul never forgot the day on which he saw stephen stoned john knox never forgot the day on which he saw george wishart burned wishart was a man of such grace so knox himself tells us as before him was never heard within this realm he was regarded with an awe that was next door to superstition and with an affection that was almost adoration are we not told that in the days when the plague lay over scotland the people of dundee saw it approaching from the west in the form of a great black cloud they fell upon their knees and prayed crying to the cloud to pass them by but even while they prayed it came nearer then they looked around for the most holy man among them to intervene with god on their behalf all eyes turned to george wishart and he stood up stretching his arms to the cloud and prayed and it rolled back out on the borders of the town however the pestilence was raging and wishart hastening thither took upon his station on the town wall preaching to the plague-stricken on one side of him and to the healthy on the other 
and exhibiting such courage and intrepidity in grappling with the awful scourge that he became the idol of the grateful people. In 1546, however, he was convicted of heresy and burned at the foot of the castle wind, opposite the castle gate. When he came near the fire, Knox tells us, he sat down upon his knees and repeated aloud some of the most touching petitions from the Psalms. As a sign of forgiveness, he kissed the executioner on the cheek, saying, Lo, here is a token that I forgive thee. My heart do thine office. The faggots were kindled, and the leaping flames bore the soul of Wishart triumphantly skyward. And there, a few yards off, stands Knox. Have a good look at him. He is a man rather under middle height, with broad shoulders, swarthy face, black hair, and a beard of the same color a span and a half long. He has heavy eyebrows, eyes deeply sunk, cheekbones prominent, and cheeks ruddy. The mouth is large, the lips full, especially the upper one. The whole aspect of the man is not unpleasing, and in moments of emotion it is invested with the air of dignity and majesty. Knox could never shake from his sensitive mind the tragic yet triumphant scene near the castle gate, and when, many years afterwards, he himself turned aside to die, he repeated with closed eyes the prayers that he had heard George Wishart offer under the shadow of the stake. Was it then, I wonder, that John Knox turned sadly homeward and read to himself the great high priestly prayer in the seventeenth of John's Evangel? Was it on that memorable night that he caught a glimpse of the place which all the redeemed hold in the heart of the Redeemer? Was it upon that melancholy evening that there broke upon him the revelation of a love that enfolded not only his martyred friend and himself, but the faithful of every time and of every clime? Was it then that he opened his heart to the magic and the music of those triumphant words? Thou hast given him authority over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as thou hast given him. And this is life eternal, that they should know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. Was it then? I cannot say for certain. I only know that we never meet Knox in Scottish story until after the martyrdom of Wishart. And I know that by the events of that sad and tragic day, all his soul was stirred within him. But, although I do not know for certain that the anchor was first cast then, I know that it was cast there. Go, he says, with the huskiness of death upon his speech. Read where I first cast my first anchor. And his wife straightway read to him the stately sentences I have rewritten. Life eternal, this is life eternal. This is life eternal, that they might know thee. It was there, there, there that I cast my first anchor. Fierce as were the storms that beat upon Knox during the great historic years that followed, that anchor bravely held. To say nothing of his experiences at court and the powerful efforts to coach or to cow him into submission. Think of those twelve years of exile, eighteen months of which were spent on the French galleys. We catch two furtive glimpses of him. The galley in which he is chained makes a cruise round the Scottish coast. It passes so near the fields of Fife that Knox can distinctly see the spires of St. Andrews. At the moment, Knox was so ill that his life was despaired of, and the taunting vision might well have broken his spirit altogether. But the anchor held. The anchor held. Ah! exclaimed Knox, raising himself on his elbow. I see the steeple of that place where God first in public opened my eyes to his glory, and I am fully persuaded. How weak soever I now appear, that I shall not depart this life till my tongue shall glorify his godly name in the same place. Again, as Carlyle tells, a priest one day presented to the galley slaves an image of the Virgin Mother, requiring that they, blasphemous heretics, should do it reverence. Mother, mother of God, said Knox when the turn came to him. This is no mother of God. This is a piece of painted wood. She is better for swimming, I think, than for being worshipped. And he flung the thing into the river. Knox had cast his anchor in the seventeenth of John's Evangel. This is life eternal, that they might know thee. And since he had himself found life eternal in the personal friendship of a personal Redeemer, it was intolerable to him that others should gaze with superstitious eyes on a bit of painted wood. The thing fell into the river with a splash. It was a rude jest, but an expressive one. 
all the reformation was summed up in it eternal life was not to be found in such things this is life eternal that they might know thee that says knox is where i cast my first anchor and through all the storms and stress of these baffling and eventful years that anchor held nor was there any parting of the cable or dragging of the anchor at the last richard bannatyne sitting beside his honoured master's deathbed heard a long long sigh a singular fancy overtook him now sir he said the time to end your battle has come remember those comfortable promises of our saviour jesus christ which you have so often shown to us and it may be that when your eyes are blind and your ears deaf to every other sight and sound you will still be able to recognize my voice i shall bend over you and ask if you have still the hope of glory will you promise that if you are able to give me some signal you will do so the sick man promised and soon after this is what happened grim in his deep death anguish the stern old captain lay and the locks upon his pillow were floating thin and gray and visionless and voiceless with quick and laboring breath he waited for his exit through life's dark hurdle death hast thou the hope of glory he bowed to catch the thrill that through some languid token might be responsive still nor watched they longed nor waited for some obscure reply he raised a clay-cold finger and pointed to the sky so the death angel found him what time his bow he bent to give the struggling spirit a sweet enfranchisement so the death angel left him what time earth's bonds were riven the cold stark stiffening finger still pointed up to heaven he had a sore fight of the existence says carlyle wrestling with popes and principalities in defeat contention lifelong struggle rowing as a galley slave wandering as an exile a sore fight but he won it have you hope they asked him in his last moment when he could no longer speak he lifted his finger pointed upwards and so died honour to him his works have not died the letter of his work dies as of all men's but the spirit of it never did i not say in my opening sentences that john knox was among the immortal humans when he entered the world he came into it for good this is life eternal that they might know thee that says john knox with his dying breath that is where i cast my first anchor it is a sure anchorage o heart of mine cast thine anchor there cast thine anchor to the oaths and covenants of the most high cast thine anchor to his infallible immutable unbreakable word cast thine anchor in the infinite love of god cast thine anchor in the redeeming grace of christ cast thine anchor in the everlasting gospel cast thine anchor in the individual concern of the individual saviour for the individual soul cast thine anchor there and come what may that anchor will always hold end of chapter eleven chapter twelve of a bunch of everlastings or text that made history by frank w borum this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by tim bower chapter twelve william cooper's text have a good look at him this shy shuddering frail little fellow of six for rough hands are waiting to hustle him on to a coach and to pack him off to a distant boarding school he is a quivering little bundle of nerves slight of figure with pale pinched face and eyes swollen with chronic inflammation he starts at every sound in the daytime and throws the bedclothes over his head at night that he may not be scared to death by the ghostly shadows that flit across the wall his mother his sole source of comfort has just died that is why he is being sent away from home the memory of her was ever afterwards the one star that illumined his dark sky late in his life a picture of her was presented to him and his ecstasy knew no bounds the world he wrote to the giver could not have furnished you with a present so acceptable to me as the picture which you have so kindly sent me i received it the night before last and received it with a trepidation of nerves and spirit somewhat akin to what i should have felt had its dear original presented herself to my embrace i kissed it and hung it where it is the last object which i see at night and the first on which i open my eyes in the morning her memory is to me dear beyond expression 
and then, turning to the picture itself, he breaks into poetry. Oh, that those lips had language! Life has passed with me but roughly since I heard thee last. Those lips are thine, thine own sweet smile I see, the same that oft in childhood solaced me. My mother, when I heard that thou wast dead, say, wast thou conscious of the tears I shed? Perhaps thou gavest me, though unfelt, a kiss, perhaps a tear, if souls can weep in bliss. I heard the bell tolled on thy burial day, I saw the hearse that bore thee slowly away. Thy maidens grieved themselves at my concern, oft gave me promise of thy quick return. Thus many a sad to-morrow came and went, till all my stock of infant sorrow spent. I learned at last submission to my lot, but though I less deplore thee, ne'er forgot. So his mother dies and leaves him a queer, unwelcomed heritage to his father, and his father, utterly bewildered by the boy's odd fancies and erratic ways, has resolved to get out of the difficulty by banishing him to a boarding school. At the boarding school he is badgered and bullied and beaten without respite and without mercy, and to the last day of his life he never thinks of the horror place without a shudder. Have a good look at him, I say, before they bundle him into the cavernous interior of the old coach. For in spite of everything, this little parcel of timid, quivering sensibility is going to make history. It frequently happens that, when a man drops into his grave, his fame gradually subsides until his memory entirely perishes. With Cooper, a diametrically opposite principle has been at work. More than a century has elapsed since he quitted the scene of his labors and during that period the lustre of his fame has steadily grown time was when it was the fashion to pooh-pooh the claims of cooper did he not it was asked contemptuously did he not on several occasions attempt suicide and spend much of his time in a madhouse this of course is indisputable but it is also true that almost any young fellow of nervous temperament and frail constitution would lose his reason and seek some violent means of escape from the horrors of life if his malady were treated as it was customary to treat such cases a century and a half ago the marvel is that from so frail a personality so pitilessly treated we have inherited poetry that will be cherished as long as the language lasts it is the glory of cooper that he stands among our pioneers england had wrapped herself in a gloomy and sullen silence literary genius seemed dead then all at once the country became like a grove at sunrise and the first note heard was the note of william cooper dr arnold in talking to his boys at rugby used to call him the singer of the dawn Goldwyn Smith declares that he is the most important poet between the time of Pope and the time of Wordsworth. In one of his best essays, Macaulay says that Byron contributed more than any other writer, even more than Sir Walter Scott, to the literary brilliance of that period, and he is careful to emphasize the fact that it was Cooper that called that fruitful era into being. Cooper, he says, was the forerunner of the great restoration of our literature and a little further on he declares that during the twenty years which followed the death of cooper the revolution of english poetry was fully consummated so there he stands holding and holding for all time a place peculiarly his own in our british life and letters he is an attractive if somewhat depressing figure a feeble sensitive and high-strung physique a mental wreck a would-be suicide a passionate lover of all forms of animal life the author of some of our quaintest humor and some of our most sacred hymns. His life was, as Byron expressively said, a singular pendulum, swinging ever between a smile and a tear. Few poets are more human, more simple, more unaffected, more restful than he. Few are more easy to read. His John Gilpin, his Alexander Silkirk, his Boadicea, and My Mother's Picture were among the first poems we learned in our school books some of his verses will be among the last we shall care to remember perhaps his most forceful and pathetic epitaph was written by mrs browning in words as true as they are sorrowful o poets from a maniac's tongue was poured the deathless singing o christians at your cross of hope a hopeless hand was clinging o men this man in brotherhood your weary paths beguiling groaned inly while he taught you peace and died while you were smiling but it is time that we ask ourselves a question what was it that so distracted this sensitive brain 
What was it that almost broke his gentle and clinging spirit? What was it that again and again drove Cooper to attempt his own destruction? There is only one answer. It was his sin. My sin, my sin, he cries from morning till night, and very often from night until morning. Oh, for some fountain open for sin and uncleanness. But he can find no such fountain anywhere. He is like the old lama in Kipling's Kim, who continually searched for the river, the river of the arrow, the river that can cleanse from sin. But, like the lama, he can nowhere find those purifying waters. And because his frenzied quest is so fruitless and so hopeless, he seeks relief in a premature death. But every rash attempt fails, and failing adds to his consternation. For he feels that, in attempting suicide, he committed the unpardonable sin, and his plight is a thousand times worse than it was before. He has been told of the fountain, but he can never find it. He has been told of the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world, but he knows not how to approach him. He longs for a light to shine upon the road that leads us to the Lamb, but the darkness only grows more dense. Then, when the blackness of night seemed impenetrable, day suddenly breaks. Cooper is a patient at Dr. Cotton's private lunatic asylum. In those days, such asylums usually broke the bruised reed and quenched the smoking flax. But, happily for Cooper and the world, Dr. Cotton's is the exception. Dr. Cotton is himself a kindly, gracious, and devout old man, and he treats his poor patient with sympathy and understanding. And, under this treatment, the change comes. Cooper rises one morning feeling better. He grows cheerfully over his breakfast, takes up the Bible, which in his fit of madness he always threw aside, and opening it at random, lights upon a passage that breaks upon him like a burst of glorious sunshine. Let him tell the story. The happy period which was to shake off my fetters and afford me a clear opening of the free mercy of God in Christ Jesus was now arrived. I flung myself into a chair near the window, and, seeing a Bible there, ventured once more to apply it for comfort and instruction. The first verses I saw were in the third of Romans, being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God hath set forth to be a propitiation through faith in His blood, to manifest His righteousness. Immediately I received strength to believe, and the full beams of the Son of Righteousness shone upon me. I saw the sufficiency of the atonement he had made, my pardon in his blood, and the fullness and completeness of his justification. In a moment I believed and received the gospel. Side by side with this illuminating experience of Cooper's, let me set a striking similar experience which befell John Bunyan exactly a hundred years before. To the soul of Bunyan the self-same text brought the self-same deliverance. Now, he says, my soul was clogged with guilt and was greatly pinched between those two considerations. Live, I must not. Die, I dare not. Now I sunk and fell in my spirit, and giving up all for lost, but as I was walking up and down in the house, as a man, in a most woeful state, that word of God took hold of my heart. Ye are justified freely by his grace, through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God has set forth as a propitiation through faith in his blood to manifest his righteousness. Oh, what a turn it made upon me! I was as one awakened out of some troublesome dream. What a turn it made upon me, says John Bunyan in 1656. What a turn it made upon me, says William Cooper in 1756. For the argument of that great text is irresistible. If the love of God be so great as to provide such a Savior, how could he be eager for the condemnation of the guiltiest? For the grace of God be so freely outpoured in justifying energy, how could any man be beyond the pale of hope? And if God is so anxious for the salvation of men that he has set forth, underlined, emphasized, explained, made perfectly prominent his propitiation, why should even the most timorous of mortals draw back in terror? For Cooper, from that moment, the whole world was changed. Huntington Dawn, says one of his biographers, seemed a paradise. The heart of its new inhabitant was full of unspeakable happiness that comes with calm after the storm, with health after the most terrible of maladies, with repose after the burning fever of the brain. When first he went to church, he was in spiritual ecstasy. It was with difficulty that he restrained his emotions. 
though his voice was silent being stopped by the intensity of his feelings his heart within him sang for joy and when the gospel for the day was read the sound of it was more than he could bear this brightness of his mind communicated itself for all the objects around him to the sluggish water of the ooze to dull finney huntington and its commonplace inhabitants what a turn it made upon me says bunyan in sixteen fifty six what a turn it made upon me says cooper in seventeen fifty six and again he breaks into poetry i was a stricken deer that left the herd long since with many a arrow deeply infixed my panting side was charged when i withdrew to seek a tranquil death in distant shades there was i found by one who had himself been hurt by the archers in his side he bore and in his hands and feet the cruel scars with gentle force soliciting the darts he drew them forth and healed and bade me live the long-sought fountain is found the light has shone upon the road that leads him to the lamb end of chapter twelve chapter thirteen of a bunch of everlastings or texts that made history by frank w borum this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by tim bower chapter thirteen david livingstone's text it is the word of a gentleman of the most strict and sacred honor and so there's an end of it says livingstone to himself as he places his finger for the thousandth time on the text on which he stakes his life he is surrounded by hostile and infuriated savages during the sixteen years he has spent in africa he has never before seemed in such imminent peril death stares him in the face he thinks sadly of his life work scarcely begun for the first time in his experience he is tempted to steal away under the cover of darkness and to seek safety in flight he prays leave me not forsake me not he cries but let me quote from his own journal it will give us the rest of the story january fourteenth eighteen fifty six evening felt much turmoil of spirit in prospect of having all my plans for the welfare of this great region and this teeming population knocked on the head by savages to-morrow but i read that jesus said all power is given unto me in heaven and in earth go ye therefore and teach all nations and lo i am with you alway even unto the end of the world it is the word of a gentleman of the most strict and sacred honor and so there's an end of it i will not cross furtively to-night as i intended should such a man as i flee nay verily i shall take observations for latitude and longitude to-night though they may be the last i feel quite calm now thank god the words lo i am with you always even unto the end of the world are underlined in the journal and they were underlined in his heart later in the same year he pays his first visit to the homeland honors are everywhere heaped upon him the university of glasgow confers upon him the degree of doctor of laws on such occasions the recipient of the honor is usually subjected to some banter at the hands of the students but when livingstone rises bearing upon his person the marks of his struggle and sufferings in darkest africa he is received with reverential silence he is gaunt and haggard as the result of his long exposure to the tropical sun on nearly thirty occasions he has been laid low by the fevers that steam from the inland swamps and these severe illnesses have left their mark his left arm crushed by the lion hangs helplessly at his side a hush falls upon the great assembly as he announces his resolve to return to the land for which he has already endured so much but i return he says without misgiving and with great gladness for would you like me to tell you what supported me through all the years of exile among people whose language i could not understand and whose attitude towards me was always uncertain and often hostile it was this lo i am with you alway even unto the end of the world on those words i staked everything and they never failed leave me not forsake me not he prays lo i am with you alway even unto the end of the world comes the response it is the word of a gentleman of the most strict and sacred honor and so there's an end of it he tells himself on that pledge he hazards his all and it did not fail him when i wonder did david livingstone first make that text his own i do not know it must have been very early 
He used to say that he never had any difficulty in carrying with him his father's portrait, because, in the Cotter's Saturday night, Robert Burns had painted it for him. Down to the last morning that he spent in his old home at Blantyre, the household joined in family worship. It was still dark when they knelt down that bleak November morning. They are up at five. The mother makes the coffee. The father prepares to walk his boy to Glasgow, and David himself leads the household to the throne of grace. The thought embedded in his text is uppermost in his mind. He is leaving those who are dearer to him than life itself, yet there is one on whose presence he can still rely. Lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. And so, in selecting the passage to read by lamplight in the little kitchen on this memorable morning, David selects the psalm that more clearly than any other promises him, on every sea and on every shore, the presence of his Lord. The Lord is thy keeper, the sun shall not spite thee by day, nor the moon by night. The Lord shall preserve thee from all evil, he shall preserve thy soul. The Lord shall preserve thy going out and thy coming in from this time forth, and even for evermore. After prayers come the anguish of farewell. But the ordeal is softened for them all by the thought that has been suggested by David's reading and by David's prayer. In the gray light of that wintry morning, father and son sat out on their long and cheerless tramp. I remember years ago, standing on the broom below, on the spot that witnessed their parting. I could picture the elder man turning sadly back towards his Lanarkshire home, whilst David hurried off to make his final preparations for sailing. But deeper than their sorrow, there is in each of their hearts a song, the song of the psalm that they have read together in the kitchen, the song of presence, the song of the text. Leave me not, forsake me not, cries the lonely lad. Lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. It is the word of a gentleman of the most strict and sacred honor, and there's an end of it. And with that song singing itself in his soul, David Livingstone turns his face towards darkest Africa. If ever a man needed a comrade, David Livingstone did. Apart from that divine companionship, his is the most lonely life in history. It is doubtless good for the world that most men are content to marry and settle down, to weave about themselves the web of domestic felicity, to face each day the task that lies nearest to them, and to work out their destiny without worrying about the remote and the unexplored. But it is equally good for the world that there are a few adventurous spirits in every age who feel themselves taunted and challenged and dared by the mystery of the great unknown. As long as there is a pole undiscovered, a sea unchartered, a forest untracked, or a desert uncrossed, they are restless and ill at ease. It is the most sublime form that curiosity assumes. From the moment of his landing on African soil, Livingstone is haunted night and day by the visions that beckon and the voices that call from out of the undiscovered. For his poor wife's sake, he tries hard and tries repeatedly to settle down to the life of an ordinary mission station. But it is impossible. The lure of the wilds fascinates him. He sees away on the horizon the smoke of a thousand native settlements in which no white man has ever been seen. It is more than he can bear. He goes to some of them, and beholds on arrival the smoke of yet other settlements still further away, and so he wanders further and further from his starting point, and builds home after home, only to desert each home as soon as it is built. The tales that the natives tell of vast inland seas and of wild tumultuous waters tantalize him beyond endurance. The instincts of the hydrographer tingle within him. He sees the three great rivers, the Nile, the Congo, and the Zambezi, emptying themselves into three separate oceans, and he convinces himself that the man who can solve the riddle of their sources will have opened up a continent to the commerce and civilization of the world. The treasures of history present us with few things more affecting than the hold that this ambition secures upon his heart. It lures him on and on, along the torturous slave tracks littered everywhere with bones, through the long grass that stand up like a wall on either side of him, across the swamps, the marshes, and the bogs of the watersheds, through forests dark as night, and through deserts that no man has ever crossed before, on and on for more than thirty thousand miles. He makes a score of discoveries, any one of which he could have established his fame, but none of these satisfy him. The unknown still calls loudly and will not be denied. Even at the last, worn to a shadow, suffering in every limb and too feeble to put his feet to the ground, 
the mysterious fountains of herodotus torture his fancy the fountains he murmurs in his delirium the hidden fountains and with death stamped upon his face he orders his faithful blacks to bear him on a rude litter in his tireless search for the elusive streams yet never once does he feel really lonely one has but to read his journal in order to see that that word of stainless honor never failed him the song that soothed and comforted the weeping household in the blantyre kitchen cheered with its music the hazards and the adventures of his life in africa leave me not forsake me not lo i am with you always even unto the end of the world it is the word of a gentleman of the most strict and sacred honor and so there's an end of it thus amid savages and solitudes livingstone finds that great word grandly true it is his word of honor says livingstone and nothing if not practical he straightway proceeds to act upon it if he be with me i can do anything 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 it is the echo of another apostolic boast i can do all things through christ that strengthens me in that unwavering confidence and with an audacity that is the best evidence of his faith livingstone draws up for himself a program so colossal that it would still have seemed large had it been the project of a million men it is his word of honor he reasons and if he will indeed be with me even unto the end he and i can accomplish what a million men unattended by the divine companion would tremble to attempt and so he draws upon a calm hand and a fearless heart that prodigious program from which he never for a moment swerved and which when all was over was inscribed upon his tomb in westminster abbey relying on the word of a gentleman of the most strict and sacred honor he sets himself to evangelize the native races to explore the undiscovered secrets to abolish the desolating slave trade some men set themselves out to evangelize some make it their business to explore others feel called to emancipate but livingstone with a golden secret locked up in his heart undertakes all three evangelization exploration emancipation these are his watchwords no man ever set himself a more tremendous task no man ever confronted his life work with a more serene and joyous confidence and how did it all work out was his faith justified was that word of honor strictly kept leave me not forsake me not he cries lo i am with you alway even unto the end in spite of that assurance did he ever find himself a solitary in a strange and savage land was he ever left or forsaken it sometimes looked like it it looked like it when he stood bent with anguish beside that sad and lonely grave at chupanga poor mary livingstone the daughter of robert and mary moffat was never strong enough to be the constant companion of a pioneer for years she struggled on through dusty deserts and trackless jungles seeing no other woman but the wild women about her but with little children at her skirts she could not struggle on for long she gave it up and stayed at home to care for the bairns and to pray for her husband as he pressed tirelessly on but even in africa people will talk the gossips at the white settlements were incapable of comprehending any motive that could lead a man to leave his wife and plunge into the interior save the desire to be as far from her as possible hearing of the scandal and stung by it livingstone in a weak moment sent for his wife to again join him she came she sickened and she died we have all been touched by that sad scene in the vast african solitude we seem to have seen him sitting beside the rude bed formed of boxes covered with a soft mattress on which lies his dying wife the man who has faced so many deaths and braved so many dangers is now utterly broken down he weeps like a child oh my mary my mary he cries as the gentle spirit sighs itself away i loved you when i married you and the longer i lived with you i loved you the more how often have we longed for a quiet home since you and i were cast adrift in africa god pity the poor children he buries her under the large baobab tree sixty feet in circumference and reverently marks her grave for the first time in my life he says i feel willing to die i am left alone in the world by one whom i felt to be a part of myself leave me not forsake me not he cried at the outset i am left alone he cries in his anguish now has the word of honor been violated has it it certainly looks like it it looked like it too eleven years later when his own time came 
he is away among the bogs and the marshes near Chichambo's village in Ilala. Save only for his native helpers, he is all alone. He is all alone and at the end of everything. He walked as long as he could walk, rode as long as he could ride, and carried on a litter as long as he could bear it. But now, with his feet too ulcerated to bear the touch of the ground, and his frame so emaciated that it frightens him when he sees it in the glass, and with the horrible inward hemorrhage draining away his scanty remnant of vitality, he can go no further. Knocked up quite, he says in the last indistinct entry in his journal. A drizzling rain is falling, and the black men hastily build a hut to shelter him. In his fever he babbles about the fountains, the sources of the rivers, the undiscovered streams. Two of the black boys, almost as tired as their master, go to rest, appointing a third to watch the sick man's bed. But he too sleeps, and when he wakes, in the gold gray of the dawn, the vision that confronts him fills him with terror. The white man is not in bed, but on his knees beside it. He runs and wakens his two companions. They creep timidly to the kneeling figure. It is cold and stiff. Their great master is dead. No white man near. No woman's hand to close his eyes in that last cruel sickness. No comrade to fortify his faith with the deathless words of everlasting comfort and everlasting hope. He dies alone. Leave me not, forsake me not, he cried at the beginning. He died alone. That is how it all ended. Has the word of honor been violated? It most certainly looks like it. But it only looks like it. Life is full of illusions, and so is death. Anyone who cares to read the record in the journal of that terrible experience at Chupanga will be made to feel that never for a moment did the word of honor really fail. Lo, I am with you always, even unto the end. The consciousness of that unfailing presence was his one source of comfort as he sat by his wife's bedside and dug her grave. The assurance of that divine presence was the one heartening inspiration that enabled him to take up his heavy burden and struggle on again. Lo, I am with you alway, even unto the end. Yes, even unto the end. Take just one more peep at the scene in the hut at Chichambo's village. He died on his knees. Then to whom was he talking to when he died? He was talking even to the last moment of his life, to the constant companion of his long, long pilgrimage. He was speaking even in the act and article of death to that great man of the most strict and sacred honor, whose word he had so implicitly trusted. He will keep his word, it is among the last entries in his journal. He will keep his word, the gracious one, full of grace and truth, no doubt of it. He will keep his word, and it will be all right. Doubt is here inadmissible, surely. Leave me not, forsake me not, he cried at the beginning. Lo, I am with you always, even unto the end, came the assuring response. It is the word of a gentleman of the most strict and sacred honor, and so there's an end of it. And that pathetic figure on his knees is the best testimony to the way in which that sacred pledge was kept. End of chapter 13「Chapter Fourteen of a Bunch of Everlastings, or Texts that Made History by Frank W. Borum. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tim Bauer. Chapter Fourteen C. H. Spurgeon's Text Snow, Snow, Snow. It was the first Sunday of the new year, and this was how it opened. On roads and footpaths the snow was already many inches deep. The fields were a sheet of blinding whiteness, and the flakes were still falling as though they never meant to stop. As the caretaker fought his way through the storm from his cottage to the chapel in Artery Street, he wondered whether, on such a wild and wintry day, any one would venture out. It would be strange if, on the very first Sunday morning of the year, there should be no service. He unbolted the chapel doors and lit the furnace under the stove. Half an hour later, two men were bravely trudging their way through the snowdrifts, and, as they stood on the chapel steps, their faces flushed with their recent exertions, they laughingly shook the snow from off their hats and overcoats. What a morning to be sure! By eleven o'clock about a dozen others had arrived. But where was the minister? They waited, but he did not come. He lived at a distance, and in all probability had found the roads impassable. What was to be done? The stewards looked at each other and surveyed the congregation. 
except for a boy of fifteen sitting under the gallery every face was known to them and the range of selection was not great there were whisperings and hasty consultations and at last one of the two men who were first to arrive a poor thin-looking man a shoemaker a tailor or something of that sort yielded to the murmured entreaties of the others and mounted the pulpit steps he glanced nervously around upon nearly three hundred empty seats nearly but not quite for there were a dozen or fifteen other regular worshippers present and there was the boy sitting under the gallery people who had braved such a morning deserved all the help that he could give them and the strange boy under the gallery ought not to be sent back into the storm feeling that there was nothing in the service for him and so the preacher determined to make the most of his opportunity and he did the boy sitting under the gallery a marble tablet now adorns the wall near the seat which he occupied that snowy day the inscription reads that that very morning the boy sitting under the gallery was converted he was only fifteen and he died at fifty-seven but in the course of the intervening years he preached the gospel to millions and led thousands and thousands into the kingdom in service of jesus christ let the preacher study this story says sir william robertson nicole let them believe that under the most adverse circumstances they may do a work that will tell on the universe forever it was a great thing to have converted charles hayden spurgeon and who knows but he may have in the smallest and humblest congregation in the world some lad as well worth converting as he snow 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 the boy sitting under the gallery had purposed attending quite another place of worship that sunday morning no thought of the little chapel in artillery street occurred to him as he strode out into the storm not that he was very particular ever since he was ten years of age he had felt restless and ill at ease whenever his mind turned to the things that are unseen and eternal i had been about five years in the most fearful distress of mind he says i thought the sun was blotted out of my sky that i had so sinned against god that there was no hope for me he prayed but never had a glimpse of an answer he attended every place of worship in the town but no man had a message for a youth who only wanted to know what he must do to be saved with the first sunday of the new year he purposed yet another of these ecclesiastical experiments but in making his plans he had not reckoned on the ferocity of the storm i sometimes think he said years afterwards i sometimes think that i might have been in darkness and despair now had it not been for the goodness of god in sending a snowstorm on sunday morning january sixth eighteen fifty when i was going to a place of worship when i could go no further i turned down a court and came to a little primitive methodist chapel thus the strange boy sitting under the gallery came to be seen by the impromptu speaker that snowy morning thus as often happens a broken program pointed the path of destiny who says that two wrongs can never make a right let them look at this the plans at the chapel went wrong the minister was snowed up the plans of the boy under the gallery went wrong the snowstorm shut him off from the church of his choice those two wrongs together made one tremendous right for out of those shattered plans and programs came an event that has incalculably enriched mankind snow 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 and the very snow seemed to mock his misery it taunted him as he walked to church that morning each virgin snowflake as it fluttered before his face and fell at his feet only emphasized the dreadful pollution within my original and inward pollution he cries with bunyan i was more loathsome in my own eyes than a toad sin and corruption would as naturally bubble out of my heart as water out of a fountain i thought that every one had a better heart than i had at the sight of my own vileness i fell deeply into despair these words of bunyan exactly reflect he tells us his own secret and spiritual history and the white white snow only intensified the agonizing consciousness of defilement in the expressive phraseology of the church of england communion service the remembrance of his sins was grievous unto him the burden of them was intolerable i counted the estate of everything that god had made far better than this dreadful state of mind was yea gladly would i have been in the condition of a dog or a horse for i knew they had no souls to perish under the weight of sin as mine was like to do 
many and many a time says mr thomas spurgeon my father told me that in those early days he was so storm-tossed and distressed by reason of his sin that he found himself envying the very beast in the field and the toads by the wayside so storm-tossed the storm that raged around him that january morning was in perfect keeping with the storm within but oh for the whitest and purest unsullied whiteness of the falling snow 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 from out of that taunting panorama of purity the boy passed into the cavernous gloom of the almost empty building its leaden heaviness matched the mood of his spirit and he stole furtively to a seat under the gallery he noticed the long pause the anxious glances which the steward exchanged with each other and a little later the whispered consultations he watched curiously as the hastily appointed preacher a shoemaker of something of that sort awkwardly ascended the pulpit the man was mr spurgeon tells us really stupid as you would say he was obliged to stick to his text for the simple reason that he had nothing else to say his text was look unto me and be ye saved all the ends of the earth he did not even pronounce the words rightly but that did not matter there was i thought a glimpse of hope for me in the text and i listened as though my life depended upon what i heard in about ten minutes the preacher had got to the end of his tether then he saw me sitting under the gallery and i dare say with so few present he knew me to be a stranger he then said young man you look very miserable well i did but i had not been accustomed to have remarks made from the pulpit on my personal appearance however it was a good blow well struck he continued and you will always be miserable miserable in life miserable in death if you do not obey my text but if you obey now this moment you will be saved then he shouted as only a primitive methodist can shout young man look to jesus look 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 i did and then and there the cloud was gone the darkness had rolled away and at that moment i saw the sun i could have risen on the instant and sung with the most enthusiastic of them of the precious blood and of the simple faith that looks alone to him oh that somebody had told me before in their most earnest way they sang a hallelujah before they went home and i joined in it the snow around the defilement within look unto me and be ye saved all the ends of the earth precious blood and simple faith i sang a hallelujah snow 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 the snow was falling as fast as ever when the boy sitting under the gallery rose and left the building the storm raged just as fiercely and yet the snow was not the same snow everything was changed mr moody has told us that on the day of his conversion all the birds in the hedgerow seemed to be singing newer and blither songs dr campbell morgan declares that the very leaves on the trees appeared to him more beautiful on the day that witnessed the greatest spiritual crisis in his career frank bullen was led to christ in a little new zealand port which i have often visited by a worker whom i knew well and he used to say that next morning he climbed the summit of a mountain near by and the whole landscape seemed changed everything had been transformed in the night heaven above is softer blue earth around a deeper green something lives in every hue christless eyes have never seen birds are gladder songs are flow flowers with richer beauties shine since i know as now i know i am his and he is mine i was so taken with the love of god says bunyan and here again mr spurgeon says that the words might have been his own i was now so taken with the love and mercy of god that i could not tell how to contain till i got home i thought i could have spoken of his love and told of his mercy even to the very crows that sat upon the ploughed lands before me had they been capable of understanding me as the boy from under the gallery walked home that morning he laughed at the storm and the storm that had mocked him coming sang to him as he returned the snow was lying deep he says and more was falling but those words of david kept ringing through my heart wash me and i shall be whiter than snow it seemed to me as if all nature was in accord with the blessed deliverance from sin which i had found in a moment by looking to jesus the mockery of the snow the text amidst the snow the music of the snow whiter than snow look unto me and be ye saved 
wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Look unto me, and be ye saved. Look, look, look. I look to my doctor to heal me when I am hurt. I look to my lawyer to advise me when I am perplexed. I look to my tradesman to bring my daily supplies to my door. But there is only one to whom I can look when my soul cries out for deliverance. Look unto me, and be ye saved, all the ends of the earth. Look, 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 cried the preacher. I looked, says Mr. Spurgeon, until I could almost have looked my eyes away, and in heaven I will look still, in joy unutterable. Happy the preacher, however unlettered, who, knowing little else, knows how to direct such wistful and hungry eyes to the only possible fountain of salvation. End of chapter 14「Chapter Fifteen of a Bunch of Everlastings, or Texts that Made History by Frank W. Borum. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tim Bauer. Chapter Fifteen Dean Stanley's Text. Towards the close of his Life of Dean Stanley, Mr. Prothero tells a capital story. A gentleman traveling from Norwich to Liverpool entered a third-class smoking compartment and was soon absorbed in conversation with a couple of soldiers he found there. The gentleman's confession that he came from Norwich suggested to the soldiers the name of Dean Stanley, who lived in that city. The gentleman asked what they knew about Dean Stanley. Oh, replied one of them, me and my mate here have good cause to bless the Lord that we ever saw a good Dean Stanley, sir, I can tell you. They went on to explain that they once had a day in London. They were anxious to see all the sights, but by the time they reached Westminster Abbey, the doors were being closed for the night. Extremely disappointed, they were turning away sadly when a gentleman approached and asked if they could not return on the morrow. The soldiers explained that it was impossible. The gentleman, who proved to be the dean, thereupon took the keys from the beadle and himself showed him every part of the abbey. As he prepared to take leave of them, he commented upon the grandeur of being immortalized by a monument in Westminster Abbey. But, after all, he added, ye may both have a more enduring monument than this, for this will moulder into dust and be forgotten, but you, if your names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life, you will abide forever. He invited them to breakfast the next morning, and insisted upon paying their fares to their homes, and again, in bidding them good-bye, urged them to be sure to see that their names were written in the Lamb's Book of the Life. And then, he added, if we never meet again on earth, we shall certainly meet in heaven. And so we parted with the dean, said the soldier, in concluding his story in the train, and as we traveled home we talked about our visit to the abbey and puzzled much as to the meaning of the Lamb's Book of Life. It will be enough to say, observes Mr. Prothero, in placing the story on record, it will be enough to say that those words proved a turning point in the lives of those two men and their wives, and that, as one of them said, we trust that our names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life, and that we may some day, in God's good time, meet Dean Stanley in heaven. The Lamb, the Lamb's Book, the Lamb's Book of Life, and there shall in no wise enter into the city anything that defileth, neither whatsoever worketh abomination, or maketh a lie, but they which are written in the Lamb's book of life. God is a great believer in putting things down. I looked, says John, and behold I saw the books, and the books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life, and the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books. John saw books everywhere. It is the books, the books, the books. In the old slave days in America, the black slaves on the cotton plantations used to make their owners tremble by the zest with which, at their camp meetings, they shouted a certain chorus, My Lord sees all ye do, and my Lord hears all you say, and my Lord keeps a writin' all the time. It was a western appropriation of an eastern revelation. The slaves gloried in the highly colored imagery of the apocalypse. No book was so dear to them as the book with which the Bible closes. And when they read about the books, God's books, the books that hold the evidence, the books that must all be opened, they sang for very joy. The slaves shouted, and the owners shuddered, the books, the books, the books. God puts things down. He writes everywhere and on everything. He is the most voluminous author in the universe. 
every leaf in the forest every sand on the seashore is smothered with his handwriting the trouble is that i am so slow to recognize the manuscripts of god i walk past a tree and to me it is only a tree a leafy elm a tasseled birch a flowery chestnut a rustling plain or a spreading oak but a man whose eyes have been opened will find in the tree a volume of autobiography its history is written in its tissue a practiced eye can tell at a glance how long it has stood there he can read as from the pages of a book the story of the tree's experience the winds by which it has been buffeted the accidents that have befallen it the diseases from which it has suffered the way in which it has been nurtured or starved by congenial or uncongenial soil it is all written down a botanist could open the book and interpret the entire romance i stand and watch men dig a well the windlass revolves the great buckets go down empty and come up full the earth is thrown on to a heap and the process is repeated i see this and i see no more but a geologist would tell me that these men are digging among ancient libraries every clod is a record every stone a sign standing here at the mouth of the well with his glass in one hand and his hammer in the other he could pounce upon this and would probe into that and would tell a most wonderful tale to him these are the archives of antiquity they tell him of floods and tornadoes and earthquakes of which no other records survive he taps at a stone and crumbles a lump of loam and straightway tells you of the flora and fauna of the district in some prehistoric time it is all written down nothing happens without its record god is a great believer in bookkeeping no man can walk down the street by night or by day without placing on record the story of his movements my senses may be too dull to trace him but call out the black trackers or the bloodhounds and they will soon convince you that every footstep was like a signature read a great detective story and it will soon occur to you that your Sherlock Holmes proceeds on the assumption that every secret thing is recorded somewhere and somehow. The only trouble is to lay your hand on the exact volume and correctly decipher its mysterious hieroglyphics. It is to that task that the detective dedicates his skill. The whole science of fingerprint evidence shows that I cannot touch a stick or straw in the solar system without leaving a record of my act signed and sealed upon the spot history is written automatically it is wonderful what you find when you are moving the autocrat of the breakfast table engaged one day on some such domestic upheaval stumbling upon this very truth he found it behind a set of bookshelves there is nothing that happens he says in telling the story which must not inevitably and which does not actually photograph itself in every conceivable aspect and in all dimensions the infinite galleries of the past await but one brief process and all the pictures will be called out and fixed forever we had a curious illustration of this great fact on a very humble scale when a certain bookcase long standing in one place for which it was built was removed and there was the exact image on the wall of the whole and of many of its portions but in the midst of this picture was another the precise outline of a map which had hung on the wall before the bookcase was built we had all forgotten everything about the map until we saw its photograph on the wall then we remembered it as some day or other we may remember a sin which was built over and covered up when this lower universe is pulled away from the wall of infinity the wrongdoing stands self-recorded one of the old hebrew prophets declared that the sin of judah is written with a pen of iron everything is my doings are dotted down even if they are written nowhere else they are entered upon the tables of my memory often the character reflects itself in the countenance life's story is variously and indelibly inscribed there are books 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 everywhere the universe is itself but a massive volume beautifully bound it takes a lot of reading but god makes out every word the books the books the dead were judged out of the books what does it mean it means that the judgments of god are terribly deliberate i shall never forget an impression made upon my mind in my early boyhood father woke me early in the morning he was going to london would i care to go with him those were always red-letter days the trip and the business in hand occupied most of the morning but then we were free where should we go 
Now it happened that I was very fond of reading the reports of famous trials. I thought that actually to witness one would be a most exciting experience. Accordingly, I asked to be taken to the law courts. Shall I ever forget the bitter disillusionment? I saw the judge sitting upon his bench. I saw the barristers, the witnesses, and all the principal parties to the suit. But the proceedings themselves? I heard a barrister ask a question, the sense of which I could with difficulty distinguish. I heard a mumbled reply, but failed to catch the words uttered. I saw the judge bend over his desk and carefully write something down, another question, another inaudible reply, another pause while the judge entered something in his book. I came away disgusted. My boyish dream was shattered, yet somehow the years have dispelled the disappointment. I like now to think of justice as calm, passionless, deliberate. The judge is unswayed by caprice, vindictiveness, or wrath. He is terribly deliberate. He writes everything down. He judges according to the things that appear in the books. It means, too, that the judgments of God are scrupulously accurate. I looked, and behold, I saw the books. I ask my tradesman how much I owe him. He scratches his head, hums and hauls for a minute, and then tells me that it comes to ten and sixpence. I pay him grudgingly, feeling that the position is very unsatisfactory. Again I ask my tradesman how much I owe him. He reaches down a ledger, opens it, and tells me that I owe him ten and sixpence. I pay him cheerfully. His accuracy gives me confidence. The books make all the difference. It means, too, that the judgments of God are wonderfully comprehensive and complete. Dean Stanley, who loved the Abbey so well, never wandered through transept, aisle, or nave without feeling, as he gazed upon its stately marbles, that the judgment of humanity is far from satisfactory. Many names are immortalized in the Abbey that might well be permitted to perish. Many who served their country nobly find no memorial there. The scroll of fame is incomplete. He loved, therefore, to ponder on another scroll that should be disfigured by no such blemishes. See to it, he used to say, that your name is written, not in marble that must crumble, but in the Lamb's book of life. I am glad that that other book that John Saul opened was the book of life. Westminster Abbey enshrines the names of the illustrious dead. That other book, the last and the best, that book John Saul opened, contains only the names of those who are alive, and alive forevermore. I came that you might have life, said Jesus, in one of his historic manifestos. I am come that you might have life, and that you might have it more abundantly. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. The Savior is the fountain of life. The gospel is the message of life. The volume that John Saul opened in heaven was the book of life. There is infinite comfort in that. I am glad, too, that it is the Lamb's book. My heart would fail me if that awful volume had been inscribed by any hand but his. Lackland Campbell was a good man. He was the strictest and the sternest of the elders of Drumchi, and he loved Flora, his erring daughter, dearly. But he was over hasty in striking her name out of the family Bible. We all remember the rebuke that Margaret Howe administered to him when she saw the book, its ink all blurred by tears. This is what ye have done, she cried, and ye let a woman see ye walk. Ye are an old man, and in sore travail, but I tell ye before God, ye hae the greater shame just twenty year o age this spring and her mither dead nay woman to watch over her and she wandered frae the fold and all ye can do is to take her name out o your bible ways me if our father had blotted our names frae the book of life when we left his house but he sent his ain son to seek us and a weary road he came poor flora to hey sick a father. Thanks to Margaret's gracious intervention, Flora came home again. She was welcomed with endless tears and caresses. The Gaelic, the best of all languages for loving, contains fifty words for darling, and Lachlan used them all that night. The name had to be re-entered in the Bible, and Lachlan had to ask Flora's forgiveness for erasing it. I am glad that the book on which my eternal destiny depends is the Lamb's book, the Lamb's Book of Life. Thackeray tells us that when good old Colonel Newcomb, the greatest gentleman in literature, lay dying, 
the watchers noticed that his mind was moving backwards across the pageant of the years he is in india addressing his regiment on parade he is in paris living through the days of old anxiety and then at the usual hour the chapel bell began to toll and thomas newcomb's hands outside the bed feebly beat time and just as the last bell struck the peculiar sweet smile shone over his face and he lifted up his head a little and quickly said add some and fell back it was the word he used at school when names were called and lo he whose heart was that of a little child had answered to his name and stood in the presence of the master the book the lamb's book the lamb's book of life when that last volume is opened and that last roll called may i like colonel newcomb be ready to answer gladly to my name end of chapter fifteen chapter sixteen of a bunch of everlastings or texts that made history by frank w borum this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by tim bower chapter sixteen william carey's text the westering sun slanting through the tops of the taller trees is beginning to throw long shadows across the green and gently undulating fields the brindled cattle lying at their ease and meditatively chewing the cud in this northamptonshire pastures are disturbed by the sound of footsteps in the lane some of them rise in protest and stare fixedly at the quaint figure that has broken so rudely on their afternoon reverie but he causes them no alarm for they have seen him pass this way before he is the village cobbler this very morning he tramped along his winding thoroughfare on his way to northampton he was carrying his wallet of shoes a fortnight's work to the government contractor there and now he is trudging his way back to molton with the roll of leather that will keep him busy for another week or two the cattle stare at him as well they may the whole world would stare at him if it had the chance to-day for this is william carey the harbinger of a new order the prophet of a new age the maker of a new world the cattle stare at him but he has no eyes for them his thoughts are over the seas and far away he is a dreamer but he is a dreamer who means business less than twenty years ago in a tall chestnut tree not far from this very lane he spied a bird's nest that he greatly coveted he climbed and fell he climbed again and fell again he climbed a third time and in the third fall broke his leg a few weeks later whilst the limb was still bandaged his mother left him for an hour or two instructing him to take the greatest care of himself in her absence when she returned he was sitting in his chair flushed and excited with the bird's nest on his knees hurrah mother i've done it at last here it is look you don't mean to tell me that you've climbed that tree again i couldn't help it mother i couldn't really if i begin a thing i must go through with it on monuments erected in honor of william carey on busts and plaques and pedestals on the title pages of his innumerable biographies and under pictures that have been painted of him i have often seen inscribed some stirring sentence that fell from his eloquent lips but i have never seen that one yet the most characteristic word that carey ever uttered was the reply that he made to his mother that day if i begin a thing i must go through with it if you look closely you will see that sentence stamped upon his countenance as with a far-away look in his eyes he passes down the lane let us follow him and we shall find that he is beginning some tremendous things and depend upon it he will at any cost go through with them it is not an elaborately furnished abode this little home of his for although he is minister schoolmaster and cobbler the three vocations only provide him with about thirty-six pounds a year looking around i can see a few stools his cobbler's outfit a book or two including a bible a copy of captain cook's voyages and a dutch grammar besides a queer-looking map on the wall we must have a good look at this map for there is history in it as well as geography it is a map of the world made of leather and brown paper and it is the work of his own fingers look i say at this map for it is a reflection of the soul of carey as he came up the lane looking neither to the right nor to the left he was thinking of the world he is a jack-of-all-trades yet he is a man of a single thought perhaps he says to himself perhaps god means what he says 
the world the world the world for god so loved the world go ye into all the world the kingdoms of the world shall become the kingdoms of our god and of his christ it is always the world the world the world that thought haunted the mind of Carey night and day the map of the world hung in his room but it only hung in his room because it already hung in his heart he thought of it he dreamed of it he preached of it and he was amazed that when he unburdened his soul to his brother ministers or preached on that burning theme to his little congregation they listened with respectful interest and close attention yet did nothing at length on may thirty first seventeen ninety two carey preached his great sermon the sermon that gave rise to the modern missionary movement the sermon that made history it was at nottingham lengthen thy cords so ran the text lengthen thy cords and strengthen thy stakes for thou shalt break forth on the right hand and on the left and thy seed shall inherit the gentiles and make the desolate cities to be inhabited lengthen thy cords said the text strengthen thy stakes said the text expect great things from god said the preacher attempt great things for god said the preacher if all the people had lifted up their voices and wept says dr ryland as the children of israel did at botcham i should not have wondered at the effect it would only have seemed proportionate to the cause so clearly did mr carey prove the criminality of our supineness in the cause of god but the people did not weep they did not even wait they rose to leave as usual when carey stepping down from the pulpit saw the people quietly dispersing he seized andrew fuller's hand and wrung it in an agony of distress are we not going to do anything he demanded oh fuller call them back call them back we dare not separate without doing anything as a result of that passionate entreaty a missionary society was formed and william carey offered himself as the society's first missionary if i begin a thing i must go through with it he said as a schoolboy we dare not separate without doing something he cried as a young minister lengthen the cords strengthen the stakes expect great things attempt great things i can never think of william carey without thinking of jane conquest in the little hamlet by the sea poor jane watched through the night beside the cot of her dying child then suddenly a light leapt in at the lattice crimsoning every object in the room it was a ship on fire and no eyes but hers had seen it leaving her dying boy to the great father's care she trudged through the snow to the old church on the hill she crept through the narrow window and climbed the belfry stair and grasped the rope sole cord of hope for the mariners in despair and the wild wind helped her bravely and she wrought with an earnest will and the clamorous bell spoke out right well to the hamlet under the hill and it roused the slumbering fishers nor its warning task gave o'er till a hundred fleet and eager feet were hurrying to the shore and the lifeboat midst the breakers with a brave and gallant few or came every check and reached the wreck and saved the hapless crew upon the sensitive soul of william carey there broke the startling vision of a world in peril and he could find no sleep for his eyes nor slumber for his eyelids until the whole church was up and doing for the salvation of the perishing millions it has been finely said that when towards the close of the eighteenth century it pleased god to awaken from her slumber a drowsy and lethargic church there rang out from the belfry of the ages a clamorous and insistent alarm and in that arousing hour the hand upon the bell rope was the hand of william carey we dare not separate without doing something lengthen the cords strengthen the stakes expect great things attempt great things here am i send me send me now the life of william carey is both the outcome and the exemplification of a stupendous principle that principle was never better stated than by the prophet from whose flaming lips carey borrowed his text thine eyes said isaiah thine eyes shall see the king in his beauty they shall behold the land that stretches very far off the vision kingly stands related to the vision continental the revelation of the lord leads to the revelation of the limitless landscape what was it that happened one memorable day upon the road to damascus it was simply this saul of tarsus saw the king in his beauty and what happened was a natural and inevitable consequence 
there came into his life the passion of the far horizon all the narrowing limits of jewish prejudice and the cramping bonds of pharisaic superstition fell from him like the scales that seemed to drop from his eyes the world is at his feet single-handed and alone taking his life in his hand he storms the great centers of civilization the capitals of proud empires in the name of jesus christ no difficulty can daunt him no danger impede his splendid progress he passes from sea to sea from island to island from continent to continent the hunger of the earth is in his soul there is no coast or colony to which he will not go he finds himself a debtor to greek and to barbarian to bond and to free he climbs mountains fords rivers crosses continents bears stripes endures imprisonment suffers shipwreck courts insult and dares a thousand deaths out of the passion of his heart to carry the message of hope to every crevice and corner of the earth a more thrilling story of hazard hardship heroism and adventure has never been written on the road to damascus paul saw the king in his beauty and he spent the remainder of his life in exploring the limitless landscape that unrolled itself before him the vision of the king opened to his eyes the vision of the continents in every age these two visions have always gone side by side in the fourteenth century the vision of the king broke upon the soul of john wycliffe instantly there arose the lollards scouring city town and hamlet with the new evangel the representatives of the instinct of the far horizon the fifteenth century contains two tremendous names as soon as the world received the vision kingly by means of savonarola it received the vision continental by means of christopher columbus in the sixteenth century the same principle holds it is on the one hand the century of martin luther and on the other hand the century of raleigh drake hawkins frobisher greenville and the great elizabethan navigators all the oceans of the world became a snowstorm of white sails the seventeenth century gave us first the puritans and then the sailing of the mayflower so we came to the eighteenth century and the eighteenth century is essentially the century of john wesley and of william carey at aldersgate street the vision of the king in his beauty dawned graciously upon the soul of john wesley during the fifty years that followed that vision fell through wesley's instrumentality upon the entire english people the methodist revival of the eighteenth century is one of the most gladsome records in the history of europe and then john wesley having oppressed upon all men the vision of the king william carey arose to oppress upon them the vision of the continents we must do something he cried lengthen the cords strengthen the stakes expect great things attempt great things the king the king the continents the continents having gazed upon these things our eyes are the better fitted to appreciate the significance of the contents of the cobbler's room there he sits at his last the bible from which he drew his text spread out before him and a homemade map of the world upon the wall there is no element of chance about that artless record there is a subtle and inevitable connection between the two in the bible he saw the king in his beauty on the map he caught glimpses of the far horizon to him the two were inseparable and moved by the vision of the lord which he caught in the one and by the vision of the limitless landscape which he caught in the other he left his last and made history lengthen the cords strengthen the stakes expect great things attempt great things do something do something it was at nottingham that carey preached that arousing sermon it was in india that he practised it with the eye of a statesman and a strategist he saw that the best way to regain the ground that was being lost in europe was to achieve new conquest in asia history abounds in striking coincidences and among them all there was none more suggestive than the fact that it was on november eleventh seventeen ninety three the very day in which the french revolutionists tore down the cross at notre dame smashed it on the streets and abjured christianity that william carey sailed up the hoogly landed at calcutta and claimed a new continent for christ and like a statesman and a strategist he settled down to do in india the work to which he had challenged the church at home lengthen the cords strengthen the stakes he started an indigo factory made himself the master of a dozen languages 
became professor of Bengali, Sanskrit, and Maratha at a salary of 1500 a year all in order to engage more and still more missionaries and to multiply the activities by which the kingdom of christ might be set up in india his work of translation was a marvel in itself if i begin a thing i must go through with it he said that day with a bird's nest resting on his lap do something do something he said in his agony as he saw the people dispersing after his sermon and in india he did things he toiled terribly but he sent the gospel broadcast through the lengths and breadths of that vast land filled up the finest college in the indian empire and gave the peoples the word of god in their own tongue just before carey died alexander duff arrived in india he was a young highlander of four-and-twenty tall and handsome with flashing eyes and a quivering voice before setting out on his own life's work he went to see the man who had changed the face of the world he reached the college on a sweltering day in july there he beheld a little yellow old man in a white jacket who tottered up to the visitor received his greetings and with outstretched hands solemnly blessed him each fell in love with the other carey standing on the brink of the grave rejoiced to see the handsome and cultured young scotsman dedicating his life to the evangelization and emancipation of india duff felt that the old man's benediction would cling to his work like a fragrance through all the great and epic-making days ahead not long after carey lay a-dying and to his great delight duff came to see him the young highlander told the veteran of his admiration and his love in a whisper that was scarcely audible the dying man begged the visitor to pray with him and after he had complied and taken a sad farewell of the frail old man he turned to go on reaching the door he fancied that he heard his name he turned and saw mr carey beckoning him mr duff said the dying man his earnestness imparting a new vigour to his voice mr duff you have spoken of dr carey dr carey dr carey when i am gone say nothing of dr carey speak only of dr carey's saviour did i say that when our little cobbler startled the cattle in the northamptonshire lane he was thinking only of the world the world the world i was wrong he was thinking primarily of the saviour the saviour the saviour the saviour of the world and yet i was right for the two visions are one vision the two thoughts one thought the king the king the king the continents the continents the continents the saviour the saviour the saviour the world the world the world as a lad carey caught the vision of the king in his beauty and as an inevitable consequence he spent his life in the conquest of the land that is very far off end of chapter sixteen chapter seventeen of a bunch of everlastings or text that made history by frank w borum this librivox recording is in the public domain Recording by Tim Bower Chapter 17 James Hannington's Text He is a proud young English gentleman, wealthy, cultured, athletic, and the words smite him like a blow in the face. Not fit for the kingdom of God. Not fit for the kingdom of God. Those who know him best would say that he is fit for anything, yet these are the stinging words that confront him in the crisis of his young career. Not fit for the kingdom of God. Not fit for the kingdom of God. He is the kind of fellow upon whom you would bestow a second glance if it were your good fortune to meet him on the street. He is tall, lithe, handsome, and splendidly proportioned. He strikes you as having every nerve and sinew under perfect control. His face is vigorous and arresting, without seeming in the least degree self-assertive or pugnacious. It suggests boundless energy and dauntless resolution. His eyes are gray and full of mischief his voice is resonant impressive commanding his laugh is boisterous contagious unforgettable although still young he has travelled widely has visited the famous cities of the continent and in his own yacht has navigated the waterways of europe he is just finishing his undergraduate career at oxford come with me to his room at st mary's hall and as you glance around its walls the medley of objects that will meet the eye will furnish us with some index to his character 
in the center of everything is a portrait of his mother a stately and beautiful lady from whom he has inherited many of his noblest traits arranged around it are the bones of many curious monsters the crude but cunning weapons of barbarous peoples in the corner stands a miscellaneous collection of riding whips whilst here under the window stands a tank in which numbers of live fish disport themselves for our gay young undergraduate is a naturalist the woods and the waters have taken him into their confidence and have freely yielded up their secrets here he is then standing on the threshold of destiny he appears to be one of fortune's darlings all that exceptional gifts careful training extensive travel and the highest education can do for a man has been done for him and yet as he prepares to turn all these priceless advantages to some account and to set his face seriously towards his life work these are the words that smite him in the face and stab him to the quick not fit for the kingdom of god not fit for the kingdom of god like the rich young ruler whom he so strikingly resembles he turns away sorrowful the gaiety of his spirit is clouded in gloom not fit for the kingdom of god what is it that with all his charm and his accomplishments he still lacks it is on the eve of his ordination that these cruel words rebuke him for in striving to equip himself for the useful life that he so earnestly desires he has by no means forgotten the loftiest claims of all the fear of god is constantly before his eyes with all his fun and frolic his passion for sport and his thirst for adventure james hannington is in reality a fervently religious youth at the back of his mind he is revolving some tremendous problems let me copy a couple entries from his private journal the one was written in his eighteenth year and the other in his twentieth march twenty eighteen sixty eight i have been much tempted of late to turn roman catholic and nearly did so but my faith has been much shaken by reading cardinal manning's funeral sermon for cardinal wiseman over whose death i mourned much he said that cardinal wiseman's last words were let me have all that the church can do for me i seem to see at once that if the highest ecclesiastic stood thus in need of external rights on his deathbed the system must be rotten and i gave up all idea of departing from our protestant faith from this significant entry with its revelation of great thoughts stirring in the soul i turn to one of a very different kind yet of no less value march ninth eighteen sixty seven i lost my ring out shooting with scarcely a hope of seeing it again i offered to give the gamekeeper ten shillings if he found it and was led to ask god that the ring might be found and be to me a sure sign of salvation from that moment the ring seemed on my finger and i was not surprised when sayers brought it to me on monday evening he had picked it up in the long grass in cover a most unlikely place ever to find it a miracle jesus by thee alone can we obtain remission of our sins the diary contains a footnote to this entry written by hannington some years afterwards this he says was written by me at the most worldly period of my existence yet there it is these entries prove that however far from the kingdom hannington may have been he kept his face turned wistfully and steadfastly towards its gates the deep religious impulses throbbing in his soul moved him to associate himself with the church to receive upon his lips the awful mysteries of the christian sacrament and later on to apply for ordination but as he drew nearer to that solemn and searching ceremony his conscience cried out and his heart failed him how i dread my ordination he writes i would willingly draw back but when i am tempted to do so i hear ringing in my ears no man having put his hand to the plough and looking back is fit for the kingdom of god what am i to do what what indeed he felt that he was not fit for the kingdom of god and dare not go on and yet if he turned back he was only giving further evidence of his unfitness here was a dilemma he resolved at length to go on and in going on to seek with full purpose of heart that fitness that he felt he lacked it is characteristic of the man says his biographer that he should have faced what he now dreaded with an almost morbid fear his conscience would have absolved him on no other terms no man having put his hand to the plough and looking back is fit for the kingdom of god those words held him fast to his purpose so he made his decision 
but the decision did not relieve his deep spiritual embarrassment for whilst he felt that he dared not look back he felt that he was unfit to go on not fit for the kingdom of god not fit for the kingdom of god the words beat themselves into his brain it was a terrible situation and he saw no way of escape the way of escape came by post it sometimes does there are a few choice spirit in god's world who have mastered the high art of conducting a religious correspondence they can write without gush and without gloom their letters are neither sentimental nor sanctimonious his old comrade and chum the rev e c dawson m a who afterwards became his biographer was about this time greatly concerned on hannington's behalf i could not tell why he says but the burden seemed to press upon me more heavily day by day at last he resolved to write he knew hannington's scorn of cant and feared that such a letter would offend him still he says i reasoned that a friendship was to be lost it should be at least well lost so i wrote a simple unvarnished account of my own spiritual experience i tried to explain how it was that i was not now as formerly i spoke of the power of the love of christ to transform the life of a man and to draw out all its latent possibilities and finally i urged him as he loved his own soul to make a definite surrender of himself to the saviour of the world and the result for the result we must turn to the diary july fifteenth dawson who is now a curate in surrey opened a correspondence with me to-day which i can only describe as delightful it led to my conversion i was in bed at the time reading he says in a note written years afterwards i sprang out of bed and leaped about the room rejoicing and praising god that jesus died for me from that day to this i have lived under the shadow of his wings in the assurance that i am his and he is mine and writing to dawson the author of the letter he says i have never seen so much light as during the past few days i know now that jesus died for me and that he is mine and i am his i ought daily to be more thankful to you as the instrument by whom i was brought to christ unspeakable joy it led to my conversion i now know that jesus died for me unspeakable joy unspeakable joy five years filled with happy and fruitful ministry pass away he is now a proud husband and the father of a little family all at once england is stirring to its depth by the news that lieutenant shergold smith and mr o'neill have been murdered on the shore of victoria nyanza it affects hannington like a challenge he longs to go and fill one of the vacant places unable to resist the call he offers and is accepted as the time for his departure approaches he realizes the bitterness of the ordeal that he must face his people the congregation is in tears whenever he enters the pulpit his wife who had so bravely consented to his application but finds it so hard to let him go his little ones this he says as he records the anguish of farewell this was my most bitter trial an agony that still cleaves to me saying good-bye to the little ones thank god that all the pain was on one side over and over again i thank him for that come back soon papa they cried then the servants all attached to me my wife the bravest of them all over the chapter that tells of such experiences his biographer has inscribed a quotation from epictetus if some whiffling or chilling be granted you well and good but if the captain call run to the ship and leave such possessions behind you not looking back but if the work had been an autobiography and if hannington himself had chosen the inscription for the heading of that chapter he would have selected the words that surged through his brain every day and many times a day no man having put his hand to the plough and looking back is fit for the kingdom of god no man looking back cries the philosopher no man looking back is fit for the kingdom of god says hannington's text with such words in his heart he fought his way through his valley of weeping and set out for darkest africa but he was driven back as even the bravest sometimes are in africa he was beset by fever after fever for weeks on end he could not rise from his mattress his emaciation was terrible to behold can it be long before i die he said one day to cecil gordon no replied his companion nor can you desire that it should be so 
i have a distinct remembrance says mr copplestone another member of the party of one of the few walks which he was able to take with myself copplestone he said i do not think that i can recover from this illness let us go that we may choose a place for my grave so we went and he selected a spot where he said we were to bury him he did not expect that he could live long in such a state as that in which he then was a day or two later mr stokes who had left the party to find a road to the lake victoria nyanza unexpectedly returned but let the diary tell its own story october sixth slightly better but still in very great pain to our immense surprise stokes turned up early this morning when i heard his voice i exclaimed i shall live and not die it inspired me with new life i felt that they had returned that i might go with them and so they had he had to be carried in a hammock however in the course of the journey he was often at death's door clearly there was nothing for it but a return to england yet all the way home he felt that he was beating a retreat no man having put his hand to the plough and looking back is fit for the kingdom of god the words haunted him night and day as he paced the deck of the homebound steamer forgive the one that turned back it is with that penitent petition that he closes this chapter of the diary he turned back but not for long he had put his hand to the plough and he felt that to show himself fit for the kingdom of god he must faithfully finish the furrow he had solemnly given himself to africa and he was unwilling to take back his gift in eighteen eighty three at the age of thirty six he found himself in england rejoicing in the sweet society of wife and children and friends little by little his health came back to him and with its coming his old text said it say not fit for the kingdom of god no man looking back is fit for the kingdom of god no man having put his hand to the plough and looking back is fit for the kingdom of god in mr dawson's great biography only half a dozen pages intervene between his arrival in england in june eighteen eighty three and his consecration as bishop of eastern equatorial africa in the june of the following year on returning to the dark continent he is overjoyed at finding his health as robust as it formerly was precarious i have to praise god he says in one of his early notes for one of the most successful journeys as a journey that i ever took during a tramp through over four hundred miles i enjoyed most excellent health he delighted his friends by completing his preliminary march sunburnt and shaggy but glowing with vigor having thus tested his physical resources he prepared for his great march to uganda the story of that famous and fateful journey need not be retold it is one of the world's great romances everybody knows that all unsuspecting the bishop went straight to his death a new king was on the throne the white men were no longer in favor the natives were ready to murder the first englishman they saw as soon as he drew near to the seat of government he was seized i felt he says in his last journal that i was being dragged away to be murdered but i sang safe in the arms of jesus and laughed at the very agony of my situation each day though naked starving and racking with excruciating pains he dots down in his diary the thoughts that comfort him he can only write two or three words at a time but he contrives to interrupt the journal to the last no news he says in the final entry i was upheld by the thirteenth psalm which came with great power a hyena howled near me last night smelling a sick man but i hope it is not to have me yet the next day the native warriors sent by the king came to kill him he struggled to his feet stood erect and told them that he was glad to die for them and for their people seeing them hesitate as to how to end his life he pointed to his own gun and with it they dispatched him he was only thirty-eight today a great cathedral marks the spot where he fell never in my life was i so moved says bishop tucker as when i preached in that cathedral to a congregation of from four to five thousand people many of the communicants bore upon their bodies the scars and disfigurements of their former barbarity clearly he did not die in vain if he says in his last letter if this is the last chapter of my earthly history then the next will be the first page of the heavenly no blots and smudges no incoherence but sweet converse in the presence of the lamb he put his hand to the plough he finished his furrow never looking back 
he was fit for the kingdom of God. End of chapter 17. Chapter 18 of A Bunch of Everlastings, or Texts That Made History, by Frank W. Borum. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tim Bauer. Chapter 18. William Wilberforce's Text. The hand that struck the shackles from the galled limbs of our British slaves was the hand of a hunchback. One of the triumphs of statuary in Westminster Abbey is the seated figure that, whilst faithfully perpetuating the noble face and fine features of Wilberforce, skillfully conceals his frightful physical deformities. From infancy he was an elfish, misshapen little figure. At the grammar school at Hull, the other boys would lift his tiny, twisted form onto the table and make him go through all his impish tricks. For, though so pitifully stunted and distorted, he was amazingly sprightful, resourceful, and clever, a master of mimicry, a born actor, an accomplished singer, and a perfect elocutionist. He was as agile also as a monkey, and as full of mischief. Every day he enlivened his performance by the startling introduction of some fresh antics that convulsed alike his schoolfellows and his teachers. He is the most striking illustration that history can offer of a grotesque and insignificant form glorified by its consecration to a great and noble cause. Recognizing the terrible handicap that nature had imposed upon him, he sets himself to counterbalance matters by acquiring a singular graciousness and charm of manner. He succeeds so perfectly that his courtliness and grace prove proverbial. It was said of him that if you saw him in conversation with a man, you would suppose that the man was his brother, or, if with a woman, that he was her lover. He made men forget his strange appearance. When he sprang to his feet to plead the cause of the slave, he seemed like a man inspired, and his disfigurement magically vanished. I saw, says Boswell, in his letter to Mr. Dundas, I saw a shrimp mount the table, but as I listened he grew and grew until the shrimp became a whale. When he rose to address the House of Commons, he looked like a dwarf that jumped out of the fairy tale. When he resumed his seat, he looked like the giant of the selfsame story. His form, as the Times said, was like the letter S. It resembled a stick that could not be straightened. Yet his hearers declare that his face, when pleading for the slave, was like the face of an angel. The ugliness of his little frame seemed to disappear, and under the magic of his passionate eloquence, his form became sublime. When in 1833 he passed away, such a funeral possession made its way to Westminster Abbey as even London had rarely witnessed. He was born to his last resting place by the peers and commoners of England with the Lord Chancellor at their head. In imperishable marble it was recorded of him that he had removed from England the guilt of the slave trade and prepared the way for the abolition of slavery in every colony in the empire. And it was said that as the cortege made its somber way through the crowded streets, all London was in tears, and one person in every four was garbed in deepest black. Among Sir James Stephen's masterpieces of biological analysis, there is nothing finer than his essay on Wilberforce. But he confesses to a difficulty. There is, he says, something hidden. You cannot account for his stupendous influence by pointing to anything that lies upon the surface. What that hidden life really was, Sir James observes, none but himself could know, and few indeed could even plausibly conjecture. But even they who are least able to solve the enigma may acknowledge and feel that there was some secret spring of action on which his strength was altogether dependent. Now what was that hidden factor? What was the secret spring of action that explained this strangely handicapped yet wonderfully useful life? Can I lay my finger on the source of all these beneficent energies? Can I trace the hidden power that impelled and directed these fruitful and epic-making activities? I think I can. Behind all that appears upon the surface, there lies a great experience, a great thought, a great text. I find it at the beginning of his career. I find it again at the close. 
as a youth preparing himself to play some worthy part in life wilberforce travels thrice he tours europe once in the company of william pitt then a young fellow of exactly his own age and twice in the company of isaac milner the brilliant brother of his hall schoolmaster it was in the course of one of these tours that the crisis of his inner life overtook him milner and he made it a practice to carry with them a few books to read on rainy days among these oddly assorted volumes they slipped into their luggage a copy of dr doddridge's rise and progress of religion in the soul it was a dangerous companion for young men who prize their peace of mind no book of that period had provoked more serious thought it certainly set wilberforce thinking and not all the festivities of his tour nor the laughter of his friends could dispel the feeling that now took sole possession of his mind one overpowering emotion drove out all others it haunted him sleeping and waking my sin he cried my sin my sin my sin it was this thought of his condition that filled him with apprehension and despair the deep guilt and black ingratitude of my past life he says forced itself upon me in the strongest colors and i condemned myself for having wasted my precious time and talents it was not so much the fear of punishment as a sense of my great sinfulness such was the effect which this thought produced that for months i was in a state of deepest depression from strong conviction of my guilt my deep guilt my great sinfulness my black ingratitude it was then at the age of twenty-six that his soul gathered itself up in one great and bitter cry god be merciful to me a sinner he implored and on receiving an assurance that his prayer was heard as all such prayers must be he breaks out in a new strain what infinite love he says that christ should die to save such a sinner my sin my sin my sin god be merciful to me a sinner that christ should die to save such a sinner this was in seventeen eighty five wilberforce stood then at the dawn of his great day for the second scene we must pass over nearly half a century his career is drawing to its close the twisted little body is heavily swathed in wrappings and wreathes in pain hearing of his serious sickness his quaker friend mr joseph gurney comes to see him he received me with the warmest marks of affection mr gurney says and seemed delighted at the unexpected arrival of an old friend the illuminated expression of his furrowed countenance with his clasped and uplifted hands were indicative of profound devotion and holy joy he unfolded his experience to me in a highly interesting manner with regard to myself said mr wilberforce before taking a last farewell of his friend with regard to myself i have nothing whatever to urge but the poor publican's plea god be merciful to me a sinner these words add mr gurney were expressed with peculiar feeling and emphasis god be merciful to me a sinner it was the cry of his heart in seventeen eighty five as his life lay all before him god be merciful to me a sinner it was still the cry of his heart in eighteen thirty three the time when his life lay all behind here then is william wilberforce's text it will do us good to listen to it as once and again it falls from his lips in outlining the events that led christiana to forsake the city of destruction and to follow her husband on pilgrimage bunyan tells us that she had a dream and behold in her dream she saw as if a broad parchment was opened before her in which was recorded the sum of her ways and the times as she thought looked very black upon her then she cried out aloud in her sleep god be merciful to me a sinner and the little children heard her it was well that she cried it was well that the children heard it led to their setting out together for the cross the palace beautiful and the city of light it will be well indeed for us if listening to william wilberforce as he offers the same agonizing petition we like christiana's children become followers of his faith and sharers of his joy there are very few i suppose who would envy william wilberforce 
the wretchedness that darkened his soul at spa in the course of that third european tour the wretchedness that led him to cry out for the everlasting mercy he was then twenty-six and if any young fellow of twenty-six entertains the slightest doubt as to the desirability of such a mournful experience i should like to introduce that young fellow first to robinson crusoe and then to old william Kitty of thaden boyce we all remember the scene in which robinson crusoe soon after his shipwreck searched the old chest for tobacco and found a bible he began to read it was not long after i set seriously to this work he tells us that i found my heart more deeply and sincerely affected with the wickedness of my past life the impression of my dream revived and the words all these things have not brought thee to repentance ran seriously in my thoughts i was earnestly begging of god to give me repentance when it happened providentially that very day that reading the scripture i came to these words he is exalted a prince and a savior to give repentance and to give remission i threw down the book and with my heart as well as my hands lifted up to heaven in a kind of ecstasy of joy i cried out aloud jesus thou son of david thou exalted prince and savior give me repentance this was the first time that i could say in the true sense of the word that i prayed in all of my life give me repentance this was robinson crusoe's first prayer but for william wilberforce bemoaning at spa the list of his transgressions the prayer is already answered they may pity him who will robinson crusoe will offer him nothing but congratulations so will old william Kitty. the old gentleman was well over ninety and was bedridden when in my college days i visited him he has long since passed from his frailty to his felicity i used occasionally to preach in the village sanctuary and was more than once the guest of the household that he adorned no such visit was complete without an invitation to go upstairs and talk with grandfather as a rule however these talks with grandfather were little embarrassing to a mere student for a ministerial student moves in an atmosphere in which his theological opinions are treated to say the least with respect he is quite sure of them himself and he likes other people to exhibit equal confidence but poor old william Kitty had no respect at all for any theological opinion of mine he was a sturdy old hyper calvinist and to him the doctrines that i expounded with such assurance were mere milk and water mostly water one afternoon i found the gentleman bewailing the exceeding sinfulness of his evil heart this seemed to me viewing the matter from the point of view of a theological student a very primitive experience for so mature a saint perhaps i as good as said so i forget i only remember that in response to my shallow observation the old gentleman sat straight up in bed a thing i had never seen him do before stared at me with eyes so full of reproach that they seemed to pierce my very soul and slowly recited a verse that i had never heard and have never since forgotten what comfort can a savior bring to those who never felt their woe a sinner is a sacred thing the holy ghost hath made him so ministers often learn from those they seem to teach but it rarely happens that a profound and awful and searching truth rushes as startlingly upon a man as this one did that day upon me it is a hard saying who can hear it but the wise will understand because of the lesson that he taught me to say nothing of the fact that one of his granddaughters has proved for many years the best wife any minister ever had i have always thought kindly of old william Kitty. i never heard the old man refer to robinson crusoe in any way but i am sure that he would join the redoubtable islander in congratulating william wilberforce on the experience that overtook him in his twenty-sixth year the sunlit passages in life are not always the most profitable it is through much tribulation that we enter the kingdom my sin my sin my sin god be merciful to me a sinner what infinite love that christ should die to save such a sinner wilberforce felt that such infinite love demanded the fullest requital he could possibly offer those who have been greatly saved must greatly serve i like to think of that memorable day on which the two friends wilberforce and pitt 
lay sprawling on the grass under a grand oak tree in the beautiful park at Hallwood in Kent. A solid stone seat now stands beside the tree, bearing an inscription commemorative of the historic occasion. For it was then and there that Wilberforce solemnly devoted his life to the emancipation of the slaves. He had introduced the subject with some diffidence, was delighted at Pitt's evident sympathy, and springing to his feet, he declared that he would set to work at once to abolish the iniquitous traffic. Few of us realized the immense proportions that the British slave trade had then assumed. During the eighteenth century, nearly a million blacks were transported, with much less consideration than would have been shown to cattle, from Africa to Jamaica alone. From his earliest infancy, the horror of the traffic preyed on the sensitive mind of William Wilberforce. When quite a boy, he wrote to the papers protesting against this odious traffic in human flesh. Now a young fellow in his twenties, he made its extinction the purpose of his life. For fifty years he never rested. Through evil report and through good, he tirelessly pursued his ideal. At times the opposition seemed insuperable, but Pitt stood by him, the Quakers and a few others encouraged him to persist. John Wesley, only a few days before his death, wrote begging the reformer never to give up. After twenty years of incessant struggle, it was enacted that the exportation of slaves from Africa should cease, but no relief was offered to those already in bondage. A quarter of a century later, as Wilberforce lay dying, messengers from Westminster entered his room to tell him that at last, at last, the Emancipation Bill had been passed the slaves were free. Thank God, exclaimed the dying man. Thank God that I have lived to see this day. Like Wolfe at Quebec, like Nelson at Trafalgar, like Sir John Franklin in the Northwest Passage, he died in the flush of triumph. He had resolved that, as an expression of his gratitude for his own deliverance, he would secure for the slaves their freedom. And he passed away rejoicing, that their fetters were all broken and gone. God be merciful to me, a sinner. This was his prayer in 1785, as his life lay all before him. God be merciful to me, a sinner. This was his prayer in 1833, as he lay a-dying with his life work done. William Wilberforce reminds me of William McClure. There were many saints in Drum Tachti, but there was no greater saint than old Dr. McClure. Rich and poor, young and old, the good doctor on his white pony had fought his way through the dark nights and the deep snowdrifts of the glen to help and heal them all. And now he is dying himself. Drumshoe sits beside the bed. The doctor asks him to read a bit. Drumshoe puts on his spectacles. Ma mither, he says, I wanted this read to her when she was fairly sick. And he begins to read. In my father's house are many mansions but the doctor stops him. It's a bonny word, he says, but it's no for the likes of me. And he makes him read the parable of the Pharisee and the publican till he comes to the words, God be merciful to me, a sinner. That might have been written for me, Drumshoe, or any other old sinner who has finished his life, and he has nothing to say for himself. Exactly so spoke William Wilberforce. Mr. Gurney quoted many great and comfortable scriptures, but the dying man shook his head. With regard to myself, he said, I have nothing whatever to urge but the poor publican's plea. God be merciful to me, a sinner. In what better company than in the company of William McClure and William Wilberforce can we enter the kingdom of God? End of chapter 18「Chapter Nineteen of A Bunch of Everlastings, or Text That Made History, by Frank W. Borum. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tim Bower. Chapter Nineteen, John Wesley's Text. John Wesley made history wholesale. You cannot cut him out of our national life, Mr. Augustine Burrell declares. If you could, the gap would be as painful as though you had overthrown the Nelson Column in Trafalgar Square, or gashed Mount Everest out of the Himalaya Ranges. 
Lecky, who is a past master in the art of analyzing great movements and in tracing the psychological influences from which they sprang, says that the conversion of John Wesley formed one of the great epics of English history. His conversion, mark you. Lecky goes on to say that the religious revolution began in England by the preaching of the Wesleys is of greater historic importance than all the splendid victories by land and sea won under Pitt. The momentous event to which the historian points, be it noted, is not Wesley's birth, but his rebirth. It is his conversion that counts. In order that I may scrutinize once more the record of that tremendous event in our national annals, I turn afresh to Wesley's journal. It was on May 24, 1738. Wesley was engaged in those days in a persistent and passionate quest. He had crossed the Atlantic as a missionary only to discover the waywardness and wickedness of his own evil heart. What have I learned? he asked himself when he finds himself once more on English soil. What have I learned? Why, I learned what I least of all suspected, that I, who went to America to convert the Indians, was never myself converted to God. One day, early in 1738, he is chatting with three of his friends when all at once they begin to speak of their faith. The faith that leads to pardon, the faith that links a man with God, the faith that brings joy and peace through believing. Wesley feels that he would give the last drop of his blood to secure for himself such an unspeakable treasure. Could such a faith be his? he asked his companions. They replied with one mouth that this faith was the gift, the free gift of God, and that he would surely bestow it upon every soul who earnestly and perseveringly sought it. Wesley made up his mind that, this being so, it should be his. I resolved to seek it unto the end, he says. I continued to seek it, he writes again, until May 24, 1738. And, on May 24, 1738, he found it. That Wednesday morning, before he went out, he opened his Bible haphazard, and a text leapt out at him. Thou art not very far from the kingdom of God. It strangely reassured him. The kingdom of God. Far from the kingdom of God. Not very far from the kingdom of God. How far? He was so near that that very evening he entered it. In the evening, he says, in the entry that has become one of the monuments of English literature, in the evening I went very unwillingly to a society in Aldersgate Street, where one was reading Luther's preface to the Epistle to the Romans. About a quarter before nine, while he was describing the change which God works in the heart through faith in Christ, I felt myself strangely warmed. I felt that I did trust in Christ, Christ alone, for salvation, and an assurance was given me that he had taken away my sins, even mine, and saved me from the laws of sin and death. Here is a sailor. He finds himself far, far from port, with no chart, no compass, no hope of ever reaching his desired haven. Later on, he shades his eyes with his hand and actually sees the bluff headlands that mark the entrance to the harbor. He is not very far from the city of his desire. And, later still, the bar crossed and the channel found. He finds himself lying at anchor in the bay. So it was with John Wesley. When he returned from Georgia, he was far, very far from the kingdom of God. When he opened his Bible that Wednesday morning, he was not very far from the kingdom of God. And that same evening at Aldersgate Street, he passed through the gates into the light and liberty of the kingdom. So far from the kingdom of God, not far from the kingdom of God, the kingdom, the kingdom, the kingdom of God. It is a beautiful thing to have been brought near to the kingdom of God. Many influences combined to bring John Wesley near. To begin with, he had a mother, one of the most amazing mothers that even England, the land of noble mothers, has produced. Susanna Wesley was a marvel of nature and a miracle of grace. To begin with, she was the twenty-fifth child of her father, and to go on with, she had nineteen children of her own, and she found time for each of them. In one of her letters she tells how deeply impressed she was on reading the story of the evangelistic efforts of the Danish missionaries in India. It came upon my mind, she says, that I might do more than I do. I resolved to begin with my own children. 
I take such proportion of time as I can best spare to discourse every night with each child by itself. Later on, people began to marvel at her remarkable influence over her children. There is no mystery about the matter, she writes again. I just took Molly alone with me into my room every Monday night, Hetty every Tuesday night, Nancy every Wednesday night, Jackie every Thursday night, and so on, all through the week. That was all. Yes, that was all. But see how it turned out? I cannot remember, says John Wesley. I cannot remember ever having kept back a doubt from my mother. She was the one heart to whom I went in absolute confidence, from my babyhood until the day of her death. Such an influence could only tend to bring him near to the kingdom of God. Then there was the fire. John never forgot that terrible night. He was only six. He woke up to find the old rectory ablaze from the ground to the roof. By some extraordinary oversight, he had been forgotten when everybody else was dragged from the burning building. In the nick of time, just before the roof fell in with a crash, a neighbor, by climbing on another man's shoulders, contrived to rescue the terrified child at the window. To the last day of his life, Wesley preserved a crude picture of the scene, and underneath it was written, Is not this a brand plucked from the burning? It affected him as a somewhat similar escape affected Clive. Surely God intends to do some great thing by me that he so miraculously preserved me, exclaimed the man who afterwards added India to the British Empire. When a young fellow of eighteen, Richard Baxter was thrown by a restive horse under the wheel of a heavy wagon. Quite unaccountably, the horse instantly stopped. My life was miraculously saved, he wrote and I then and there resolved that it should be spent in the service of others. Dr. Guthrie regarded as one of the potent spiritual influences of his life, his marvelous deliverance from being dashed to pieces over a precipice at Arbroath. In his grace abounding, Bunyan tells how he was affected by the circumstance that the man who took his place at the siege of Leicester was shot through the head whilst on sentry duty and killed instantly. Such experiences tend to bring men within the sight of the kingdom of God. Wesley never forgot the fire. It is a great thing to recognize that though near to the kingdom of God, one is still outside. Sir James Simpson, the discoverer of chloroform, used to say that the greatest discovery that he ever made was the discovery that he was a sinner and that Jesus Christ was just the Savior he needed. John Wesley could have said the same. But whereas Sir James Simpson was able to point to the exact date on which the scene of his need broke upon him, John Wesley is not so explicit. He tells us that it was in Georgia that he discovered that he, the would-be converter of Indians, was himself unconverted. And yet, before he left England, he wrote to a friend that his chief motive in going abroad was the salvation of his own soul. As soon as he arrived on the other side of the Atlantic, he made the acquaintance of August Spangenberg, a Moravian pastor. A conversation took place, which Wesley records in his journal as having deeply impressed him. My brother, said the devout and simple-minded man whose counsel he had sought, I must ask you a question or two. Do you know Jesus Christ? I know, replied Wesley, and after an awkward pause, I know that he is the Savior of the world. True answered the Moravian, but do you know that he has saved you? I hope that he has died to save me, Wesley responded. The Moravian was evidently dissatisfied with these vague replies, but he asked one more question. Do you know yourself? I said that I did, Wesley tells us in his journal, but I fear that they were vain words. He saw others happy, fearless in the presence of death, rejoicing in a faith that seemed to transfigure their lives. What was it that was theirs, and yet not his? Are they read in philosophy? he asked. So was I. In ancient or modern tongues? So was I also. Are they versed in the science of divinity? I, too, have studied it many years. Can they talk fluently upon spiritual things? I could do the same. Are they plenteous in alms? Behold, I give all my goods to feed the poor. I have labored more abundantly than they all. Are they willing to suffer for their brethren? I have thrown up my friends, reputation, ease, country. I have put my life in my hand, wandering into strange lands, 
I have given my body to be devoured by the deep, parched up with heat, consumed by toil and weariness. But does all this make me acceptable to God? Does all this make me a Christian? By no means. I have sinned and come short of the glory of God. I am alienated from the life of God. I am a child of wrath. I have no hope. It is a great thing, I say, for a man who has been brought within sight of the kingdom to recognize, frankly, that he is nevertheless still outside it. It is a fine thing for a man who feels that he is outside the kingdom to enter into it. In his Cheap Side to Arcaday, Mr. Arthur Scammell describes a pathetic figure he often saw in a London slum. He had crept forth from some poor house hard by, and propped up by a crutch, was sitting on the edge of a low wall in the unclean, sunless alley, whilst only a few yards further on was a pleasant open park, with sunshine, trees, and flowers, the river, and fresh air, and withal, a more comfortable seat. But the poor old man never even looked that way. I have often seen him since, always in the same place, and felt that I should like to ask him why he sits there in darkness, breathing foul air, when the blessed sunshine is waiting for him only ten yards off, so near to the sunshine, so near to the kingdom. Unlike Mr. Scammell's old man, John Wesley made the transition from shadow to sunshine, from squalor to song. Dost thou believe? asked Stalpitz, the wise old monk. Dost thou believe in the forgiveness of sins? I believe, replied Luther, reciting a clause from a familiar credo. I believe in the forgiveness of sins. Ah, exclaimed the elder monk, but you must not only believe in the forgiveness of David's sin and Peter's sins, for this even the devils believe. It is God's command that we believe our own sins are forgiven us. From that moment, says Daubin, light sprang up in the heart of the young monk at Erfurt. I believe, says Luther, that my sins, even mine, were forgiven me. I did trust in Christ, Christ alone, for salvation, says Wesley, in his historic record and an assurance was given me that he had taken away my sins, even mine. The analogy is suggested by the circumstance that it was Luther's commentary that was being read aloud at Aldersgate Street that night. My sins, even mine, says Luther. My sins, even mine, says Wesley. Forty-five years afterwards, Mr. Wesley was taken very ill at Bristol and expected to die. Calling Mr. Bradford to his side, he observed, I have been reflecting on my past life. I have been wandering up and down these many years, endeavoring in my poor way to do a little good to my fellow creatures. And now it is probable that there is but a step between me and death. And what have I to trust to for salvation? I can see nothing which I have done or suffered that will bear looking at. I have no other plea than this. I, the chief of sinners, am, but Jesus died for me. Eight years later, fifty-three years after the great change at Aldersgate Street, he was actually dying. As his friends surround his bedside, he told them that he had no more to say. I said at Bristol, he murmured, that, I, the chief of sinners, am, but Jesus died for me. Is that, one asked, the present language of your heart? do you feel now as you did then? I do, replied the dying veteran. This then was the burden of Wesley's tremendous ministry for more than fifty-three years. It was the confidence of his life and the comfort of his death. It was his first thought every morning and his last every night. It was the song of his soul, the breath of his nostrils, the light of his eyes. This was the gospel that transfigured his own experience and this was the gospel by which he changed the face of England. John Wesley, says Mr. Burrell, paid more turnpikes than any man who bestrode a beast. Eight thousand miles was his annual record for many a long year, during each of which he seldom preached less frequently than a thousand times. No man ever lived nearer the center than John Wesley, neither Clive nor Pitt nor Johnson. No single figure influenced so many minds, no single voice touched so many hearts. 
No other man did such a life's work for England. The eighteenth century, says President Wilson, cried out for deliverance and light, and God prepared John Wesley to show the world the might and the blessing of his salvation. The pity of it is that John Wesley was thirty-five years when he entered the kingdom. The zest and vigor of his early manhood had passed. He was late in finding mercy, thirty-five. Before they reached that age, men like Murray McSheen, Henry Martin, and David Brainerd had finished their life work and fallen into honored graves. Why was Wesley's great day so long in coming? He always felt that the fault was not altogether his own. He groped in the dark for many years, and nobody helped him, not even his ministers. William Law was one of those ministers, and Wesley afterwards wrote him on the subject. How will you answer to our common Lord, he asks, that you, sir, never led me into the light? Why did I scarcely ever hear you name the name of Christ? Why did you never urge me to faith in his blood? Is not Christ the first and the last? If you say that you thought I had faith already, verily, you knew nothing of me. I beseech you, sir, by the mercies of God, to consider whether the true reason you never pressed this salvation upon me was not this, that you never had it yourself. Here is a letter for a man like Wesley to write to a man like Law. Many a minister has since read that letter on his knees and prayed that he may never deserve to receive so terrible a reprimand. End of chapter 19Chapter 20 of A Bunch of Everlastings, or Texts That Made History, by Frank W. Borum. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tim Bauer. Chapter 20. William Nibbs' Text. Could anything be more perfectly beautiful, more wonderfully fair? Far as the eye can reach in every direction, the eye is charmed and captivated by the loveliness of the landscape. As we pace the deck of the steamer as she rides at anchor in the bay, we turn from one prospect to another, uncertain as to which of them all is the most delightful. In the background, the blue mountains stand out in sturdy and rugged grandeur against the deep blue sky. Even at this distance, we get hints of the glorious forests that clothe those graceful slopes, and of the thickly wooded valleys that divide range from range, what a playground for the countless troops of monkeys! What a paradise for the flock of gorgeously colored birds! Their gay plumage flashes like flames of fire amidst this riot of gigantic forestry. Nearer to the coast are the vast plains which, built up in the course of ages by tiny coral insects, now wave with their flourishing plantations and abounding fruitage. For the island is as fertile as it is fair as rich as it is radiant. Coffee and sugar and arrowroot, orange and lemon and grape, cinnamon, banana, and pineapple. This oval beauty spot in sun-bathed tropical seas is a congenial garden for them all. Even the ocean that caresses the island seems to feel that it must assume a beauty in keeping with the loveliness of the land its waters lave. The masses of brilliant coral immediately beneath the surface impart to the shining waters a sheen of sapphire tints such as the sea but rarely boasts. I have spent many years, says a modern traveler, in voyage from shore to shore, but I know of no spot under heaven where the land is so luxuriously beautiful and the ocean so extravagantly blue. This, then, is Jamaica. Could anything be more abominable, more repulsively hideous? Life in this scene of enchantment was the life, not of paradise, but of perdition. From these fruitful plains and flowery valleys there rose to heaven not the song of praise, but a scream of intolerable anguish. For Jamaica was the abode of slavery. All day long the men must work, and all day long the women must weep. But the men will derive no satisfaction from their labor, and the women will find no comfort in their tears. They are not their own, these people, far less are they each other's. There is no such thing as marriage among these ebony-skinned, thick-lipped, woolly-haired creatures, and any unions that they form among themselves 
are subject to the exigencies of future sales. These little children in which the missionaries interest themselves, children with roguish eyes and laughing faces, have been bred for the market, and they will be sold as soon as their limbs are set. Young men and maidens are pretty much the same all the world over. You may see a good deal of furtive love-making on an evening among the plantations, but in each lover's heart there is a dagger that Cupid never shot. For as the stalwart youth sees his dusky sweetheart grow more shapely and more charming, he trembles lest her beauty should catch the eye of the overseer and result in her being sold into a life that is worse than a thousand deaths. The best that he can hope for is that he and she may be permitted to live together for a few years in some little hut among the bushes and produce children for sale at the monthly market. And if any slave dares to lift his hand, or even his voice in rebellion or resentment, there are the treadmill and the lash and the knife. The only thing that stands between the black man and a cruel death is his market value on the plantation or at the auction block. Like the asp that Cleopatra concealed among the lilies, this hideous evil cried to heaven from among the beauteous fields and forests of Jamaica. Did heaven hear such piercing cries? Or even if heaven heard, how could heaven help? We shall see, but in order to see we must recross the Atlantic. And here, in a narrow street in Bristol, is a printer's shop. The name over the door, comparatively freshly painted, is the name J. G. Fuller. In the printing room, behind the shop, are a couple of apprentice boys. They are brothers, Thomas and William Nibb. Mr. Fuller is the son of the Reverend Andrew Fuller of Keetering, one of the founders of the modern missionary movement. He has only recently come to Bristol, hence the newly painted name, and he brought the two Nibs, Keetering boys, with him. Mr. Fuller, with the impress of his father's noble character strongly upon him, at once associates himself with the Broadmead Church and Sunday School. After a while, the two apprentices, with the impress of their employer's character strongly upon them, associate themselves with the same church and take classes in the same Sunday School. It is a fine thing when a man's piety is of such an order that the youths in his workroom say among themselves, His religion shall be my religion, and his God my God. In due time, Mr. Fuller became the superintendent of the Sunday school, and made it his practice to deliver a short address before closing the school. It was one of those addresses that made history. I have heard of a man aiming at a pigeon and killing a crow, but I know of no instance in which that remarkable feat was performed on such a splendid scale as in the conversion of William Nibb. One Sunday afternoon, before dismissing the children, Mr. Fuller spoke for a few moments from the text. Wilt thou not from this time cry unto me, my father, thou art the guide of my youth? Mr. Fuller aimed at the scholars, but his words smote the conscience and won the hearts of a teacher, and that teacher one of his own apprentices. It was a most earnest and affectionate address, wrote William Nibb shortly afterwards, and, under the divine blessing, it made a deep, and I trust, lasting impression on my mind and I hope that I was enabled to cast myself at the foot of the cross as a perishing sinner, pleading for mercy for the sake of Jesus Christ and for his sake alone. A day or two later the youth sought an interview with his employer. I felt ashamed, said Nib, in the course of his conversation with Mr. Fuller. I felt ashamed, being a teacher, that the address should be as suitable to me as to the children. I felt conscious that I had wandered as far from God as ever they had, and that I needed a forgiving father and a constant guide as much as they did. I was overwhelmed. I felt such a mixture of shame and grief, of hope and love, as I had never before and cannot now describe. I could not join in the closing hymn. I went to my room above and yielded to my feelings. I wept bitterly and prayed as I had never prayed before. I turned the text itself into a prayer. My father, I cried to God, Wilt thou not from this time be the guide of my youth? The Lord heard my prayer and enabled me to give him my heart, and now it is my earnest desire to yield myself to his guidance as long as I live. I need a forgiving father. I need a constant guide. My father, wilt not thou be the guide of my youth? The Lord heard my prayer, the apprentice says exultingly, as he looks gratefully into his employer's face. 
and when the Lord heard that prayer, he heard the bitter cry of the island whose fair shores we just now visited. For the salvation of William Nibb was the deliverance of the slaves across the seas. And it was not William Nibb, but Thomas, who was most concerned about the lands that lay in darkness. In setting up some copy that had come into the printing room, the elder of the two apprentices had been startled by the crying needs of the heathen world. He longed to be a missionary, when, one day, somebody referred to the successes being achieved by native preachers. Thomas burst into tears. His younger brother asked him why he wept. I am greatly afraid, Thomas replied, that since the native preachers are so successful, no more white missionaries will be needed, and I shall have no part in the evangelization of the world. His fears, however, were groundless. He became a missionary, was designated for Jamaica, arrived there in January 1823, and died of malaria just three months later. It was a dark day for the younger brother when the heavy tidings reached England. But he met the crisis, his biographer tells us, with characteristic firmness and promptitude. When the news of his brother's death was communicated to him by Mr. Fuller, his feelings were strongly excited, and he wept bitterly. But as soon as the first gush of emotion had subsided, he rose from the table and said, Then, if the society will accept me, I'll go and take his place. A forgiving father, a constant guide. My father, wilt not thou be the guide of my youth? In the cry of an enslaved people, fortified and intensified by the cry of his brother's grave, William Nibb recognized the leading of the kindly light. The guide of his youth was pointing the way, and he bravely followed the gleam. My father, he cried on that never-to-be-forgotten Sunday afternoon, wilt not thou be the guide of my youth? And not once, through all the eventful years that followed, did that clear guidance fail him. He went out to Jamaica to preach the gospel, but he soon came to feel as Livingstone felt on the other side of the Atlantic a few years afterwards, that the work of evangelization and the work of emancipation are inseparable. Christianity could make no terms with slavery. Little by little he was led, by the invisible guide whose beckoning hand he had pledged himself to follow, into a work that he had never for a moment anticipated. The sights that he witnessed sickened him. They became the ceaseless torture of his soul. He felt that no sacrifice would be too great if only he could strike the shackles from the limbs of the slaves. And he made terrific sacrifices. The guidance that he had so passionately sought rarely led him into green pastures or beside still waters. It led him, rather, into terrible privations, relentless persecution, and desolating bereavements. In that fever-laden climate, he, one by one, buried his children almost as soon as they were born. One, the boy whom he named after himself, was spared to see his twelfth birthday, but the others were lowered as babes into his brother's grave. From one of these heart-rending burials after another, he turned sadly away. The father's soul within him longed for a life in a land in which his little ones could live, but the reformer soul within him determined never to leave the island till all the slaves were free. On more than one occasion he was charged with rebellion, handcuffed and dragged about the island, his persecutors heaping upon him every form of indignity that could be calculated to degrade him in the eyes of the slaves. The churches that he had erected at such cost, and in which he had taken such pride, were burned down by the slave owners before his very eyes. He was spared no humiliation that could tend to his embarrassment and discomfiture. He visited England in order that he might stir his fellow countrymen to righteous indignation. The whole country was moved by the passion and the pathos of those tremendous appeals. If I fail in arousing the sympathy of England, he cried, I will go back to Jamaica and call upon him who hath made of one blood all nations upon the earth. And if I die without beholding the emancipation of my brethren and sisters in Christ, then, if prayer is permitted in heaven, I will fall at the feet of the Eternal, crying, Lord, open the eyes of the Christians in England to see the evil of slavery and to banish it from the earth. But the people heard, and the Parliament heard, and the prayer of his passionate heart was granted him. Wilt thou not be the guide of my youth? he cried. 
and the guide led to the goal. As a result of Mr. Nibbs' tireless activities, the slaves were freed. Their emancipation came into force at midnight on July 31, 1838. And what is this? As the historic hour draws near, the exultant slaves gather in their thousands at the church. During the evening, hymns are sung. The excited blacks join in the praise with a zest that even they have never shown before. As the night deepens, the emotions become more intense. As the hand of the clock approaches the midnight hour, Mr. Nibb, standing in the pulpit, shouts, The monster is dying! As the clock begins to strike, he cries again, The monster is dying! And when the hour was fully struck, he proclaims, The monster is dead! The scene is indescribable. Never, wrote Nib, was heard such a sound. The winds of freedom appeared to have been let loose. The very building shook at the strange yet sacred joy. Oh, had my boy, my lovely freedom-loving boy, been there! Alas, he is sleeping undisturbed in the churchyard, nor can the sweet sounds he so much loved awake him from his rest. In passionate longing to have at least one of his children associated with that glad historic event, Mr. Nibb slips across to his home, draws his twelve-month-old baby from his cot, at midnight though it is, returns with the child in his arms, and holds him proudly up before the shouting, clapping, singing multitude. In the early gray of the morning, a most remarkable burial takes place in the churchyard. One might almost say, in the words of Mrs. Alexander, that was the grandest funeral that ever passed on earth. Many of the slaves were skilled cabinet makers. They have prepared a most exquisitely carved and polished coffin, and have dug a deep, deep grave. Into the coffin they throw the slave chain, a slave whip, a slave hat, and an iron collar, all the insignia of their degradation. The great crowd of grateful freemen gathers round the open grave, and a solemn funeral service is held. At the proper moment, the coffin is lowered into the yawning grave, the multitude singing exultingly, Now slavery, we laid thy vile form in the dust, and buried forever, there let it remain, and rotted, and covered with infamy's rust, be every man whip and fetter and chain. The land rings with doxologies. The beauteous island is delivered from the hideous curse. The guide has led to the goal. The chains are shattered, the slaves are free. Among the people whom he loved so well, the people whom he had emancipated and evangelized, Nib died a few years later. He was only forty-two when he passed away. I am not afraid to die, he said. The blood of Jesus Christ cleanseth from all sin, both of omission and commission. That blood is my only trust. And, just as the gentle spirit was about to take its flight, he reached out his hand to Mrs. Nib and murmured, Mary, it's all right. All is well. My father, he cried at the dawn of his career. My father, will not thou be the guide of my youth? It is all right. All is well, he murmured in the last moments of his life. The guide had led to the goal. Under sure, safe, skillful pilotage, the ship had made a good voyage, and had come straight to port. William Nibb had cast his anchor within the veil. It is all right, all is well. Such is the final gladness of all who follow faithfully the kindly light. End of chapter 20。Chapter 21 of A Bunch of Everlastings, or Texts That Made History by Frank W. Borum. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tim Bauer. Chapter 21. John Newton's Text. John Newton was plagued with a terribly treacherous memory. In his youth it had betrayed and nearly ruined him. How could he ever trust it again? You must know, said Great Heart to Christiana's boys, you must know that Forgetful Green is the most dangerous place in all these parts. John Newton understood, better than any man who ever lived, exactly what Great Heart meant. Poor John Newton nearly lost his soul on Forgetful Green. 
His autobiography is filled with the sad, sad story of his forgettings. I forgot, he says again and again and again. I forgot. I soon forgot. This, too, I totally forgot. The words occur repeatedly. And so it came to pass that when, after many wild and desolate years, he left the sea and entered the Christian ministry, he printed a certain text in bold letters and fastened it right across the wall over his study mantelpiece. Thou shalt remember that thou wast a bondman in the land of Egypt, and the Lord thy God remembered thee. A photograph of that mantelpiece lies before me as I write. There, clearly enough, hangs John Newton's text. Inside of it he prepared every sermon. In this respect, John Newton resembled Thomas Goodwin. When, says that sturdy Puritan in a letter to his son, when I was threatening to become cold in my ministry, and when I felt Sabbath morning coming and my heart not filled with the amazement at the grace of God, or when I was making ready to dispense the Lord's Supper, do you know what I used to do? I used to take a turn up and down among the sins of my past life, and I always came down again with a broken and contrite heart, ready to preach, as it was preached in the beginning, the forgiveness of sins. I do not think, he says again, I ever went up the pulpit stair that I did not stop for a moment at the foot of it and take a turn up and down among the sins of my past years. I do not think that I ever planned a sermon that I did not take a turn round my study table and look back at the sins of my youth and of all my life down to the present. And many a Sabbath morning, when my soul had been cold and dry for the lack of prayer during the week, a turn up and down in my past life before I went into the pulpit always broke my heart and made me close with the gospel for my own soul before I began to preach. Like this predecessor of his, Newton felt that, in his pulpit preparation, he must keep his black, black past ever vividly before his eyes. I forgot. I soon forgot. This, too, I totally forgot. Thou shalt remember, remember, remember. Thou shalt remember that thou wast a bondman in the land of Egypt, and that the Lord thy God redeemed thee, a bondman. Thou shalt remember that thou wast a bondman. The words were literally true. For some time Newton was a slave trader, but worse still, for some time he was a slave. Newton's conversion deserves to be treasured among the priceless archives of the Christian Church because of the amazing transformation it effected. It seems incredible that an Englishman could fall as low as he did. As Professor Goldwyn Smith says, he was a brand plucked from the very heart of the burning, losing his mother, the one clear guiding star of his early life, when he was seven. He went to sea when he was eleven. I went to Africa, he tells us, that I might be free to sin to my heart's content. During the next few years his soul was seared by the most revolting and barbarous of all human experiences. He endured the extreme barbarities of a life before the mast. He fell into the pitiless clutches of the press gang. As a deserter from the navy, he was flogged until the blood streamed down his back and he became involved in the unspeakable atrocities of the African slave trade, and then, going from bad to worse, he actually became a slave himself. The slave of a slave. He was sold to a negress who, glorying in her power over him, made him depend for his food on the crust that she tossed under her table. He could show no lower depth of abject degradation. In the years after, he could never recall this phase of his experience without a shudder. As he says in the epitaph that he composed for himself, he was the slave of slaves. A bondman, a slave of slaves, a bondman of bondmen. Thou shalt remember that thou wast a bondman. How could he ever forget? How, I say, could he ever forget? And yet he had forgotten other things scarcely less notable. As a boy, he was thrown from a horse and nearly killed. Looking death in the face in this abrupt and untimely way, a deep impression was made. But, he says, I soon forgot. Some years later, he made an appointment with some companions to visit a man of war. They were to meet at the waterside at a certain time and row out to the battleship. But the unexpected happened. Newton was detained. His companions left without him. The boat was upset, and they were drowned. 
I went to the funeral, Newton says, and was exceedingly affected. But this also I soon forgot. Then came a remarkable dream. Really he was lying in his hammock in the forecastle of a ship, homeward bound from Italy. But in his fancy he was back at Venice. It was midnight. The ship, he thought, was riding at anchor, and it was his watch on deck. As, beneath a clear Italian sky, he paced to and fro across the silent vessel, a stranger suddenly approached him. This mysterious visitant gave him a beautiful ring. As long as you keep it, he said, you will be happy and successful. But if you lose it, you will know nothing but trouble and misery. The stranger vanished. Shortly after, a second stranger appeared on deck. The newcomer pointed to the ring. Throw it away, he cried. Throw it away. Newton was horrified at the proposal, but he listened to the arguments of the stranger and at length consented. Going to the side of the ship, he flung the ring into the sea. Instantly the land seemed ablaze with a range of volcanoes in fierce eruption, and he understood that all those terrible flames had been lit for his destruction. The second stranger vanished, and shortly after the first returned. Newton fell at his feet and confessed everything. The stranger entered the water and regained the ring. Give it me, Newton cried, in impassionate entreat. Give it me. No, replied the stranger. You have shown that you are unable to keep it. I will preserve it for you, and when you need it, I will produce it on your behalf. This dream, says Newton, made a very great impression. But the impression soon wore off, and, in a little time, I totally forgot it. I forgot. This, too, I soon forgot. In a little time, I totally forgot. So treacherous a thing was Newton's memory. Is it any wonder that he suspected it, distrusted it, feared it? Is it any wonder that right across his study wall he wrote that text? Thou shalt remember. Thou shalt remember that thou wast a bondman. Thou shalt remember that thou wast a bondman, and that the Lord thy God redeemed thee. Thou shalt remember that thou wast a bondman. Thou shalt remember that the Lord thy God redeemed thee. But how? Was the work of grace in John Newton's soul a sudden or a gradual one? It is difficult to say, and it is always difficult to say. The birth of the body is a very sudden and yet a very gradual affair. So also is the birth of the soul. To say that John Newton was suddenly converted would be to ignore those gentle and gracious influences by which two good women, his mother and his sweetheart, led him steadily heavenwards. I was born, Newton himself tells us, in a home of godliness and dedicated to God in my infancy. I was my mother's only child, and almost her whole employment was the care of my education. Every day of her life she prayed with him, as well as for him and every day she sought to store his mind with those majestic and gracious words that, once memorized, can never be altogether shaken from the mind. It was the grief of her deathbed that she was leaving her boy, a little fellow of seven, at the mercy of a rough world. But she had sown the seed faithfully, and she hoped for a golden harvest. Some years later John Newton fell in love with Mary Catlett. She was only thirteen, the age of Shakespeare's Juliet. But his passion was no passing fancy. His affection for her, says Professor Goldwin Smith, was as constant as it was romantic. His father frowned on the engagement, and he became estranged from home. But through all his wanderings and sufferings, he never ceased to think of her, and after seven years she became his wife. The Bishop of Durham, in a centennial sermon, declares that Newton's pure and passionate devotion to this simple and sensible young girl was the one merciful anchor that saved him from final self-abandonment. Say that Newton's conversion was sudden, therefore, and you do a grave injustice to the memory of two women whose fragrant influence should never be forgotten. And yet it was sudden, so sudden that Newton could tell the exact date and name the exact place. It took place on the 10th of March, 1748, on board a ship that was threatening to founder in the grip of a storm. That 10th of March, says Newton, is a day much to be remembered by me, and I have never suffered it to pass unnoticed since the year 1748. For on that day, March 10, 1748, 
the Lord came from on high and delivered me out of deep waters. The storm was terrific. When the ship went plunging down into the trough of the seas, few on board expected her to come up again. The hold was rapidly filling with water. As Newton hurried to his place at the pumps, he said to the captain, If this will not do, the Lord have mercy upon us. His own words startled him. Mercy, he said to himself in astonishment. Mercy, mercy. What mercy can there be for me? This was the first desire I had breathed for mercy for many years. About six in the evening the hold was free from water, and then came a gleam of hope. I thought I saw the hand of God displayed in our favor. I began to pray. I could not utter the prayer of faith. I could not draw near to a reconciled God and call him Father. My prayer for mercy was like the cry of the ravens, which yet the Lord Jesus does not disdain to hear. In the Gospel, says Newton, in concluding the story of his conversion, in the Gospel I saw at least a peradventure of hope, but on every other side I was surrounded with black, unfathomable despair. On that peradventure of hope Newton staked everything. On the 10th of March, 1748, he sought mercy and found it. He was then 23. Years afterward, when he entered the Christian ministry, John Newton began making history. He made it well. His hand is on the nation still. He changed the face of England. He began with the church. In his History of the Church of England, Wakeman gives us a sordid and terrible picture of the church as Newton found it. The church was in the grip of the political bishop, the fox-hunting parson, and the utterly worldly and materialistic laity. Spiritual leadership was unknown. John Newton and a few kindred spirits, the first generation of the clergy called evangelical, became, to use Sir James Stevenson's famous phrase, the second founders of the Church of England. There is scarcely a land beneath the sun that has been unaffected by Newton's influence. As one of the founders of the Church Missionary Society, he laid his hand upon all our continents and islands. Through the personalities of his converts, too, he wielded a power that is impossible to compute. Take two by way of illustration. Newton was the means of the conversion of Claudius Buchanan and Thomas Scott. In due time Buchanan carried the gospel to the East Indies, and wrote a book which led Adoniram Judson to undertake his historic mission to Burma. Scott became one of the most powerful writers of his time, and, indeed of all time, has not Cardinal Newman confessed that it was Scott's treatment of the doctrine of the Trinity that preserved his faith in one of the crises of his soul from total shipwreck? And what ought to be said of Newton's influence on men like Wilberforce and Cooper, Thornton and Venn? One of our greatest literary critics has affirmed that the friendship of Newton saved the intellect of Cooper. If, said Prebonary H. E. Fox, not long ago, if Cooper had never met Newton, the beautiful hymns of the Olney Collection, and that noble poem, The Task, nearest to Milton in English verse, would never have been written. Moreover, there are Newton's own hymns. Wherever to this day congregations join in singing, How sweet the name of Jesus sounds, or glorious things of thee are spoken, or one there is above all others, or amazing grace how sweet the sound there john newton is still at his old task still making history and all the time the text hung over the fireplace thou shalt remember thou shalt remember that thou wast a bondman thou shalt remember that the lord thy god redeemed thee from that time forth newton's treacherous memory troubled him no more he never again forgot he never could he said that when, from the hold of that sinking ship, he cried for mercy, it seemed to him that the Savior looked into his very soul. Sure, never to my latest breath can I forget that look. It seemed to charge me with his death, though not a word he spoke. I forgot, I soon forgot. This too I totally forgot. Thou shalt remember that the Lord thy God redeemed thee. Never till my latest breath can I forget that look. The Rev. Richard Cecil, M.A., who afterwards became his biographer, noticing that Newton was beginning to show signs of age, urged him one day to stop preaching and take life easily. What? he replied. 
Shall the old African blasphemer stop while he can speak at all? He could not forget, and he was determined that nobody else should, in order that future generations might know that he was a bondman and that he had been redeemed. He wrote his own epitaph and expressly directed that this, this and no other, should be erected for him. John Newton, clerk, once an infidel and a libertine, a servant of slaves in Africa, was, by the mercy of our Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ, preserved, restored, pardoned, and appointed to preach the faith that he had so long laboured to destroy. No, that treacherous memory of his never betrayed him again. When he was an old, old man, very near the close of his pilgrimage, William J. of Bath one day met him in the street. Newton complained that his powers were failing fast. My memory, he says, is nearly gone. But I remember two things, that I am a great sinner and that Christ is a great Savior. Thou shalt remember that thou wast a bondman in the land of Egypt, and that the Lord thy God redeemed thee. That was John Newton's text. My memory is nearly gone, but I remember two things, that I am a great sinner and that Christ is a great Savior. That was John Newton's testimony. I forgot. I soon forgot. This, too, I totally forgot. Thou shalt remember, remember, remember. Newton liked to think that the memory that had once so basely betrayed him, the memory that in later years he had so sternly and perfectly disciplined, would serve him still more delightfully in the life beyond. Cooper died a few years before his friend, and Newton liked to picture to himself their reunion in heaven. He wrote a poem in which he represented himself as grasping Cooper's hand and rapturously addressing him. Oh, let thy memory wake, I told thee so. I told thee thus would end thy heaviest woe. I told thee that thy God would bring thee here, and God's old hand would wipe away thy tear. While I should claim a mission by thy side, I told thee so, for our Emmanuel died. Oh, let thy memory wake. I forgot, I soon forgot. This too I totally forgot. Thou shalt remember that the Lord thy God redeemed thee. Newton felt certain that the joyous recollection of that infinite redemption would be the loftiest bliss of the life that is to be. End of chapter 21「Of a Bunch of Everlastings, or Texts that Made History, by Frank W. Borum. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tim Bauer. Chapter 22. Andrew Fuller's Text. The Magic Music. What is the magic music? Ever since the world began, poets have let their truant fancies play about it, but none of them have told us what it is. They have sung to us of the bells that peal under the sea, of the songs that are heard in the storm, of the sirens that sing on the shore. They have told us of cities that mysteriously rose to the strains of the lyre of Orpheus, and they have told us of cities rendered desolate by the fatal lure of the piper's lute. But none of them have described those resistless strains, those bewitching harmonies, that magic and marvelous music. What is it? We must try to find out. Right away down among the swamps of the Red River District, Three slaves sit huddled together at the close of a cruel and exhausting day. Two of them are women. The third is Uncle Tom. Seeing that they are too tired to grind their corn, Tom has ground it for them. And touched by such uncommon sympathy, they have baked his cake for him. Tom sits down by the light of the fire and draws out his Bible, for he has need of comfort. What's that? says one of the women. A Bible, Tom answers. Laws of me! And what's that? Read a piece anyway, exclaimed the woman, curiously seeing Tom poring so attentively over it. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Them's good words, exclaimed the astonished woman. Who says em? And beginning with those good words, Tom tells her the story of Jesus. But let us change the scene. We are at the Isle of Wight, and here... In the lovely little church at Newport is the memorial that Queen Victoria erected to the memory of the Princess Elizabeth. It is by Mara Chetty, and represents, as Mr. William Canton says, one of the most touching scenes that a sculptor has ever put into marble. 
it is the figure of a fair young girl in the quaintly pretty dress of the stuart days her eyes are closed her lips are parted with the last faint sigh one arm is laid upon her waist the other has fallen by her side with the little hand half open it will never hold anything her left cheek is resting upon an open bible and her long ringlets are scattered across the page but you can read the verse come unto me all ye that labor and are heavy laden and i will give you rest let us change the scene again we are at hippo in northern africa it is the fifth century augustine bends over his desk let us glance over his shoulder what is it that he is writing i have read in plato and in cicero he says many sayings that are very wise and very beautiful but i never read in either of them such words as these come unto me all ye that labor and are heavy laden and i will give you rest those are good words says the slave woman as she listens in astonishment to the reading of uncle tom those are good words says queen victoria as she selects them for inclusion in the sculptor's masterpiece those are good words says augustine as he contrasts them with the wealthiest treasures of heathen minds here then are words that could pour new hope into the empty heart of a despairing slave words that could minister consolation and delight to the soul of the world's mightiest sovereign words that could ravish the mind of an old world scholar and saint here if anywhere we have found the magic music come unto me all ye that labor and are heavy laden and i will give you rest a slave's text a queen's text a bishop's text and andrew fuller's text andrew fuller made history in several ways to begin at the beginning he made history by means of his exquisitely beautiful life at home one of his sons andrew g fuller of wolverhampton wrote in his old age a biography of his father there are several such works already in existence but in reading them the second andrew fuller felt that none of them had touched the real secret of his father's influence and power he therefore took his pen when nearly eighty years of age and wrote his book as a filial tribute to the loveliness the unselfishness and the nobleness of his father's life in the home another of andrew fuller's sons mr j g fuller set up we have seen as a printer at bristol he engaged as his apprentice a young fellow named william nibb moved by his father's spirit the master was soon the means of his assistant's conversion having been led to the saviour by mr fuller william nibb became the great evangelist of the west indies and the historic deliverer of the slaves when the glad shout of the emancipated blacks echoed through the world nobody thought of andrew fuller yet to andrew fuller's influence that joyous event was directly traceable andrew fuller made history by means of one of the most scrupulously conscious ministries that we have on record one illustration must suffice as a young man of six-and-twenty he was minister of the little church at soham the membership of the church was less than forty his salary was fifteen pounds a year and he was far from being happy the congregation was sharply divided on acute doctrinal questions several of the leading members treated him with coldness and some with bitterness and every sermon that he preached was subjected to the most pitiless criticism at this juncture he was called to the important charge at kettering the invitation assured him a much larger congregation a much larger salary and absolute unanimity yet for two years he hesitated as to the course that he ought to pursue it seemed to him that the souls of the people at soham had been committed to his care and how could he give account of them in the day of judgment if he lightly forsook them the very troubles of the church made it more difficult for his conscience to consent to its abandonment as dr ryland has remarked many men would risk the fate of an empire with fewer searchings of heart than it cost andrew fuller to determine whether he should leave a little dissenting church of less than forty members but that was the man and in that spirit he lived and labored to the end of his days but most memorable of all andrew fuller made history as one of our great missionary pioneers when as it has been finely said when it pleased god to awaken from her slumber the drowsy and lethargic church there rang out from the belfry of the ages a clamorous and insistent alarm and in that arousing hour the hand upon the bell-rope was the hand of william carey yes carey's hand was the hand that grasped the rope but fuller stood beside him when he did it 
they were partners in the greatest of all human enterprises when carey preached his famous sermon the sermon that awoke the world fuller stood beside the pulpit and carey was only able to go to india because fuller undertook to arouse the interest and organize the church's resources at home you go down into the mine said fuller to carey and we will hold the ropes how well he fulfilled his promise let his biographers tell by holding those ropes andrew fuller made history andrew fuller was a farmer's son and to the end of his days he dearly loved the fields as a boy he reveled in the life of the village and the countryside we get glimpses of him searching for birds nests in the woods killing snakes in the lane and sitting with other boys beside the great fire in the village smithy yet even in those early days he was conscious of a hunger in his heart that none of these pursuits could satisfy he attended his mother's church but the minister did not help him mr eve was a representative of that grim and stern old theology that set the poor boy trembling in every limb but offered him no refuge from the terrors it presented the more he heard the more miserable he became in his distress he collected such books as he could find he read bunyan's pilgrim's progress and grace abounding and erskine's gospel sonnets i read he says and as i read i wept indeed i was almost overcome with weeping so interesting did the doctrine of eternal salvation appear to me but how to make that great salvation his there lay the problem he discovered that one of his father's laborers was a very religious man he followed this man into the fields and stables and barns hoping that he would drop some word that would dispel the horror of his mind but no emancipating word was spoken the quest seemed hopeless at the age of fifteen he almost abandoned the search i thought he says of giving up in despair why not forget it and take my fill of sin but the very ideal sent a shudder through all his frame his heart revolted what he said to himself can i give up christ and hope in heaven then one never to be forgotten day his ears were ravished by the magic music he heard the text come unto me all ye that labor and are heavy laden and i will give you rest he looked away from self his son tells us and fixed his eyes upon a crucified saviour his guilt and fears began to dissolve like the snow of winter under the silent influence of springtime warmth he was in such dire extremity that whether it accorded with the teachings of mr eve or not he determined to venture everything upon christ come unto me said the matchless music i must his soul made answer i must and i will yes i will i will i trust my soul my lost and sinful soul into his hands i come i come and if i perish i perish the words are copied from his own account of that memorable experience come unto me all ye that labor and are heavy laden and i will give you rest he came and in coming he found the rest that was promised the rest that he had so diligently sought i should have found it sooner he says if i had not entertained the notion of my having no warrant to come to christ without some previous qualification i mention this he adds because it may be the case with others who may be kept in darkness and disparity by such views much longer than i was during the years that followed andrew fuller had his full share of trouble whilst he lay ill in one room his daughter a little girl of six died in the room adjoining i heard a whispering he says and then all were silent all were silent but all is well i feel reconciled to god i called my family around my bed i sat up and prayed with them as well as i could i bowed my head and worshipped a taking as well as a giving god some time afterwards mrs fuller lost her reason in her frenzy she fancied that he was not her husband but an impostor who had entered the house and taken all that belonged to her she regarded him as her bitterest enemy and made every effort to escape she had to be watched night and day just before her death however a sudden calm stole over her i was weeping mr fuller says and the sight of my tears seemed to awaken her recollection fixing her eyes upon me she exclaimed why are you indeed my husband indeed my dear i am she then drew near and kissed me several times my heart dissolved with a mixture of grief and joy 
her senses were restored, and she talked as rationally as ever. A fortnight later, she laid a little child in the father's arms, and then passed quietly away. Then again, her eldest boy proved wayward and gave him serious trouble. He ran away to sea. It was reported that, as a result of a misadventure, he had received three hundred lashes and had died under the punishment. Oh, cried the father when he heard of it, this is heart trouble. My boy, my boy. He cried, and I heard him not. Oh, Absalom, my son, my son. Would God that I died for thee, my son, my son. It turned out, however, that the rumor was false. Robert was still alive, and the letters that his father wrote to him are among the tenderest and most persuasive in our literature. There is every reason to believe that their pleadings had the effect that the father most desired. I was exceedingly intimate with Robert, wrote a shipmate long afterwards. We freely opened our minds to each other. He was a very pleasing youth and became a true Christian man. The news of his death, however, was a terrible blow to Mr. Fuller. On the Sunday following its reception, he broke down completely in the pulpit, and the whole congregation wept with him. But through all the clash of feeling and the tumult of emotion, the bells were ringing under the sea. The magic music never ceased. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. That rest was never broken. When he lay dying at the last, he called Dr. Ryland to receive his final testimony. I have no other hope of salvation, he said, than through the atonement of my Lord and Savior. With this hope I can go into eternity with composure. I will give you rest. I go into eternity with composure. Rest. Composure. So steadfastly was the promise kept to the very, very last. As a boy, I came under the influence of a fine old clergyman, Canon Hoare, the rector of Holy Trinity, Tunbridge Wells a man very esteemed in the south of England. I can see him now, tall, stately, and gray, my beau idea of all that a minister should be. In his study there hung a very beautiful and telling picture. It represented a shipwreck from which one life was being saved. In confidential moments, Canon Hoare would tell the story of the picture. It seemed that years ago a very wealthy man called to arrange with him about his burial place. The canon walked around the churchyard with him, and after inspecting several possible positions, the gentleman at last selected the spot in which he wished his bones to rest. This business completed, they paused for a second or two, listening to the birds, and then the canon turned to his companion and said, Well, now you have chosen a resting place for your body. Have you yet found a resting place for your soul? There was silence for a moment, and then turning full upon the canon, the gentleman exclaimed, you are the first person who ever asked me that question. It set him thinking. He sought and found the resting place, the only resting place, Andrew Fuller's resting place, and he sent the canon the picture as a token of his gratitude. He felt that his was the life that had been saved from shipwreck. The matchless music. A resting place for the soul. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. He who has heard that music and found that resting place will smile at all the buffetings of time and pass into eternity with composure. End of chapter 22。e of A Bunch of Everlastings, or Text That Made History, by Frank W. Borum. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tim Bauer. Chapter 23 Stephen Grillet's Text A restless and adventurous Quaker was Stephen Grillet. He yearned to live to the age of Methuselah, and, had his wish been granted, he would have made good use of every moment of his time. The marvel is, however, that he lived to be eighty-two. He was nearly hanged to a lamp-post by infuriated revolutionists in Paris. He was twice faced with death by drowning once in a swollen mill-race and once at a flooded ford. He twice fell into the hands of pirates, from whose cutlasses he had good reason to expect a hasty dispatch, and, in the course of his tireless travels amidst populations that were being ravaged by plagues and pestilences, he was laid low again and again. More than once he gave specific instructions concerning the burial of his body, 
but each time he rose from his fevered couch and continued his tireless pilgrimage he passed from country to country with as little concern as some men feel in passing from village to village he learned language after language in order that he might preach the word in every hole and corner of the earth he stood before emperors and kings speaking to crowned heads with the naturalness and ease with which he addressed the children at home he found his way into prisons and workhouses into slave camps and thieves kitchens he lost no opportunity to preach to all kinds and conditions of men the words of everlasting life his is one of the most remarkable evangelistic careers on record he yearned to live as long as methuselah but he discovered that he could live longer still that discovery is in a word the explanation of his life let him tell his own story one evening he says i was walking in the fields alone my mind being under no kind of religious concern nor in the least excited by anything i had heard or thought of suddenly explain it how you may the solitudes of that vast american forest declined any longer to be dumb they became vocal with wondrous speech the wayward winds and the rustling leaves were all whispering and caroling and shouting and echoing the same wonderful word i was arrested he says by what seemed to be an awful voice proclaiming the word eternity 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 it reached my very soul my whole man shook it brought me like saul to the ground the great depravity and sinfulness of my heart were set open before me after this i spent most of my time in retirement i began to read the bible oh what sweetness did i then feel it was indeed a memorable day i was like one introduced into a new world the creation and all things around me bore a different aspect my heart glowed with love to all the awfulness of that visitation can never cease to be remembered with peculiar interest and gratitude as long as i have the use of my mental faculties i have been as one plucked from a burning house rescued from the brink of a horrible pit how can i set forth the fullness of heavenly joy that filled me i saw that there was one that was able to save me i saw him to be the lamb of god that taketh away the sins of the world i felt faith in his atoning blood floods of tears of joy and gratitude gave vent to the fullness of my heart and all through one word a word that reached my very soul shook my whole man and brought me to the ground that word eternity 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 the very word is the stateliest cathedral of human speech it is the transcendent triumph of articulation it stands among the few real sublimities of our vocabulary it is one of those magnificences of language that defy all definition one of those splendors of expression that leave nothing to be said oh the clanging bells of time how their changes rise and fall but in undertone sublime sounding clearly through them all is a voice that must be heard as our moments onward flee and it speaketh a one word eternity eternity that insistent voice is the voice that stephen grillet heard in the leafy solitudes that memorable evening eternity 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 the word falls upon the ear like the booming of the ocean on the crags along the coast it rings and echoes and reverberates and resounds through all the intricate avenues and the tortuous corridors of the soul the whole being trembles at its utterance as the abbey shudders to the organ's diapason every faculty is awed into stillness the soul is hushed into worship the word has all the music of the spheres within its syllables and when it has been spoken all attempts at amplification and explanation become pitiful impertinences eternity 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 the classic use of the word occurs in mrs beecher stowe's historic masterpiece poor uncle tom having fallen into the hands of the wretched and brutal legree had been thrashed within an inch of his life he lay bleeding and wreathing in anguish in the old slave shed but his soul was not in the shed for as the solemn light of dawn the angelic glory of the morning star looks in through the rude window tom thinks of the bright and morning star he ponders the great white throne 
with its ever-radiant rainbow, the white-robed multitude, the voices of many waters, the crowns, the palms, the harps. These may all break upon his vision before that sun shall set again, and therefore, without shuddering or trembling, he hears the voice of his persecutor. How would you like to be tied to a tree, and have a slow fire lit up around ye? asked Legree. Wouldn't that be pleasant, eh, Tom? Massa, says Tom, I know ye can do dreadful things, but— He stretched himself upward and clasped his hands. But after ye killed the body, there ain't no more ye can do. And, oh, there's all eternity to come after that. Eternity, eternity, exclaims Mrs. Beecher Stowe. The word thrills through the black man's soul with light and power as he utters it. It thrills through the sinner's soul, too, like the bite of a scorpion. Eternity, eternity. Eternity, eternity. It is one of the overpowering immensities of our faith, and we preachers must make the most of it. The people are sick and tired of trifles. The day of catch-penny titles and silly subjects is as dead as the dodo. It ought never to have dawned. It is a page in church history over which every true minister of the New Testament will blush whenever he comes upon it. The man who announces as his theme a subject that is beneath the dignity of the eternal harmonies can never have heard the music of the choir invisible. He can never have seen the Lord high and lifted up. He can never have heard the seraphs that cry continually, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. The lips that have been touched with the glowing coal from the altar can never again be lent to ecclesiastical frivolity. It is wrong, it is wicked, it is shameful, and, to quote a famous but sinister phrase, it is not only a crime, it is a blunder. For the people are impatient of trivialities. The hearts of men are hungry for the most stupendous themes. They like great preaching. The big subjects draw the big crowds. Little children amidst city squalor love to put seashells to their ears because in them they catch the murmur of fathomless seas and limitless ocean, and children of a larger growth turn from much that is sordid in their environment to the preacher who helps them to hear the music of the infinite. Eternity, 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 eternity. The best illustration of my theme occurs in the life of Dr. Thomas Chalmers. It is a dramatic page in a wonderful spiritual experience. Let me briefly marshal the facts. As a mere boy, having matriculated at twelve, become a divinity student at fifteen, and been licensed to preach at nineteen, Chalmers became a minister at Kilmeny. He devotes himself to mathematics. On Sundays, he thunders to decent Presbyterians against murder and adultery, and during the week he seeks to prepare himself to succeed Professor Playfair in the mathematical chair of Edinburgh University. He writes a pamphlet in which he says, The author of this pamphlet can assert, from what to him is the highest of all authority, the authority of his own experience, that, after the satisfactory discharge of his parish duties, a minister may enjoy five days in the week of uninterrupted leisure for the prosecution of any science in which his taste may dispose him to engage, then follow his illness, his marvellous conversion, and his new ministry. Has Scotland ever known a life more rich in spiritual influence, or more fruitful of evangelistic fervor? And in the course of that historic ministry, in a debate before the General Assembly of the Church of Scotland, Chalmers' early pamphlet is quoted in support of the low views it advocates. Chalmers is stung to the quick. He rises and makes one of his very greatest speeches. And, in closing, he exclaimed, Yes, sir, I pinned it. Strangely blinded that I was, I aspired in those days to be a professor of mathematics. But what, sir, is the object of mathematical science? Magnitude and the proportion of magnitude. But in those days, sir, I had forgotten two magnitudes. I thought not of the littleness of time, and I recklessly thought not of the greatness of eternity. Eternity, eternity. Eternity, eternity. I recently took a long, long railway journey through a thousand miles of civilization, a thousand miles of desert, and a thousand miles of bush, the train bore me to a part of this vast continent in which I found myself surrounded by trees that were entirely new to me, 
and by flowers such as I had never seen before. I freely expressed my admiration, and when the time came to commence my homeward journey, I found among the mementos with which I was presented a beautiful bunch of everlastings, a bunch of everlastings. It seemed to me I have this morning been gathering just such a bouquet. Here is Stephen Gurley listening to the great word that rings through the silence of the forest. Eternity, eternity, eternity. Here is Uncle Tom uttering the same words with strange and wonderful effects. Eternity. Here is Dr. Chalmers confessing that the mistakes of his life lay in his forgetting the greatness of eternity. The list could be indefinitely continued. The valleys are full of everlasting. That night, says Ebenezer Erskine, in recording in the pages of his diary the greatest spiritual crisis that he ever knew, that night I got my head out of time into eternity. The vastness of the word eternity was impressed upon me, says Andrew Bonner in his diary. And a few months later, he says again, I strive to keep the feeling of eternity always before me. Gentlemen, exclaimed old Rabbi Duncan to his students as he dismissed them at the end of the year's work, many will be wishing you a happy new year. Your old tutor wishes you a happy eternity. Eternity, 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 eternity. It is good, as Stephen Gurley discovered on that memorable evening, to wander at times into the fields and the forest. Today I have been out into the fields that are boundless, and as the fruits of my stroll I have brought back a bunch of everlastings. End of chapter 23 End of A Bunch of Everlastings Or Text That Made History by Frank W. Borum